Spring Farm Full House Cedar Spring Farm, Wickford Road Island Whale Rock Point, Narragansett Bureau Road Island Full House, Providence Road Island Chapter 1 Cedar Spring Farm Triot Jabish Samuel I, Chap. 31, V13 Cedar Spring Farm, where my family have always lived, is known as the only place in town where there have been three murders. The first took place when my father was a little boy, just before the Civil War. Our big hay barn, with its great white doors, was formerly used as a clam bake house, and after a good bake and plenty of hard cider the men used to pitch horseshoes and bet on their prowess. Sometimes, after the women folks left, or if it was a stag affair, they would fight gamecocks. Cider seemed to make very ugly drunks, and many fisticuffs would ensue. One beautiful Sunday in September, after a gay bake, a man named Perkins was accused of cheating by pushing his horseshoe near the stake. Let's lynch him, they cried. Two he ran away from them, and that's the last anyone saw of him for more than a month. Then one day he was found shot to death high up in the crotch of a great oak tree. He must have climbed the tree after his assailant shot him, for his wounds were such that he could not have been shot at that distance from the ground. Who did it, no one ever knew, but the enormous white oak, still standing, has been called Dead Man's Oak ever since. Dead Man's dot dot comma oak is a quarter of a mile down the lane from Cedar Spring itself, and the house and barn, near which the murder must have taken place, are on a hill just above it. The spring never fails, and the water is pure, and cold and rushes out of the ground at about 50 gallons a minute. The Indians identified the spring by the cedar grove surrounding it, hence its name. The little stream from it flows into the saltwater cove nearby. My father, David Sherman Baker Jr., inherited Cedar Spring Farm from some uncles. Dot inherited isn't exactly the word he assumed the mortgage. No money changed hands, for no one had any. He brought my mother there as a bride, and she loved it, as did her children and grandchildren. Three my father and mother had three daughters and her son Anita, Gladys, Ruth, and David. Junior. I am Anita, the oldest, and lived at Cedar Spring most of my life until my marriage to Frank Leonard Hinckley. After my marriage we visited there frequently, and it became an enchanting second home to Frank's and my children Anita. Elizabeth, the twins Gladys and Francesca and Frank, Jr. Nita was three years and three months old when the twins were born, and Frank came three years later. Chapter 2 Mother Faber Estsui Quisk Fortuny Every man is the forger of his own fortune. Salas' mother was born in Brookline, Massachusetts, into a large family of grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Her mother died at her birth and her father was left to widow her at 22 years of age with three little daughters Cora, the oldest, then Lucy, then mother, whose name was Anita. Cora was beautiful, with big brown eyes and masses of brown curls. Lucy sweet and winsome, with light brown eyes and soft brown hair, mother thin and scrawny and all eyes, grey-blue. Her hair never was ruly, and although somewhat curly was like mine, always out of place. Cora, though beautiful, was placid. Lucy was timid and gentle, but mother, from her babyhood, was dynamic. When she was a little girl she was supposed to be very naughty, and everyone was always telling her so. She did not intend to be. But things always seems to go wrong, as she had no mother to understand, and take her part. Her father was very strict and unbending, and his oldest sister Sue, a spinster of uncertain M. Fiper who kept house for him after his wife died, was usually cross. If the new leather reins were left out all night, mother was blamed. Although all the children in the neighborhood had been playing horse with them, she would be sent supperless to bed. Once she was given a miniature iron table to play with and told, you break everything. Here is one thing you can't break. Although she was only three years old, she remembered feeling that her honor was at stake, that she must break that table. She wiggled it and kept hitting it until it broke, and she was punished. At another time, when presented with a new pair of red slippers, 
She asked if she see old Wetham right away. If you are such a fool go ahead, Wetham, she was told. It was snowing outside. The snow dampened the slippers and the color ran, ruining them. Mother was again punished. She told me many similar stories. When she was about eight years old she was so unhappy that she did not want to live because she had been scolded and punished so much. One day at the family dinner table they had an especially nice meal, and she was very hungry. Inadvertently she hit the maid's arm and spilled something. Her father screamed at her, and sent her away dinless. She stumbled blindly six upstairs. On the laughing she suddenly discerned, through her tears, the loveliest lady she had ever seen. The lady held out her arms and mother rushed into them, knowing instinctively that the apparition was her own mother. You are not a bad girl, my darling, said the Osios for NSSNG her hair. TFR a good girl and I love you. Point one one. The lady had a sweet voice, and looked like her own portrait in the parlor, and she was wearing the same dress. This vision of her mother changed mother's entire life. Whenever afterward anyone accused her of being naughty or bad, she would say, I'm not. My mother thinks I am good. F the confidence and faith which inspired her answer was disconcerting to those who knew how long mother's mother had been dead. Dot. Dot. This is the only instance I know of the actual touching of a spirit. Mother always maintained that she felt her mother's dear arms around her and the kiss on her hair. Mother's favorite member of the family was Uncle Charles Henry Wheelwright, who was a doctor. He was her dead mother's youngest brother, and if he could seven only have stayed home her life would have been far more pleasant. He spent three years away as a physician with the Perry expedition to Japan, and later served all through the Civil War. In the lovely series of six colored prints of the Perry expedition he may be seen in one plainly standing under a tree in the right background. We still have many of the charming oriental objects he brought back as gifts. He never married. Another uncle, Will, her father's youngest brother, was a terrible tease, and made the little girl's lives miserable. His favorite trick was to put one of them on the high marble mantelpiece in the library, and go off and leave her. Once he put Aunt Lucy up there, and forgot about her. She fell off, and injured her back. Will at least had the virtue of remorse, and as an atonement to Lucy he bought her a beautiful French doll with a trunk full of clothes, which three generations of little girls have played with, and which I still have. Mother always welcomed the summer. Therefore then she would go to visit her mother's father, Grandpa Cobb, at his home in Amherst, Massachusetts. For many years after Grandfather Cobb died, the farm was the site of the Massachusetts Agricultural College. It is now a part of the University of Massachusetts. It was a beautiful farm, and he was a splendid farmer. A few years come ago mother and I, in Northampton to visit two of my daughters at Smith College, went over to Amherst, to see the farm again. When we went into the big barn, mother said, the last time I was here, Grandpa put the curry cowman brush back of a comma board behind this door. She put her hand down, and brought it out. Grandpa had put it there 72 years before. We looked at it, and put it back. Perhaps it is still there. I am going to look again someday. Grandpa was an austere man. The only person he really loved was Mother, for she comma looked like his beloved wife, Augusta Adams who had run away from him years before. Gay, beautiful and lively, Augusta had married Grandpa Cobb when she was 16 years old. He was much older. Within five years she had six babies, and she felt her life was strenuous and dull. In those days, in Amherst, one of the principal forms of entertainment was evening lectures. Everyone went to one of the lectures, a dreary winter night, was Brian Young, and the whole town turned out to hear him. He was a magnetic, fascinating speaker, and a handsome man, and he held the women spellbound. He told them of the complete freedom that women enjoyed and under the Mormon religion no woman was compelled to have children, unless she wanted them. Every woman had a house of her own, and invited her husband when she wanted to see him. 
to Augusta. This sounded like heaven. After the lecture, when everyone went up to shake hands with him, he held Augusta's hand long enough to find out her name and whether she was married. Dot one afternoon, about six weeks later, a young man appeared at the kitchen door and asked for Mrs. Cobb. I am Mrs. Cobb, said Augusta. I have a message for you from the prophet. He feels drawn towards you and wants you to come to him, to Utah. But I have no money, faltered Augusta. You need nothing, the young man assured her. Everything will be provided. You may bring any of your children you wish. You do not have to decide at once. I am on my way back to Boston, and in ten days I will be back. If you want to come, be ready. I will come at this time of day, and will have every convenience arranged for your comfort. Augusta was ready, and went with him. She took with her the youngest child, Charlotte, a baby in arms. Grandpa's rage was thunderous. He started ten right off, went out to Utah, and brought her home. She stayed just long enough to have two more children, James and Mercy, and then she left for good, taking the last two with her, but leaving Charlotte behind. No one knows whether Brian Young sent for her again, or if she wrote him and asked to come. It is said that Grandpa was much more gentle with her after bringing her back from Utah, but he was not considerate enough. James and Mercy came back to visit a few times when they were older. Mother knew them, and once, I think, saw Grandma Cobb in Salt Lake City. Augusta taught school and was very happy. Although she was sealed to Brian Young and destined to be his wife in heaven, she was not his wife on earth, for she did not live with him and had no more children. She had her own house and was highly respected. I have met Mormons who knew her and attended her school. I wonder if perhaps Brian Young was disappointed. We will never know. Chapter 3 I told her it when we do not find peace of mind in ourselves it is useless to seek it elsewhere. La Rocha Fau called after her mother I's visit was over with Grandpa Cobb and Amherst. Someone would come for her and take her to Marblehead, where she would spend six weeks with Grandma Candler, her father's mother. Grandma Candler lived in a lovely old house. The staircase is now in a museum, near but not on the water. As a girl, she had said that there were three things she would never do marry a sea captain, marry a man named John, or marry a widower. Grandfather Candler was all three. His first wife died while he was on a trip to China at the age of 20. He married Grandma when he was an old man of 24. She was 18. Aunt Sue was their oldest child, Uncle Will the youngest, and there were four or five in between. One of these was Aunt Sadie, who married Cassie Crocker. Cassie was a horror. He had a long, greasy black beard and always wanted to kiss us when we were children. Dot. Dot we were more or less used to beards in my childhood. Grandfather Candler, mother's father, twelve had a particularly attractive one Snow White like his high colonna, which had been white since his thirtieth year, clothes cut, and immaculately kept. Another son was Uncle Henry, who went to China and married there. We have been told that the first part of Hergesheimer's javel head was based on his eye experience in the Orient. After being absent many years he made a visit home, bringing rich and exquisite gifts, but no wife. He was about to return to China when he caught a severe cold and died. About two years after his death we received word that two of his sons were coming to America on a visit. Such consternation. What would we do with Chinese boys who were also relatives? They eventually arrived and were met at the steamer by some of the men of the family. Instead of boys they were tall, dignified, solemn Chinese gentlemen who had come as a filial duty to visit their father's grave. They wanted nothing of us, and would not even pay us a social call. They visited their father's grave in the lovely old Moravian cemetery on Staten Island, and then went back to China. When mother was fourteen, grandfather bought a yacht, hired a house in Newport for the summer, and took his three daughters there. He did not take Aunt Sue along, thirteen and she was furious. 
But grandfather was smart he knew that a widow with a yacht and three pretty daughters might be interesting and acceptable, whereas a widow with an assiduous old maid sister, irrespective of the yacht and the pretty daughters, would not be very welcome. They had a lovely time. Cora, the oldest, was a beautiful companion to her handsome and amusing father. They were invited everywhere, and did a great deal of entertaining at home, and aboard the yacht. Lucy and mother were considered too young to go out in the evening, but they had each other, and spent many happy days at Bailey's Beach. Lucy was the only swimmer in the family. One day after a storm, when the undertow was strong, Lucy and mother went to the beach. Grandfather and Cara were sleeping off the effects of a late party, and there were few people on the shore, for nearly everyone knew the danger. Lucy was carried out by the undertow. She screamed for help. Mother heard her and ran frantically to the bathhouses to get someone to save her. Some men came and tried their best. Mr. James, a friend who was a strong swimmer, succeeded in reaching her and getting hold of her once. She said to him, Try and 14 save me. I'm getting tired. T.T. The life-saving boats had been piled far up on the beach because of the storm and could not be brought down. Mr. James tied a rope around his waist, with the end held on shore, and went in again and again. His mother, who had come to see what damage the storm had done, went on her knees, and begged him not to risk his life anymore. He had gone in until blood came out of his nose and ears. Lucy was being carried farther and farther out. Finally she disappeared. Mother waited on the beach until the lifeguard came, and Lucy's body was brought back. Then she went into the bathhouse and dressed, with Lucy's clothes still hanging on the hook. From that moment mother was a woman, not a child. For some time they feared for her reason. She had no recollection of the months that followed. Grandfather later married a girl less than six months older than Cora. Then Cora married an artist, and went to Paris to live. Mother joined them soon afterward, and lived in France for eight years. They enjoyed a gay bohemian life in the Latin Quarter. Mother had beautiful ale hair, the artists called it blonde century which is 50 now somewhat corrupted in the English term. Ash blonde, and was the model for the girl in the picture by Pierre Cartevoix and girl in a swing. She also posed for a ceramist, and her face and hair were the model for a charming figurine which I have. The body of the figurine was provided by the daughter of the pension keeper, whose curves at the time were more fashionable than mother's, which hardly existed. Mother was thin as rail. Uncle Charlie. Coral's husband Dot Tilder amused us for years with his tales of mother's escapades in Paris. She became engaged to a famous artist, Charles Sprague Pierce. Soon after their engagement he became afflicted with eczema. She couldn't bear to look at him and would hide whenever he came to see her. His family doctor decided that he needed a change of climate and should take a trip. At the same time, Charlie and Cara decided to take Mother off on a trip to presumably in another direction. But they all arrived together at Concano and at the same pension. Both parties had engaged rooms there for two weeks. The French people couldn't understand Zestrol's Americans who glared at each other and never spoke. Mother read some bad fish the second day, and broke out all over, and was really sick. While she was confined to her room, and the family was sitting cooped up downstairs in the small smelly parlor, Charles climbed a trellis to Mother's room to see how she was. The proprietor's wife, a provincial who did not entertain Parisian ideas of romance, caught him. All of them were immediately turned out of the pension as immoral people, and on the way back to Paris no one spoke to anyone else except Mother and Charlie. Dot. Dot Charlie decided Mother had looked homely while sick, and that she was too much of a kid to marry yet, anyway. His eczema was much better by that time, and his spirits were high and free. On the return to Paris, Mother and Charlie were forbidden to see or speak to each comma other, which, of course, made for fast friendship and they met on the sly. Mother invented a game called Spot. I have played it many times but do not recommend it. 
they would sneak out of their houses and meet, and then decide whom to spot. For instance, they might decide on the second man who passed a given lamppost. The spotter would then have to be run to cover, or enter a 17 a building. A tram or cab was not considered cover, and the spotter would have to be followed in another tram or cab. If the spotter suspected or caught on it, that he was being spotted, the game sometimes got very exciting. 18 Chapter 4 Mother Meets Father His aspect is like Lebanon, excellent as the Cedars Song of Solomon After eight years in Paris they all came home for the summer. Coral had two children, a boy and a girl. Grandfather had another daughter, looked much older, and had been spending his summers aboard Coma the yacht. Now that his family was to be augmented by Nita, Cora, Charlie, and the children, he hired a house in Wickford Road Island, at Utco Farm. It was a sweet, friendly place with beautiful elms lining the drive to the house, which stood right on the water. He wanted a good harbour for the Grey Goose. None of family had been back to Newport since Lucy's drowning. Dr. David Greer, afterwards Bishop of the Diocese of New York, was then rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Wickford. He and his family were delightful gentle folk who welcomed grandfather's family to their rather limited circle. One of Dr. Greer's acquaintances was David S. Baker, Jr., a native of Wickford, an unmarried young lawyer. Dr. Greer suggested one day that he introduce 19 young Baker to Miss Candler who had only recently come to town. Do excuse Mel said the young man, but I'm working very hard just now and already know so many girls. Dr. Greer laughed. The serious young man asked. What are you? It laughing at. That is just what Miss Candler said, when I asked her to meet you, T.L. said Dr. Greer. They were married the following June, and went to live at Cedar Spring Farm. It was their home, as long as they lived father and mother for 26 years together, and mother 42 years longer alone. 20 Chapter 5 The other man a pretty good firm is watch and wait, and another is at it, early and apostrophe late, and still another is do and air it. But the best is probably Grin and Barrett for Walter G. Doty about a week before Mother met Father she was out driving quite a skittish horse in her dog cart. The horse got his foot over the trace in some way, and started to kick the cart to pieces. Mother, an expert horsewoman, first talked to him, then whipped him, but could not get his foot back in place. Just then a young man came out of his house and helped her. While mother held the horse, Irving Rudman under the trace and put the horse ISF out back. He asked if he could not drive mother home. She was glad to accept his offer, and thus began lifelong friendship. Father used to tease her unmercifully about Irving. The dear man was faithful to the end. He never married, and until my father died she did not see much of him. But as soon as father was gone, Irving literally lived at our house. He felt it his duty to protect us, and used to ask mother to marry him at least once a week, after we were all married. And she was so twenty-one alone. We tried to make her marry him. I remember on her 80th birthday Irving came and said, It has been so long, Nita and I have been so patient don't you think I deserve some happiness? Turving, dear, Tisha replied, as I have told you for nearly sixty years, you deserve everything good, and should get married, but not to me. He died shortly after that, still faithful, and left her what little property he had. 22 Chapter 6 Father I.S. Family The abundance of the sea shall be converted unto the Sayer 60. V5 My father's family were simple people. The men, most of them, followed the sea. My grandfather sailed the packet carrying the mail from Wickford to Newport for years, and all the boys, as they grew old E-N-O-U-R-H-4 helped him. The boys were all very tall and fine looking. Nick, the oldest, grew fast and was always tired, as most overgrown boys are. One winter day he decided he dot had worked hard long enough, and needed rest. He told his father his foot hurt him, so he couldn't make the trip. Let's see, Nicky. My, that is serious. 
come along just the same. I Captain Baker picked up poor Nicky's shoe, and for two days Nick traveled one shoe of F and one shoe on, in the bitter weather. Then he humbly begged his father for his shoe and gratefully put it on. His brothers never let him forget that episode, and many times in life asked him, Where's your shoe, Nick, Miss Willie Carter? A cousin, who was very fond 23 of Captain Baker, worried about his winter trips and finally called on him and said, Captain David, I feel it is my duty to warn you to give up taking the mail to Newport. Something will happen to you. Your grandfather was lost at sea, your father was lost at sea, and your brother was lost at sea. I F all right, Miss Willie, but don't you ever go to bed again. Your mother died in bed, your father died in bed, and your grandfather died in bed. Quote Captain Baker kept on sailing, and he, bless his heart, also died in bed. But Miss Willie at 98 is still going strong. My father was a captain, with his papers from the custom house, when he was 13 years old. He was 6 foot 3 then, and never grew after that. I grew with the same rapidity, and reached 5 foot 10 when I was 13. Thank God, I stopped growing. When I was a child, and went to the public school in Wickford for one term, between governesses. I heard a visitor say, what is that woman doing in the class with all those children? I was eleven. My father and his brother, after Ben finished school in Wickford, went to the East Greenwich Academy, seven miles away. They walked there in the fall, when twenty-four the term began, and soon grew very homesick. Many days they would walk back height all they could look down on Wickford and their home, from the hill back of the town, be comforted that it was still there, and walk back the seven miles to East Greenwich. They felt it was not fitting, to visit their family until the term ended. I wonder if father ever told his mother. Probably not. His mother loved him so, and was so proud of him and her six other sons and one daughter. Three of the sons, worked their way through school and college to become lawyers, my grandmother Baker was well disposed toward everyone, and very witty. She came of a race of giants. She was nearly six feet tall and her seven brothers were all over six foot six, the tallest seven foot four. It is from her, suppose, that my father and later my brother and I got our height. She could always tell a funny story, and possess the rare gift of being able to laugh at herself. Poor darling. She needed day 11 of her humor the last years of her life, for she became afflicted with an odd disease which my doctor son-in-law says, was probably retrograde paraphasia. She would go in just the opposite direction from where she wanted to go, 25 and the harder she tried not to, the worse it got. If she wanted to go out in the garden she would go into the kitchen. Once, I remember, I was all dressed up to go to church, and went to call on her first. She wanted to come into the parlor, and see me, and she got under the bed, and cold knit get out. I got under too, and tried to push her out, but she was as big as I was, and heavier. In some way she got me wedged in, and grandpa and father had to lift the bed up to get us out. I was ruined for church. Grandpa got religion quite late in life. It came on him all of a sudden, and in winter. He wanted and insisted that he be baptized at once, in the Baptist church. The Baptists immersed for baptism and the minister wanted Grandpa to wait until warmer weather. He said Grandpa had waited fifty-five years, and a few more months couldn't hurt him. But Grandpa had great zeal, so they all went to the river it is said, that the crowd was large, and cut the ice, and the minister and Grandpa went in. Grandpa was much bigger than Parson Hughes. And when the parson immersed Grandpa, he sort of let go, and Grandpa's head got under the ice and one of the deacons, had to help pull Grandpa out, and help Parson and use and Grandpa to shore. They were so numbed with the cold. Grandpa said it did him a lot of good and he tried to make his sons be immersed. Some of them were, but they waited I till summer. 27 Chapter 7 The First Railroad Station Fire The old railroad station in Wickford burned to the ground in the middle of the night. It was a refined gingerbread type of building, and most sturdily built. 
The fire came to most inopportune time, as the annual squirt was to be the next day. A squirt is a water pumping contest to see how far water from a given fire engine can be thrown. The pumpers are volunteers who have to train as a team for the squirt. The engines are worked singly, and the contest is to see which team can shoot the water farthest on a marked roadway. Each team has two tries, and then the next team pumps. Along each side of the engine, about two and one half feet from the ground, is a bar which is the pump handle. Twelve men, six on each side, work the bar up and down and that pumps the water. Since Wickford has had a modern chemical engine the old one has been used only in contests. The old one is very beautiful, made of iron and brass the iron painted bright red, and the brass polished title it shines and glistens. Many other towns have had pumping engines with their teams of picked men. It is a great honor to be 28 on a team and requires lots of practice and great strength and endurance, for it is a back-breaking job. Up and down, up and down. The pump must go in perfect timing. Hayako's once lost a squirt. Eddie Fowler got them, and threw the team off beat. Was his face red? My father was on the Wickford team for a while. But a case in court, he was a lawyer, made him miss a squirt, and he was dropped from the team. The other men said he lacked civil pride in letting anything interfere with the contest. As luck would have it, Taunton, I think, won the squirt my father missed and held the championship for quite a while. During that time we children became very intimate with their de Fowler's children, for we were in disgrace together and shunned by the other children in the town. Pete Freeman, of egg-eating fame, took my father's place as middleman on the port side, and although he was as strong, he was not as tall, and his rhythm was not at all good. I think a team has five minutes to warm up, then the judge yells ready on your mark set go, the squirt lasts ten minutes, and the greatest distance is usually reached after six or seven minutes of pumping. Sweat pours off the men, who wear only trousers. George Cranston, the captain of our team, wore a hat. 29 he has worn a hat ever since the railroad station fire. George had been captain of the squirt team for years, and gave the beat for the pumping. First slow, then faster and faster, up and down, up and down, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. He sang a kind of chant which was mesmeric, and most of the bystanders would be swaying up and down, up and down, with the pumpers so that when a contest was over, not only the team, but the audience as well was tired out. The night of the railroad station fire, three flat cars were lined up at the station with their fire engines on them. The more distant engines and teams had come on flat cars, and the men guarded the fire engines day and night, and spent much time sitting and gossiping together. The cars had easy ladders up to them and food and equipment was stored on the cars under huge canvas covers. All the children in the town climbed on the flats and made pests of themselves, asking questions and getting underfoot. Engines from nearby towns were drawn to Wickford by horses. One engine had three horses abreast. Seven beautifully polished engines were quite a sight. Everything was peaceful and quiet in the town asleep when a guard on one of the flat cars woke to see the Station 30 ablaze. One would think with seven fire engines, and all those men, that the fire would have been put out quickly. Hoses were run to the salt water cover nearby, and the pumping of water to the fire began in earnest. But there was too much equipment. The men and engines got in each other's way. The hose got tangled, the men swore at each other, the townsfolk rushed home for their leather fire buckets. Our three always hung under the stairs, and soon comma there was a hand brigade passing buckets of water to the fire, but nothing helped. It was the hottest and prettiest fire I ever saw all colors, from the paint and tar and chemicals which had been stored in the freight shed. The station burned to the ground, and two flat cars and engines burned also. George Cranston was also fire chief, and had rushed nearer to the fire than anyone else, and he was very brave. Sparks were flying, and it was terribly hot. We children, with my mother and Russian governess, 
Selma Rendleman, were huddled across the tracks under a big oak tree on the Reynolds Island, and looking fascinated at the fire. A big brass cuspider, that had been in the men's side of the station, was on the ground. George yelled to Nat Perry, who was holding a hose nozzle, 31 to turn the water into the cuspider. It went in with a rush, and made quite nice found in for a minute, and washed out the kudot spider. George grabbed it, and put it on his head. It was good protection from the air sparks. All went well for a while. Then Mother pointed to George. Oh look, the poor man, that thing has gone down on his neck. Dot it had indeed. Probably the sweat on George's head had made it slippery, and the heat from the fire, had expanded the cuspider. For there was George, helpless, completely blind, and suffocating. They had a terrible time getting that cuspider off George. Someone made a hole in the top, to give George more air, but the cuspider still stuck. It would not pull off. They nearly broke George's neck pulling. They tried to file it off, but it was well made and heavy brass. Finally Lena Crumsbottom, the plumber, got his torch, and burned it off. George was very weak and lying on the ground by then. It was an eerie scene, the crowd. Of anxious, tired men around George, well lighted by the embers of the now, burned down station. Necrom's bottom's torch burned poor George's head, pitifully, and my father told us later that 32 George had a round ring of bright red sear around his skull. That was why he never took his hat off. It was some years, before we had another squirt. 33 Chapter 8 The Second Railroad Station Fire George Cranston was a large handsome man, one of the most influential in Wickford. He was chief of the fire department, the undertaker, and owned the general store, about a mile up the Ten Rod Road, where he sold everything hats, toys, bicycles, drugs, coffins, buttons, kerosene, and clothes, etc. He was big-hearted, able, and brave and had a wonderful sense of humor. George was alway gay and cheerful, and the only thing he hated to do, was buy things for his store, that required thought, consideration, and money. He dearly loved to sell, but buying was painful. One day a week he would go to Providence to replenish his stock. He went on the early train, the one we children took to go to school spring and fall, and the one my father always took as long as we lived in Wickford. Winters, when the weather was bad, we had governesses and studied at home. We children, my father, and dear Tommy McDonnell, my father's associate and a best friend, always got on the train at the new railroad station. It is on the little branch railroad running from the 34 dock, where the SSLS, which plied to Newport, used to be moored, through our farm and other farms to the junction, where it meets the main line from New York to Boston. The new station in Wickford was not a very nice building. It was a great disappointment to Henry Congdon, the genial and faithful conductor on the branch train, and to all of us. It was a quarter of a mile up the track from where the old station had been, and not a convenient place for anyone. Why is it that most stations are as far from their public as possible? Years ago, when the steamboat landing for the Illus from Newport was built, it was placed as far from town as it could be. True, the landing is just across the salt water in La to the Cove, and one can almost throw a stone across, but except by boat the only way to get there is through the town, across the bridge by the town hall, where the old railroad station used to be, turn to the left, just before getting to the Reynolds's girl's house down nearly to Cold Spring Beach, another left turn at Thad Lawton's house, and down the sometimes cold, and in summer sting, and always windy path to the landing. Since the new station was built, passengers 35 from Newport, would look in surprise, when the train stopped at Wickford, for they could only see a shed. The shed was the station, a nice cozy place though, and presided over by kindly, but proud despot Clarence Weaver station agent, baggage man, janitor, etc. When Saunders Town, five miles south of Wickford, 
had Comer its only baggage communication with the outside world through Whitford, and when the Laffages had come there to live, Mrs. Grant Laffage, a most charming gentlewoman, had occasion to ask Mr. Weaver to hold a trunk till she could send F for it. She wrote him a courteous note, signing it Florence Lafarget. Mr. Weaver not to be outdone wrote her, he would hold the trunk, and signed it Clarence Law over the train, after leaving the landing and stopping at Wickford, goes leisurely, stopping twice more before it reaches the Wickford Junction. George Cranston lived not far from the junction, and on his shopping days would wait to leave his house, to catch the train idle he heard the whistle at the Swamp Town Crossing. Then he would leg it up the road he was always in a hurry his hat firmly on his head, dressed in his red flannel underdrawers, with his coat and shirt on, unbuttoned, and his trousers streaming out behind, held to him by his suspenders around his neck. He would button himself up hen 36 route, and the men aboard the train, my father and Tommy among them, would help him along by screaming down the road, hurry up, George where to going? Then someone would blow the whistle. Sometimes Henry Congdon, the conductor, would start the train, and pretend to go. George would nearly break a blood vessel and add speed, but he always made it. He would put on his trousers on the back platform, pull his hat on more firmly, then come into the car with the air of a comma Chesterfield, bowing, and shaking hands with all the ladies, and passing the time of day in a most courtly manner. It was George who always told me the news of the town, when I had been away. I had just returned from honeymooning in Europe, when he told me of Willis Freitas's wedding, and of the second railroad station fire. Both happened when I was gone. I remember thinking, as he told me, how tame Europe was just one big hotel after another compared to Whitford, where something was always going on. Willis Freitas was quite a character. He had had a sick wife for many years to whom he was very kind, but he did get bored, and he had a roving eye, and a great way with the ladies. His conquests were legion, and many a father would gladly have shot him, 37 but Willis was safe everyone knew of sick Mamie, so he went scot free. Miss Mitchum, the primary school teacher, was young, very pretty and smart. Willis fell for her like a ton of bricks, but she would have none of him. Willis was sick with longing. George said he looked and acted worse than Mamie. Just then poor Mamie died. She had many friends, and George said he gave her his best funeral as a recompense for her years of suffering. To everyone's surprise, Willis, the chief mourner, came to the funeral in a new light grey suit, and the biggest whitest kid gloves George said he had ever seen. Usually his clothes were plain and conservative. That day he seemed very conscious. Of his gloves, and held his hands stiffly, as if he did not want to hurt or soil them, which was, of course, just the case. He wore the same suit and gloves two days later, when he married Miss Mitchum. They were and are very happy. George said that the fire at the railroad station started at night too, and, as usual, no one knew the cause. George had just retired as fire chief and at the meeting a few days before, Sam Brown 38 had been elected to succeed him. All the firemen came to the FI with the beautiful new chemical engine which the town had just bought. Just as they got to the fire, Sam Brown, George's successor, cried out, Wait point nine boys, I forgot my chief's helmet. He rushed home, and when he returned with it, the station was in ruins. The boys had waited. 39 Chapter 9 Egg Eating There Were Giants in the Earth Genesis Chap 6 V3 Also in Wickford at Cedar Spring, and living up the road in the original farmhouse built in 16 Go, are the Freeman family. Some of them were there when Mother first came. They have farmed the place for generations. They stayed on, and became part of our lives. At the time mother came there as a bride the family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Freeman, and four sons and a daughter Pete, Ben, Otie, Ollie, and Kate. Pete and his brother Ben worked for us, as long as I can remember. Each had many talents. 
Pete was champion editor of the town for years. Ben, who was a coachman, acted as master of ceremonies at all editing contests. A Saturday afternoon with my mother away at a party, or better still, the rare Sunday when both my parents were away, was the ideal time for a secomerantist. People came from miles around. We children felt terribly important, and to our foreign governesses it was the only truly American fate. Pete's record was 84 at one sitting. He used 40 to drink them raw, six at a time, from a small bowl. As a favor he used to let us children break them into the bowl for him until the awful day, when my brother inadvertently let one in not quite up to standard. After that he had his younger brother, Ollie, took care of the eggs. At the beginning, he and his opponent would sit at opposite ends of a kitchen table, each with his helper behind him. The audience gathered round, but everyone was careful to give Pete enough air. He was fussy about that. The first 30 or so eggs would go down very quickly. After that, Pete usually stood up, and when his first terrible belt came, at about the 45th egg, his backers would look serious and say, take it easy old man. Dot. Dot no hurry. Dot. We got all day. Dot Robert here is tuckered out already. Pete would brighten up and usually triumph by drinking 60 eggs or so, and, suppose, would win five or ten dollars. The stakes were outrageously comelo for such an accomplishment. I knew that I was grown up when the thought of one of Pete's eating contests made me sick. Dot. Dot how do children know things? We knew implicitly that an eating contest was never to be men 41 timed in the house. We knew that the eggs were ours, but we practiced kind of elementary discretion by neither seeking nor offering information. One fine pen of Rhode Island red bullets was killed and eaten, because they had not laid in a week, and my father was disgusted with them. We knew where the eggs had gone, but it never entered our minds to tell. We neither saw our duty to father, nor feared reprisals from Pete or the other contestants. Pete was an integral part of our lives. His knowledge and care of animals was extraordinary. We turned to him with all our animal problems and he never failed us. Ye have just got to set and think as to what they would like he would say of a sick animal, and he certainly seemed to be able to understand what they wanted, whether horses, dogs, pigs, fowls, birds, or the monkey. The only living creature not his friend was my Macor, Paolo but then. Paolo but everyone except me. Pete lived at Cedar Spring in a little house down back of the horse barn, and had an L fixed up as an animal shelter or hospital, and he usually had something in it a gull with a broken wing, a rabbit that had lost its foot in a trap, a pig sick with the 42 therp. I never knew what the therp was, but many of our animals had it and Pete cured it. If they were low G and wouldn't eat, they had the therp. 43 Chapter 10 Ollie and Oti in the image of God made he man. Genesis, Chap. 1, V27 Ollie, who has appeared briefly as Battle's helper in the eating contest, was the youngest of the Freeman boys. Helping at easy tasks, or watching someone else work, was all he ever did, with one or two exceptions. Once he was given a saw, and persuaded to take off a dead limb of a tree beside the house, he actually sat on the far side of the limb, while attempting the job, and if my mother hadn't seen him, and shouted a warning just a split second before the limb broke, he would have fallen twenty feet, and probably injured himself for life. As it was, mother put him on the alert, and he grabbed the stump of the limb as it crashed to the ground. He hung there for several minutes until someone brought a ladder to help him down. Another time, under great pressure, he took some rugs out to beat. Mother saw him holding a small rug, and gently waving it in the breeze. Ollie, she said, for heaven's sake, why don't you really shake that rug? 44 cause I'm seven, my muscle, he explained. I'm gonna be a prize fighter, when I grow up. Point one T he saved it so successfully, that he'd round about five feet off the dock, that he was too lazy to swim to. Oti was the oldest of the Freeman brothers. 
While still fairly young he was made insane by the discharge of a gun which he had rigged up on the chicken house door. Somebody had been stealing their chickens probably Ollie for he was a good eater and loved chicken. Oti couldn't stand that, so he invented a burglar alarm and catcher. He fastened a gun with twine and pulled these arranged, so that the gun would go off when the door or the window opened. Then he tried it to see if it would work. It did peppering him with shot and searing him nearly to death. He ran into the woods, and it took Ben and Pete and Dolly two days to find him. All our work stopped and my father had to stay at home from his law office, to milk the cows and feed the animals. When they air found poor Odi he was a gibbering idiot. He was brought home and put in a cage in the Freeman's cellar, where he lived for ten years, forty-five and was then sent to our state hospital for mental diseases where he lived on air for thirty years more. From the moment they found him, the only word he ever said was, Itchikan. Every now and then, during his tenancy of the cage in his father's cellar, Oti was washed. I never saw the process, but was told in detail about it. The struggle was terrible, for he was violent, and it took all of his family and most of the neighbors, to get him out of the cage, up the cellar stairs, and into the harness room, or out in the backyard, depending on whether it was winter or summer. Oti wore pants in his cage, with a big rope belt which old man Freeman held, when they took him out. The whole family collected every available utensil, that would hold water, and as Oti danced around they doused and washed him. They warmed the water, and were as gentle as possible, but he was a slippery customer, especially after he was well soaked but when the initial frightened attempt at escape had passed, he ceased to mind, and even enjoyed it. He would run his fingers gleefully through his hair and beard, which the boys would cut just before he was taken back. While the bath was going on, his cage would be renovated by the women folk. For you he was, incidentally, the most superb human specimen I ever saw six feet three and strong as an ox. In Greece and Italy years. Later. On seeing a beautiful statue, I would think of Oti. He could have been the model for Praxitel's seated, bearded gladiator. 47 Chapter 11 Mother I.S. Neighbors Washed Before Dinner. St. Luke, Chap. 11, V38 When Mother Was a Bride. Her next door neighbors were a fisherman and his ex school teacher wife, Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins. Mother was lonely, and she and Mrs. Jenkins became great friends. Mrs. Jenkins used to help mother in many ways, taught her to cook, and was fascinated with mother's stories of Europe, and her French clothes. One day, after Mrs. Jenkins had broken bread with mother many times, she asked mother to dinner. Mother wondered if Mr. Jenkins would be there also. He was a very informal person and always went about barefooted, she had noticed. The dinner was at noon. Mother went in a simple little house address, and there was Mr. Jenkins sitting stiffly in the parlor in formal dress clothes, white tie and tails, and patent leather shoes. Mother must have shown her surprise. For Mrs. Jenkins waved her hand toward her husband and said, Grandly, Mr. Jenkins always dresses for dinner. 48 Chapter 12 Benius Wife Sarah and Noma for Every Man Exodus Sarah Freeman, Ben's wife was the only person in the world we were afraid of. She was a tall, blonde Irish woman with the most beautiful eyes I ever saw. They were very light and perfectly blue, but she had such heavy long lashes, that her eyes appeared to be dark violet except in a direct look in a very clear light. I have seen people start with surprise at the sight of them. She passed on these eyes to each of her five children. When we were all playing together, as we did constantly, strangers observing us would say, what lovely children. They always meant the Freemans. The Freeman children and ourselves added up to nine, but there were only five Christian names because of duplications. Jonathan, named after my uncle, was the oldest, then came Susan after my grandmother. Next came Niney, which was my name also. Then two Gladizers and two Bens, and finally, my little sister Ruth. 49 Sarah was a devoted, and very positive mother. We loved her, among other reasons, 
because she thought that when a child wanted to eat was the time it should. So simple. Dot. Dot they all ate all day. The table was always set with Johnny cakes, sinkers, milk in an open pitcher. Cake, bread, and butter. When the Freeman children went in to raid the table, so did we, unless a governess bad I to them happened to be after us. Ye are always welcome, darlings, Sarah would say. She had been my nurse, and had met Ben, while taking care of me, so I was a special favorite. As I remember, she was the only person who singled me out for preference. No wonder I loved her. Dot. Dot when I was quite grown up her youngest child, Mamie, had such terrible adenoids, that she could not breathe through her nose at all, and never closed her mouth. I reported the case to a doctor friend, who thought he was crazy about me at the time, and he said he would be glad to perform an operation. Sarah agreed to this, but absolutely refused to let Mamie leave Cedar Spring, to go to the hospital, with or without her, so the doctor had to come to Cedar Spring. He also had to bring with him an anesthetist and a an nurse. Everything went well until the anesthetic B50 began to work, when Mamie began to choke to death. The doctor had to pull her tongue out, almost, to save her life. We learned that Sarah had given Mamie a donut, and a big piece of cake just before the doctor had arrived, in spite of my stern warning, that Mamie should eat nothing. Sure no child of mine shall go hungry, Sarah said. The two exhausted doctors and the wilted nurse marched out of the house. I didn't I have him air for a bow anymore. Mamie bore the scars of her lacerated tongue to her dying day. Sarah's husband and her son Jonathan later died, almost at the same time, from typhoid fever. They were stricken together, but Jonathan was the first to go. He had never in his life, since Sarah had weaned him, eaten anything but bread and, but dot er covered with brown sugar. When he got typhoid he would touch none of the medicines or broths prepared for him. Sarah grieved and sneaked food into him, when she could bread and butter covered with brown sugar, which perforated his bowels, and hastened his death. It was a terrible tragedy to us. Therefore we had loved Jonathan with the wholeness of heart, that belongs only to childhood. We moved to the city soon afterward. Fifty-one father thought, rightly, that the move would help to assuage our grief. Ben, like his son Jonathan, also died from an aggravation to his illness. He had always been terrified of thunder, and at the first clap would hide. Just after Jonathan's death, when Ben's fever was at its worst, we had a bad storm. Dr. Metcalf, who knew Ben's terror, came and stayed with him. They darkened the room, and did everything possible, but the storm came too near, and when a sudden, vicious, defendant clap ripped the air just outside the house, Ben screamed and fell over dead. 52 Chapter 13 Father be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Psalm XXXI, V24 It seems a long time ago, that my father taught me to read the Bible and live by it, as his father did. It has been a help all through the years. He also suggested that each year the psalm corresponding to one's age, committed to memory, would be a comfort. And so it has. When I was thirty, and having my fifth child in six years, and was so clumsy and feeling older and homelier than I ever have had time to since, the husband and I had a stupid misunderstanding. He had a beautiful client. She demanded much of his time, and used to call him up at home. I couldn't bear her ingratiating, sensuous voice, and was sure my husband had fallen for her. I imagined everything. She was young, and rich and getting hard fought divorce. Her husband still liked her, and was not at all complacent, and she needed a smart lawyer. But I spent hours planning how, after 53 the baby came, I would support the five children. Why I ever thought, that my husband wouldn't at least want the children. I don't know, you know. It is fantastic. The grief I suffered, and the lengths my imagination took me. I was going to take all the children, and run away to a distant western farm, where they would never hear of their father. 
I even wrote to a chamber of commerce in a small town in Wyoming to ask for a real estate agent. As luck would have it, when I went west years later to visit my daughter Frankie and her husband on their beautiful ranch, I went through the town where I had once thought of retreating. I remembered that I had received a polite letter and had meant to follow it up, but all the children got the measles. When they got well, after all being terribly sick, the baby came with complications. Then the beautiful divorcee went away. She has had three divorces since, but, thank goodness, another lawyer. This long preamble is meant to lead up to my point, that the 31st Psalm was real help and solace to me. I used to say it over and over. It certainly describes how I felt and looked. I never told my fears and suspicions and grief to my husband. He thought me sick and cross, undoubtedly, but that his 54 family was to vanish in thin air he still does not know. Mother and I read the 90th summer a few weeks before she died at 90 years of age. How true it all is, she said, and repeated, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. He father loved Latin and was, suppose, a fair Latin scholar. Anyway, we were impressed by his at quotations, and some of them have stuck to this day. Once, when I was chased by our bull, and in climbing the fence, to get away I left my skirts on the top rail, and ran home in my white cotton drawers, he asked me why I did not a scream for him, since I knew that he was in the summer house nearby. I confess that I had been too frightened to scream, so he made me repeat after him, Obstupui, steterum comi, et vox fossi bus he sit. I stood aghast, my hair on end, and my voice stuck in my throat. He needs I, 774. Only I didn't stand Iran. He would often quote from Cicero non enum parenda nobis, said for Alendra sapientia rest. We must not only purchase wisdom, but employ it. And when we bickered over details, and were petty, and quarrel fifty five sum, he would say, transcurrimus solitis simus nugas. Let us skip over such refined fooleries, and subtle trifles. Point one one. Once when we had a lot of girls to lunch, and the walls fairly rattled with our chatter and laughter, he said, Quand o convenient, Margareta apostrophe Camilla, Sibylla, et garia incipient et amhic, et amho, et alila. That always seemed a wonderful limitation of girls' chatter in any language. 56 Chapter 14 Pato Om at Vacation When I was 10 years old my friend Emily Waterman asked me to come the day after Christmas and make her a visit. I had never been away from my family before, and although the trip from Cedar Spring Farm, Wickford, to the Waterman's Farm in Potowam it was not long, it seemed to me, I was going to the ends of the earth. I remember Christmas, that year vaguely I was so busy packing, and I took two enormous bags with everything I owned, or could appropriate from the rest of my family. I can see kind Mrs. Waterman's expression as a coachman staggered in with my valises. I was to stay four days. She asked if I needed both bags in the bedroom I was to share with Emily. Fortunately I had packed clothes in one, which went upstairs. The other stayed near the front door unopened until I went home. The Waterman's house and family were delightful. Emily had four older brothers Rufy, Willie, John and George and an older sister, which seemed very exciting to me, the oldest in my family. They lived in a lovely old house in the midst 57 of a great big farm with an enormous hay barn and cattle and horses and pigs and chickens and lots of dogs. Harris Buckland, with whom I have been reminiscing this story, tells me when he visited the Watermans, he was George's friend, that George's great big dirty mongrel dog slept in the bed be between him and George. The dog was in bed, when they went to bed. George took it as a matter of course. They lived in much more style than we, and had a man in a white coat to wait on tables. I was much impressed. My mother was clever, and usually had someone to do heavy work and wash dishes, but the least said about our help's manners and style, the better. The first three days of the vacation passed in great contentment. To my surprise I was not homesick at all. 
we walked and skated, and visited the farm, made apple pie beds for the youngest two brothers, George, and John, Willie and Rufy, the oldest, we were in awe of, and so let them alone. We also went with Mrs. Waterman and called on the Wellings, neighbors. I was much impressed with Mr. Ricard Welling, a tall dark young man who looked like an Indian. He had just become a lawyer, and I told him my father was one, but he was quite indifferent, and showed plainly he didn't fifty-eight like fat little girls of ten, and did not want to be bothered. Emily, when we got home, told me another intriguing bit of news of Dick Welling, as I later grew to call him. He loved swimming, but could not float, and had to swim as hard as he could when in the water, either salt or fresh, to keep from sinking. Later summers when we went bathing together I can remember how annoyed he would get, because Emily and I could not sink, and could stay motionless on the top of the water for hours, while he had to work hard all the time to keep afloat. Also we never got cold, and he shivered after a few minutes. The Watermans had other charming neighbors. One house had a big stone fireplace in the middle of a room with openings all around, and the fire burning in the center. Such a good idea, so many people could and did gather around the fire. Mr. Waterman was a great joker, and teased us unmercifully, which I loved. He told me a story about a damn sight to tell my father. After fifty years I am still trying to think it out. I have always been slow at seeing the point of any joke. The day before I was to go home and vacation was over, we woke to find a big snow and sleet storm. Mrs. Waterman would not let us go out. George suggested 59 hide comer and seek. We played it all over the house with such shrieks and yells from Emily and me, we always had to hide, and George found us that finally poor Mrs. Waterman said we'd better put our things on, and go out in the band to play. I it was an entrancing place to play a great big band full of sweet smelling hay. We slid down the hay from the loft to a pile of hay on the floor. I am sure the farm hated us the next day, for at every slide we would pull down a lot of hay with us. Finally Emily said, let's climb up on the very top, it seemed like a mountain tie and slide down. Quote she did it first, safely. She was much quicker, and more agile than I I climbed up, and must have gone over the peak, for I found myself falling and sliding down the other side of the mountain of hay, and next to the ban wall. I clutched frantically at the hay and tried to stop, but down I went into the dark and dusty valley till I reached the barn floor many feet below. It seems that there was a two-foot space left all around the loft between the wall and the floor, where the hay was piled for ventilation. I, of course, did not know of it, and our much smaller barn at Cedar Spring had no such space. Emily sensed what had happened, yelled to George, who was in the harness room, 60 he came, tried to push a ladder down, but couldn't. I had pulled down, so much hay with me, in trying to as I top my fall that I had blocked the opening. George rushed to the house, and got Rufy and the butler, and apparently everyone else on the place came too, and they had the most awful time getting me out. I was nearly asphyxiated, when George and Rufy bravely slid down beside me, they could not carry me through the opening. I was too fat, and the opening too narrow. Rufy stood on George's shoulders, and they pushed me to the opening, and by the simple method of pinching my fanny very hard made me work to escape. They pushed and pushed and pinched and pinched. I was choking and crying, and they were choking too, and really risked their lives to get me out. As I struggled to escape them, I heard George gasp. God, if we only had a hat pin, that would move her. I made one desperate lunge. The butler and Woolly held the lad firm, and I was out, but coughed and choked for hours. And my face was crimson and swollen and my eyes bloodshot. George and Rufy lay on the band floor. And brother-like, turned on Emily. Don't you dare ever have another visit or we will skin you live, they said. 61 When our governess bathed me the night I got home, she called mother. True what can have happened to this child's back, said I had fallen skating. George and Rufy had done a good job. 
I was BLA 0K and blew for weeks and sat down very gingerly. 62 Chapter 15 Melody Meadows Belevel at Prodile and the Old Phillips Castle Claude Turner Point Nine a bachelor, who lived with his old lady mother, decided to move. His mother had to be persuaded, and won over to the new home, which was 15 miles distant from the home they had lived in for four years. The new house was old, very old, with a beautiful gambro roof and a pilastered stone chimney. Claude couldn't understand why the banisters sold him the house for such a reasonable price. They had only lived there a few years, but Mabel Bannister was neurotic, and said the country made her sad. So back to their apartment in town they went, leaving much of their early American furniture in the house. Claude bought the furniture too, for a song, and bragged a good deal of his buccin as lacumen. The new people in Belleville praised, and envied him. Com or his purchase, but he noticed none of the old timers said anything. They are jealous, quote he told his mother. We were too smart for them. 63 Are you sure there is nothing the matter with the place? It certainly is odd that it was not snatched up before at the price we are paying, said Mrs. Turner. Find out all you can about it and who lived there and let's get the best person we can and have it put in perfect condition. We do not ever want to move again. We must see that the old woodwork is not trotten, and that the beams and sills are sound. All right, we'll fix it, agreed Claude. Later she suggested, perhaps it is haunted. What nonsense, snorted Claude. He engaged the best architect he knew, from New York, to do over the house. The architect went into raptures at the house and garden, why didn't I know of this place before, he said. What is it called? It is the old Maury place, and is called Melody Meadows. The saying is that Maury came from Ireland, in 1690, and brought a lovely young wife who became homesick. Maury tried to make this place and garden like her Irish home to please her. Point one one I should think it would please anyone, said the architect. It is absolutely perfect. This room 64 is a gem with its high mullion windows, and this door leading into the garden. But if Claude and the architect had but known, it was in the same room, that little Rosemary Morey, so long ago had begged and pleaded to go home. Dear, kind husband, just permit me to see my family for a few short months and I will return to you, and will be a faithful and dutiful wife all my life. Ft she cried. Be not absurd, said her husband. No woman in your condition should take that long trip. Think how rough the ocean is in winter. You might be ill and lose our child. If you will stop plaguing me now, after you are well we will take the child and go and see your parents. You know very well you would not run the risk of the child's health on the ocean for years, but now I can go home and come back in five months and have the baby here. Please, please, dear husband Maury, I must go. She fell on her knees, and grasped his hand. He, poor tortured man, pushed her from him, and she fell over with a little groan. As she fell, her beloved Maltese cat, brought as a kitten from 65 Island, sprang at Maury from the sill of one of the high windows, and clawed his face, so he bore the scars to his dying day. Maury grabbed the cat, and to his horror felt its neck snap, and the cat go limp in his hands. Rosemary, moaning, and sobbing, took it from him, and rushed into the garden. She stood holding the body of the cat, and looked with unseeing eyes at the lovely garden and the babbling brook, shining in the moonlight. I hate this place and this new hard land, and I curse it. May everyone who ever lives here be dot as wretched as I am. My dearest kitten, my one living tie with home and happiness, now you are gone, but I too will be gone soon. She laid the cat gently under a newly planted silver moon rose bush. I will come and bury you in the morning, she whispered. In the morning she was in a raging fever, and lost her baby in a few days. She implored the midwife, to let her go and bury her cat, and Beck distracted Maury, to bury it for her. 66 Maury looked for the cat's body, but could not find it. He told Rosemary. She laughed hysterically. Well done, 
my feline friend, she cried. Now you will haunt this cursed place forever. T.T. Claude and the architect continued talking of the place. Who did all the planting? Suppose Maury did, but maybe it was the Willises, who lived here later. It has changed hands many times, according to the deeds and according to gossip, because something happened to a young girl or woman. We have no young girls, and are not likely to. Mother is 86, and I'm a confirmed Labatler, so we are safe. Claude and Mrs. Turner took moving very hard. They had every piece of furniture wrapped in cotton batting, and the rugs sewn in burlap for the 1-8 trip. The moving men were nervous wrecks, Claude and Mrs. Turner had been so fussy. One of the men said, When I immigrated here from the old country, with a wife and nine childer, 67 it was easier than moving these two old birds this short trip. T. Mrs. Turner stood the moving better than Claude. She went from her bed in the old house to her new bed at Melody Meadows, and sank peacefully to sleep. Claude out cold as he sat in the doorway of Melody Meadows, to direct the placing of the furniture as it was carried in. It was a hot April day and he had rushed around in his excitement, and had become overheated. The next day he could not speak out loud, and had a bad sore throat. Fanny, their cook, called the doctor. He said he could not come, but would send his new assistant. When the young doctor came calmer into Claude's room, after his first greeting, he said, That's a cute Maltese kitten you have. Where is it? asked Claude. Just by the front door, lying in the sun. I have not seen it. It must have come with the house, comma 11 said Claude. It was not spoken of again, and Claude forgot the incident. Some weeks later when the architect was again 68 there, and he and Claude came into the house, the architect, ahead of Claude, said, Oh, what a sweet kitten, where did you get it? Those real Maltese are Sir NL.1F F. Where is it? asked Claude. Why, it just ran into the parlor. Both men looked. No kitten. It must be hiding, said Claude. Let's have a drink. Although Claude never saw the kitten himself, he was conscious that it was around. He would see, or imagine he did, the flicker of its tail as it ran from one part of the house to another. Many people did see it. The milkman, the man repairing rugs, the electrician, the next door neighbor's little boy who brought his cat to get acquainted, and then found no kitten. Claude never once said, there is no kitten and always hoped to see it himself. Fanny, the cook, was fat and very lazy. She and Nelson were the Turner's only permanent help. The district nurse came every day, to attend to Mrs. Turner, and was always looking for a nurse who would live in the house, and give Mrs. Turner the con 69 stand care she needed. I don't know what's come over all these young girls. She grumbled. I can't get one of them to come here and lots of them need money. Point one one. Finally, there was an epidemic of flu and Mrs. Wilson, the nurse, was so busy with really sick people she told Fanny she would have to get on as best she could with Mrs. Turner for a while. Fanny was furious and told Claude she would leave, that she had too much work anyway, and taking real care of Mrs. Turner was one thing she would not do. Claude raised her wages to keep her, and, of course, had to raise Nelson's too. He wrote to every place he could think of to get a nurse. At last the architect, hearing of the dilemma, wrote, My brother's daughter, who is a trained nurse, and who has had a tragic experience, is looking for a place in the country. I should think your place would be ideal, and I feel sure Mrs. Turner will like her. Claude telegraphed for her, and Rose Madison arrived one beautiful October day. Nelson met her at the station. Claude and his mother were sitting 70 on the terrace as she came up. After greeting them, she went ahead of Claude into the house to see her room. What a darling kitten. Oh, I love cats, she said. Claude did not answer but a chill hand seemed to grasp his heart. What a fool I am, he thought, and shook himself. Mrs. Turner took to Rose at once and Rose said she had never seen such a beautiful and sweet old lady. They had the most wonderful time together, and, 
when Mrs. Turner found that Rose could sing, made her sing constantly, and taught Rose the words of all the old songs she knew. Rose played a little, enough to accompany herself on the piano, and evening after evening she played and sang to them. Poor Claude! He knew what had happened to him. He had fallen in love for the second time in his life. He had had many affairs in his youth, but only one real love. She had thrown him over a month before their wedding furniture, handsome a man. Claude had had a useful life. He was a 71 scientist, and wrote books and textbooks on his chosen subject. He was respected, and highly thought of by a coterie of intelligent people. He had been more than kind to his mother, and until Rose came and wakened long forgotten sensations he thought his life was over. He was F. I. six. Rose was twenty-eight. She was tall and slender, with a pale skin and big blue eyes with black lashes. She was always very quiet, and sat perfectly still when in repose. She had beautiful hands, which she kept quietly folded in her lap. Claude had the wildest notions. He wanted to kneel in front of her, and put his head in her lap, and put her soft hands on his head. He wanted children and he blushed to himself at how much he wanted Rose as his wife. Rose was apparently just existing. She had seen the young doctor she had been engaged to die of yellow fever during the Spanish-American War, and had stayed on and taken care of many tragic cases until the war's end. She too, felt her life was over. The peace and security of Melody Meadows 72 was just what she needed and after a few weeks she blossomed like her namesake. Her cheeks had a faint color and her eyes were more luminous than ever. Claude was so in love he was tongue-tied, and could only follow his mother and Rose around. His mother, wise old woman, saw what had happened and prayed she would live long enough to hold a grandchild. She was careful not to praise Claude too much to Rose, but did drop remarks at how devoted he had always been. A good son makes a good husband, she said. Another time Claude's PhD thesis was very well thought of, and he received letters from college presidents about it. Rose never heard, and just let the old lady prattle on. She lived from day to day, getting her nerves in shape, and realizing that life held beauty and peace, in spite of the suffering she had experienced. Only one thing bothered her. I love cats but I do wish that kitten wouldn't follow me around. Its glaring eyes upset me, she told Fanny. Your comma cuckoo, said Fanny. There ain't no cat. Rose shuddered. I must be seeing things, 73 and she brushed her hand across her eyes. Don't tell Mr. or Mrs. Turner, will you, she said. I don't tell nobody nothing. But this is a rum place, observed Fanny. After a time of such peace and happiness as comes rarely to mortals, Mrs. Turner woke Rose one night. I'm dying, she said. Please call Claude. I Claude telephoned the doctor, and while they waited, he and Rose stood one each side of Mrs. Turner's bed. She smiled at Rose. You will take care of Claude, won't you? Rose hesitated. He loves you very much, and is only waiting I till you know him better to tell you. Isn't that so, Claude? Yes, dear, I love her, and hope she will be my wife. And to Rose. I adore you. Oh, said Rose, what shall I say? Say you love him, and will marry him, and I seventy-four can die happy. Rose looked at Claude. Why, I do love you. I didn't know it at all now. Dot dot it Claude came around the bed, and took her in his arms. So the doctor found them, and found also that he could do nothing for Mrs. Turner. She died a few hours after, peacefully, with her hands clasping the hands of Claude and Rose. Claude and Rose were married, as soon as possible and went to Bermuda on a honeymoon. Claude gave Fanny and Nelson a vacation, and had the house professionally fumigated, while they were away. Drive out everything, spirits and all, he told the fumigators. We sure will. Nothing can last in the dose we will give them. Point one one the honeymooners returned in the spring and Rose busied herself with the garden. I have always wanted a garden, and this one is so beautiful, but it does need a lot of pruning. 
don't overdo. Darling, I am sure the sun 75 shine, and fresh air are good for you, but you know how precious you are, and especially just now. Claude, how can we be so happy? If your mother had only lived to see the baby. I know she always wanted a grandchild. I feel sure she knows, don't you? Yes, I am sure she does. Claude, I must tell you that, since we came back I have not seen, that ghost kitten. I am glad, said Claude. Who told you about it? No one told me, it was just there, and when I asked Nelson, he said there was no kitten. Dot Fanny never saw it neither did your mother. Nelson has seen it lots of times, but not since we were married. I guess the fumigators fixed it, let's forget it. Dot yes, let's. They had a month of perfect happiness. Rose lived in the garden. The garden sloped in gentle terraces to a little rushing brook. The murmur of the brook, as it tumbled over stones, could be heard in the house. Across the brook and climbing up the hill opposite, were the sweet meadows filled with me 76 dow larks and other singing birds. Probably they and the brook made Rosemary Mori, so long ago call the place Melody Meadows. Old Maury had built a sod wall that descended to the brook on each side of the garden, and had planted quantities of roses, to climb on the wall. Many of the roses, are seen rarely in this country. Small fragrant yellow ones, deep red ones and lots of white ones. And in the years they had grown, and loved their habitation so, they had outgrown all bounds in the meadows. The other side of each wall, was a perfect tangle of roses for acres. The brook was too wide to jump across, and as the tangle of roses was impenetrable the only access to the garden, was through the house or a small side gate beside the house. I feel safe when I know you are in the garden. Titi said Claude jokingly. No one can get you, and take you from me. Rose did not answer. She had not slept all well the night before for she had seen the Maltese kitten again, and it seemed bigger, more menacing and ready to spit at her. Thrim neurotic, and I will not give in to 77 this thing, she said to herself. She took a sleeping pill, that night and made Claude very happy, by sleeping in his arms. Hold me tight and on it ever let me go, she said. Don't worry, my darling, I never will. The next day she felt better than for years. I really am myself again, and having this baby is just what I needed for my nerves, comrade, she thought. That night was full moon. She and Claude walked in the garden, arm in arm, for a long time. Isn't that silver moon rose the most beautiful thing you have ever seen, she asked Claude. It grows so tall and strong, and how good it smells. Tell if the silver moon rose climbed over the wall and was a blanket of exquisite single cream white blossoms. Nelson appeared. Someone to see you, Mr. Turner. The gentleman would give no name. Said it was business. I will be right back, darling, said Claude. Seventy-eight when he came back, there had been no one at the door, and in the dark, Nelson had failed to see the man. He called to Rose and got no answer. He called again, then... Thinking she was dizzing him and hiding, he walked around trying to find her. He looked everywhere, and called and called, then in alarm he yelled at Nelson to come. Both men searched the garden down to the brook, then they got lanterns and looked. Nelson found her dragged way under the silver moon rose vine. Still warm, with her face clawed beyond recognition. Later it was discovered her neck was broken. Something had jumped or leaped off for the wall on her, and snapped her neck. There were no footprints or signs of an animal, but clutched in Rose's beautiful hand were a few hairs which the police, said belonged to the cat family. A month later a farmer about ten miles away killed a large bobcat, not unusual in our part of the world. The hairs clutched in Rose's hand could have belonged to it, the police thought, but they were uncertain. 79 in town, little Mary Tilly I.S. mother turned on her, now you see I was right not to let you take care of Mrs. Turner. That Meadows is a bad place. Poor Claude, he lives in an apartment in New York. 
Nelson takes care of him. Claude does not much care how. Melody Meadows is for sale again, and cheap. 80 Chapter 16 Seek no further, when I was a child, once a year in the early fall, my mother would have the buckboard with two horses hitched, and we would go to Exeter, to get some wonderful eating apples which grew on a farm there, and nowhere else. There were a number of seek no further apple trees, and we tried in every way, to grow them with no luck. The trees belonged to a farmer with many children who lived in a very run-down and shabby house, but a lovely view. The family all seemed contented. They were always glad to see us, and welcomed the things we brought clothes, food, blankets, etc. Soon my father died, and we went to Europe for many years. As soon as I returned, I went to look for Blanny, and was told this pitiful story, and given the little pewter mirror she had asked her neighbor, to keep for my mother, which I still have. Blanny had been blind since birth. The dirty midwife who attended her mother had never heard of nitrate of silver drops for the newborn eyes, and as her mother and father were both 81 diseased, Blanny never saw more than shadows of faint gray. She was the youngest living child in her family. In order of birth she was the tenth. The first five children had lived, and the next four had died, so there was quite a gap in age between Blanny and the next oldest. She was quite happy. In the winter she lived in a homemade pen near the stove, and in summer in the same pen under the oak tree in the yard. When it rained she was brought inside to her spot near the now coal stove, or to the living room. There were only two rooms. As many of the family as could slept in the kitchen in winter, and in summer just anywhere they happened to drop. All the family were kind to her. While she was a baby, anyone who happened along changed her and gave her something to eat usually a foul rag soaked in milk, to suck. They dried her wet diapers, and put them back on her, unwashed, for months, until her little buttocks ulcerated and superetted. She hung on the bars of her pen for hours, rather than sit down, but she never cried only moaned, softly and gently. Finally, when the flesh was falling off, eighty to her oldest brother, John, said, for God's sake, Ma, let that baby alone, and let her fanny heal. Don't put any clothes on her. It was fortunately summer and the sun and air healed her, but she always bore the scars on her smooth skin. For years she never wore more than a sweater, or an old coat her feet and legs were always bare. She learned instinctively to relieve herself in one corner of her pen, and when her oldest brother saw that she was naturally clean, he put an old low brass bale in the corner, and would empty it twice a day. Good girl, Blanny, he would say, to be so nice, and clean point one one Blanny would flush with pleasure at his praise. When the family were out working in the fields and Blanny was alone she would sit perfectly still for a long time, and presently some animal would come to her pen a dog or cat or chicken, and sometimes, if the domestic animals were away, a rat or moose or chipmunk. Once a baby deer came for three days running, and drank her milk. Blanny would put out her gentle hand and make soft grinning noises, and the animal would touch her finger. Birds used to perch on the pen, and twitter 83 and chirp. Blanny could imitate all the farmyard noises, and when she was alone and sure that no one could hear, she would sing like the birds little meaningless notes, but true and sweet. A robin would sit for minutes, and sing a note, and she would sing the same, and they would have quite a duet. The neighbors worried and talked about Blanny, but they were all poor and overworked, and powerless to do much for her. Backland New England farms are barren and unproductive. Almost everyone in Exeter lived from hand to mouth. Lack of modern equipment and fertilizers, and most of all, proper agricultural education, made living very grim. Blanny's family were probably the worst off, but many others ran a close second. No one knew what to suggest, but everyone avoided mention of the overcrowded Exeter School, which was a state institution for the feeble-minded. Blanny, although blind and somewhat arrested in her development, was far from being an imbecile, and anything seemed better than the school. If we say anything, those cruel people will take her, said one mother to another 
and the child is really happier at home she has never known 80 for anything else. But what will happen to her, when she gets bigger question mark LT argued another, she can't sit in that pen all her life. T.I. and still another would say, darn it talk about her. If those agents knew there was that farm back of Driscoll's place they would have all of them out of there, and in institutions in a thrice point one T.I. won't say a word, but I'm going into Lafayette next week, to get me some flannel, and I can make that child a dress along with one for my daughter. We can at least look out for her that way, and take her food, when we can dot et those kind women, and others like them, made plan his life easier, but her indolent family, except for her brother, John, left her more and more alone, and depended on the neighbor's interest and care. Once Mrs. Parsons, the Baptist minister's wife, saw Blanny's sister, Mabel, wearing a warm coat which the sewing circle had made for Blanny. She was so angry, that she nearly told the authorities. But Mabel had been cold too, and Blanny had warm dresses and sweaters, and a comforter and a blanket. She had begged Mabel, to wear 85 of the coat, which was much too large for her. Here, maybe nice coat lady gave Blanny. You take it. Maybe took it. Blanny was now six years old. John taught Blanny to count, and put pennies in her hand, and taught her to tell the coins. Later he gave her a penny, and she was so proud. She knotted it, with his help, in the corner of a rag she had, so she could easily find it and show it. John also taught her the alphabet, and she could recite it backward and forward. He taught her Mary had a little lamb, and once read her the story of Cinderella. When Blanny was fourteen, the war came. All the boys had to go. In the few weeks while Ned, the brother next to Blanny, was waiting to be called in the draft, the father and mother both caught influenza. It turned to pneumonia, and in a week both were dead. John was frantic. He was due to leave for the army. His father and mother were gone. His sister, Mabel, aged twenty point and was married with three small children of her own. Her husband was overseas and she lived now with her in-laws. The other boys had gone. What to do with Blanny? Eighty-six one of the neighbors was Peter Scrothers. He owned a good house and farm with animals and fowl, but had never been able to keep a wife. Three different women had married him, and then run away, and for a good reason. Peter was a sadist. Immediately after the parents' funeral, they had been buried in the family plot on the farm, the four brothers and one sister held a conclave, to make what plans they could for Blanny. Mabel said, I'd love to take her. I asked Mrs. Peters, to help me with the children, so I could go get a job, but she wouldn't let me, and said if Blanny was in blind she would. Her voice trailed off miserably. Then George Cranston, the undertaker, said his work was done, and he had to go, and that Mabel would have to come, if she wanted a lift home, so Mabel went. The boys got nowhere. She'll just have to go to the state school, comma 11 one of them would say, and another would say, but we can't do that. She's so gentle, and they would be terrible with her. L then one of them would ask again, but what can we do? Peach Crowthers joined the group. I'm 87 sorry about your more and poor, he said. What are you going to do about Blanny? We just don't know. John and Harry were already in uniform, home on leave for the funeral. Ted was due to leave next week and Ned when called. We hate to send her to the state school, but it looks like we'll have to. I'll marry her, said Pete, trembling slightly. I got a good house, and will feed her, and don't care if she's blind. The boys looked at one another. They had heard ugly tales of Pete. Let's ask her, John said, finally. Let I.S. ask her, if S.H.E.I.D. rather marry you, or go to the state school. It never occurred to him that Blanny would have absolutely no way of telling. They asked her and she said, does he really want me? It's what he says. Point one one. does he know I can I to see much? Pete came over, and took her hand. Sure I want you, he said. If I'll cook and you can sit, and wait for me to come home. It's nice and warm, and you can bring your kitten. That settled it with the boys. 
Pete seemed 88 pretty rough, but the kitten scored for him, and the state school would never have allowed a kitten. Well, you go home now, and see about getting the license. John said. Come back with it day after tomorrow. I'll go get Mabel, so she can see Blanny married, and get the parson to come. Pete demurred. He wanted to take Blanny with him then and there, saying they could have the wedding from his house. But John was firm. Blanny was to be married properly, and no mistake about it. Mabel came back the next day. John gave Mabel money and she bought Blanny a white dress and veil. The dress was soft smooth rayon and Blanny loved the cool feel of it. She was happy and excited and ran her hand over Pete's face to uh, find out what he looked like. Pete had a few qualms and misgivings. Blanny was so little and gentle. Her sightless eyes were beautiful, a lovely shade of deep violet. Her skin was soft and clear. He was resolved to be kind and make this child happy. The wedding day was lovely, and Planny felt the softness of the weather, and smiled to have a beautiful day for her wedding. Eighty-nine Mabel tried to prepare her for marriage. You won't like it at first, but you soon get used to it, and it's what we all have to put up with, she said. Ma told me how I got a baby, Komatiti said Planny. I do want a baby, point one F I hope he's good to you, Mabel went on. They do say he can be mean and Laura, the last wife, says awful things, but shit's no good anyway. T. Pete Shaw has his divorce, hasn't he? Blanny asked. Sure, John saw the papers. Just before the minister arrived, while Blanny sat all dressed up and waiting, there was a commotion at the door. John went out. It was Tom Perry, Mabel's brother-in-law, who lived in Valentown, twenty miles away. John, he said, you can't let Blanny marry Pete's Crothers. He's crazy. I just heard about it, and drove over as fast as I could. John came back in the house, shaken and worried. He called Mabel into the other room, and they had a long consultation. Finally Blanny called them. Seems to me, you better tell me what we're talking about. If go it, I s about me, quote she said. It's about Pete, said Mabel. We hear he is a mean man and cruel to his wives and you better not marry him. Tell Tom Perry to come here so as I can talk to him, it said Planny, and to Tom, I asterisk want to be married. I can't stay here, and where 111 one go, if I don't it go to Pete one s 9 And I told him I would. Don't let's talk about it anymore. Here's Pete coming now. I hear his horse. Pete came in and said he was ready. Tom didn't know what to do and left, muttering it ought not to be allowed. John put Blanny's bag with the little mirror in the kennel, and she climbed onto the front seat beside Pete. John and Mabel sat in the back, and off they drove to the minister's. Pete was all dressed up and Blanny felt his new suit with pleasure. I'm going to buy you some new clothes, to come at it, he said Pete. We'll go to town any day now. Did you hear, Mabel? Blanny dust, happily. Mabel and John were very silent. Mr. Parsons, the Baptist minister, had made the appointment, and knew they were coming, but he still did not want to marry them. He tried a last 91 argument with John, going over the same ground they had covered before. She's too young, said Mr. Parsons, and blind besides. Feet Mabel can't take her, said John. Wearily. Nothing is worse than the state school. She wants to get married, and I am her guardian, and she has my consent. What else can we do? I don't know, said Mr. Parsons, and he reluctantly performed the ceremony. John and Mabel kissed Blanny goodbye at the parsonage door. John had to leave for camp at once, and Mabel had to hurry back to her family. Blanny smiled at them happily and proudly. She was Mrs. Peter Scrothers now, a child no longer. She went off on the arm of her husband, and the last John and Mabel saw of her, she was being lifted into the sorry by Pete. She won eleven like have a team of her own, quote said Mabel. God, I hope he's good to her, said John. If he isn't, I'll fix him when I come back. I'll kill him. 
It Peter's good intentions and his gentleness did not last long. Blaney's helplessness opened 92 up new fields to his pathological sadism. He had a limber little whip, and his pleasure was to creep up on her, and strike her across the breasts. After her shrieks of terror and anguish, he would get his satisfaction, and then sleep for hours. Blaney tried to run away, but being blind, and in strange surroundings she was easily caught. After her first attempt he whipped and threatened her, so that she never dared try it again. She soon found that, if she stayed in bed, and was complacent when he came to her, the whipping and his attention were soon over. So Sievert Julia lived in bed. Pete would bring her a plate of their food, when he cooked his own meal. He was quite content to have her do nothing except be his wife and stay in bed waiting and cringing. She became very thin, and almost transparent from lack of air and sun, and from constant fear and dread. A year after her marriage, she died of ill treatment by Pete. She was six months pregnant, and he mistreated her, and caused a miscarriage. John did not come back. He went into the Air Force as a turret gunner and was killed over rants on his first mission. All during his months 93 of training he had written letters to Mabel with messages for Blaney. He had written to Pete and sent Blaney his news and his love. She was probably the last person in his thoughts, before he went to oblivion. Pete did not marry again. He is shunned by everyone, and as one neighbor put it, why he's worse than no good, and now that he has no wife, he messes with his critters. T94 Chapter 17 Fell a thelet napper never, to be forgotten days Hungarian, I think one autumn we were delayed in London until nearly Christmas. My mother, Gladys, Ruth and I had gone to Europe, to put Gladys and Ruth in a French boarding school kept by the delightful Marquise de San Carlos de Pedrosa of Madrid. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, and was a wise and great woman. Her boarding school for young girls was a splendid one a perfectly fascinating place called Chateau Diodon. My father and David stayed home, while David finished his term at Andover, and they were to join us in the spring. As soon as we landed we went directly, to visit some friends outside of London. There our French maid, Marie, was taken sick. She had to have, what was supposed to be a slight operation but it proved serious and she nearly died. We left the kind Moffats, our English friends, and moved into London, waiting day after day, to be able to leave for France, and to take Marie home 95 to her family to recuperate. Finally, one terribly rainy day in December, we left Charing Cross Station for Dover. We got a comfortable second-class carriage to ourselves and settled Marie with pillows behind her back and Ruth with her books and toys facing her. Mother, Gladys and I sat anywhere, surrounded by our luggage. There seemed to be a good deal of commotion at the station as we left, but we did not dot pay any attention. When we go to Dover it was raining cats and dogs, and a howling gale was blowing. Why we did not think of waiting until the storm was over, I do not know. We hustled aboard the channel boat and mother said to me, we will sit here and wait. Go and try to get a stateroom to put Marie in. I think it is going to be very rough. We had two porters carrying our bags. One porter put his down beside mother, received his pay, and left. I turned and saw our other porter going into a stateroom with our bags, among them the one which held all our tickets and valuables. I darted after him frantically. As I got to the closed door of the state 96 room and started to go in, I was grabbed by the arms by two of the biggest footmen in livery I ever saw. I struggled to get free, saying, the porter is stealing our bags and tickets. I must get them. Let me go. Nothing happened. Just then the door of the state room opened and our porter came out. Sitting opposite the door at a table were three men one in uniform. I screamed to our porter, you have stolen my lug itt grage, and to the mentor stop him, and not let him get away. Dead silence. After a little the man in the middle said something to the footman holding me, for I was pushed into the room, and the door closed behind me, the footman still holding me in a vise. 
for one sign you what fear was. I was desperate to talk plight. I had failed mother, lost articles and letters of credit, and valuables. I didn't know what to do, or how to get away. Sensing that the young man in the middle, was the person in authority, I turned on him. How I dare you bring me in here and steal our things? I shouted. He looked terribly surprised and said, in perfect English, Madame Asselle is an American. 97 yes, I am but that is no reason for you to be a thief. Please. Madame Asselle. Then he said something else to my captors, for they let my arms go. I could move, and turn to get out. Then in a corner I saw mother's sable cape and the precious bags. Those are my bags and my mother's cape. I cried, pointed to them. Oh, Madame Asselle, I am sorry, he said, standing up for the first time. He asked some questions. All the men shook their heads. Do not think too badly of us. It was a mistake. I do not know how your things got here. Of course, you know how they got here, I stormed at him. You thought you saw an easy way to steal some nice things. You are a miserable thief. Now, let me go. Quote, please don't go. Do sit down and tell TT me where you came from. Are you going to Paris? TT sit down with a robber. I snorted. No, TT, then will you not shake hands, as this is all a mistake? Shake hands, of course not. I wouldn't anti touch you with a ten foot pole. I want my things, and to get out of here. I pointed out our things to the footman who carried them out. I took the ticket bag in my hand and went outside. What a storm had blown up. Mother had found a stateroom and the footman put our things in it. She was furious with me for going off and leaving her, and also worried about the luggage. I was two days to explain. Gladys said we were lucky to get a stateroom. The Grand Duke Michael, the Tsar's brother, is on board traveling officially, and has taken nearly all the staterooms, she explained. He has just been on a state visit to England. He is going back to Russia. He is young, and terribly good looking, the stewardess says. I felt faint. I had to have her, and in spite of the storm, went out on deck and hung over the rail on the lee side. How rough it was. I would probably have been seasick, if I had not been so excited. I had been standing there about 15 minutes, when I felt someone beside me. I looked up and there was the Grand Duke. He looked scared 99 to death, and his voice trembled as he said in a rush, Don't be cross there is so little time. Do tell me your name. You know I did not mean to cause you trouble. I stammered, I am so sorry I did not know who you were, your highness. Tt never mind being so formal, he laughed. I have never before or since, seen such beautiful teeth. Taiwu have already called me thief, and robber, and untouchable. Perhaps you could call me Mike my mother does. Dot. Dot there is the coast of France. We will be in soon. Harry, tell me where are you staying in Paris? How long? What's your name and your banker in case I do not soon get back from St. Petersburg? Where do you live in the United States? Whom are you traveling with? I told him the answers to the questions, and all the time the boat was bobbing around like a cork, and we never noticed. I must go, T, he said then, and repeated my whole name. Don't forget me. And perhaps it is not I who have stolen something. It is, I think, Miss Nita Wheelwright Baker. He was gone. A long time afterwards he told me they thought 100 I had come to the cabin to shoot him, and were terrified. They did not shoot. We were kept waiting at the dock at Calais for hours for the Imperial Russian party to land, and be put aboard their special train to Russia. When we arrived at the hotel in Paris our rooms were a bower of the most beautiful white violets, and white roses my favorite flower. Mother would not go in. She said there was a mistake. The flowers were not for us, and anyway she would not pay for them. The maitre d'hôtel was very solemn, and said he had no idea where the flowers came from, but he did treat us with great respect. From then on I was conscious that I was always followed, 
and being taken care of. We would come out of the theatre no taxis. In a minute one would pull up near us, and the driver would say, Voila, mademoiselle, and in we would get. We went to midnight mass Christmas Eve at the Madeleine no seats. Someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Slovaus plate. We followed, and were given good seats up front. I do not know how it was done. We got so used to it, and the never-ending flowers, that we hardly noticed. I never said a word, but hugged my secret to myself. I never had a letter 101 or card, and had no address to which I could send my thanks. Then one day, while mother and I were in Sicily we read in the newspapers, that the little Tsarevich was born after four daughters, and there was great rejoicing in all Russia, and that the Grand Duke Michael was not the heir any more. My sisters were in boarding school and mother had had a bad cold, so we had decided to take a trip to Sicily before the Easter vacation started, and we would have to be back in France with Gladys and Ruth. We stayed in Tamina at the old monastery made into a hotel. It is a most charming place, with a gorgeous view over the Mediterranean. I was taking a rather bored walk in the garden one hot midday after lunch, while mother was asleep. I heard my name called. There he was. I hardly knew him. He had seemed old and sedate on the channel boat. Now he was young and gay. He held out both hands and shook mine up and down. How are you? he asked. Did you get all the flowers? Wasn't it the most colossal luck that that baby was a boy? I feared that they 102 would never have won, and that I would have that joke around my neck always. Dot. Dot isn't this a nice place? I never was here before. Quote I didn't even tell my mother who he was then. She had forgotten what she knew of the channel episode, and had never seen him. She thought I had picked him up in Tamina. But he was attractive enough to make her forgive me, and think me lucky to have such a delightful, entertaining friend. What fun we had. We climbed Mola, a small mountain just back of the hotel. From where we had a lovely view of Etna, and the superb colored patchwork of the surrounding country. Mike was an expert mountaineer and a great friend of the Duke of Abruzzi, one of the greatest of mountain climbers. We played tennis. He played badly, for he had never had much chance to practice. I played badly with all the time in the world to practice. We played in the garden of the beautiful old Greek theater until the German Kaiserin and her oldest sons came to Tamina and put everyone off. They were quite stuffy, and we were very humble. I can see the twinkle in Mike's eyes now as we stood quietly beside the road, and bowed low as the German 103 royalty rode by. All too soon we had to leave. Mother hated to go. She had found some cronies, Lucy Aldrich, and Marion and Halle Hazard from Providence and they had all spent most of their waking hours playing whist. We caught the boat for Naples at Palermo, and went by way of Syracuse, where we saw the strange year of T, underscore of comma exclamation point dot us. It is a huge cave, now used by rope walkers, where the slightest sound can be heard inside for a quarter of a mile. We had fun whispering to each other rather Mike whispered to me. He called me a thief, a robber, and an untouchable. It was too far a walk for him to go to be whispered to, for we were lazy, and, as he said, I would not say anything worth hearing. Anyway, dot FD we spent only a night and a day in Palermo. Just time enough to go to Monreal, that gem of a church, and to the Conco d'Oro, shell of gold, where the steeple chase was being held. It is the most beautiful race track I have ever seen. And the riders are mostly officers in dashing uniforms astride their own horses. I won and he lost on the races. Unlucky in gambling and lucky in love, my 104-old nurse used to say, he quoted which seemed to please him. We had a grand dinner at a special restaurant whose name I have forgotten, and I felt that Mike was nervous. How could he have been so brave? Sicily was a hotbed of people who were against any royalty, and if he had been discovered would probably have been shot or injured. Anyway it would have been unpleasant. We went on board the steamer about 10 p.m. 
She was someone's private yacht probably belonging to the Florios. They were the big family in Sicily then. She was small and unseaworthy, and we had a tornado on the way to Naples. The boat simply stood first on one end, and then on the other. I was terribly sick. Mother, in her bunk, just hung on, and never said a word. During the worst the door opened, and in walked Mike. I thought the door was locked, but was too sick to care, as I suppose mother was also. He bundled me up in a blanket, sat on my bunk, put a basin in his lap, and held my head all night. I never should have let you drink champagne or eat that fish, he said. We were too exhausted to go farther than 105 Naples the next day, and spent two days there. We went to the opera, and just happened to hear Caruso, that night in Ada. Is it possible, that anyone else ever had such happiness? After the opera we walked to the hotel through the gardens along the waterfront in the moonlight. It is lucky the walk was not too long, for to the first beggar who asked us for money, Mike gave such a lot value the news travelled fast, and soon we must have had a retinue of at least fifty, all praising us, and singing with happiness. Mike emptied my bag and his pockets, and then turned them inside out and said, Now we are beggars.11 They laughed and blessed us, and Mike told them we needed their blessings and their prayers, we went into the hotel with their vivas ringing in our ears. He had to leave early the next morning and I did not see him for many months, but now I did get an occasional letter brought by messenger, which I answered the same way. It does cramp one's style, to know that someone is sitting in the next room waiting for an answer, and I know my letters were stupid and stilted. My father and brother came in the spring, LO6 we met them at Cuxhaven and then came back to Hamburg, and had a wonderful reunion, and went to the Hojenbeek Zoo. We longed for Pete, who took care of our animals at home. How we laughed when David pointed out a dupe looking Elland, and said it must have the thrip. The next morning, father asked me to walk to the bank with him. You have changed, dear, he said. Are you happy? You seem thoughtful to me. Dot. Dot your mother tells me you had a friend. Tell me about him. It, it was fun telling him everything. He laughed at the channel boat story and said right away. Why did you let the bag with the tickets out of your hands? At the bank father found a letter from Mike asking if he could come and call on him. Father wrote and said he could come as soon as convenient and told him our plans. Mike couldn't have been very far away for he was with us by lunchtime. It amused me so, for Mike was as nervous as a debutante. I had never heard him stutter. And he seemed hardly able to talk. Father was adorable to him. I do not 107 know what they said to each other. Point 9F, or all I heard as they started out to walk after lunch was, Don IT apologized to me, boy I love her. 2.1F Father told me later that Mike was moving heaven and earth to renounce his succession to the throne, take one of his lesser titles, and marry me. His mother and the Tsar had consented, and were delighted at the thought of his happiness. But until the Tsarevich was older and stronger, nothing could be done. He told father he was glad I was so young, for I could wait, and that he would wait there forever, if there was a chance. Father told him quite plainly, that he would never consent to a morganatic marriage and Mike said he did not want one either. That night the hotel was crowded, and Mike had to sleep with David, who happened to have an extra bed in his room. They had a pillow fight and a pillow burst, and the German housekeeper called them everything. She was so dancing mad. Tilda, that they had to get father to apologize for his two unruly sons, and he had to give her money enough to buy pillows for an army. We saw Mike again that summer, in Paris. He seemed worried. The Tsarevich was not very well. 108. While he was with us in Paris, a famous French hairdresser named Valentine offered mother 2,000 francs, $1,500 then, for a small part of her long hair. When my father came to get us, we told him joyfully of the offer. What? Father roared. He hasn't cut it yet, has he? Don't let him. I'll kill him, if he touches it. 
Valentine was terrified. Father, still sputtering, led us out of the salon. Mother did not get her money. Mike laughed and said that father was just right. One day when Mike was with us, I had to go shopping stockings, suppose. We went to the bond march. I told Mike I would only be a few minutes, and to wait for me on the ground floor near the main entrance. He found a chair and sat with his back against the wall at the end of a long aisle between two ribbon counters. As luck would have it, at the stocking counter, I met a friend of ours from the United States with her two daughters. None of them could speak French, and they fell on me to help them buy some of Marion's underclothes for her trousseau. 109 The type of monogram they wanted was difficult to explain, and neither I nor the store's expert interpreter could seem to understand. It took much longer than I realized. When I finally got back to Mike he was sound asleep with the shop girls much interested. But the two nice-looking civilians, the shabby-looking clerk, and the workman with a bunch of tools under his arm who were hovering around, and glared at me made me realize how well guarded he was. We call these men, who were constantly on the alert to protect him, the speckled band. Mike loved Sherlock Holmes and that was one of his bet stories. So he gave that name to his faithful group of secret service men. One thing I learned from Mike was to be totally unconscious of the people around. He simply didn't see anyone, unless he was talking directly to that person. We sailed in the fall, and except for the constant flowers, and the candy and fruit and the magazines, and books at the steamer and a letter now and then, I did not see him for a year. Meanwhile, my father had died. I had had the most wonderful letters from Mike, and had got in 110 used to Paul. Paul was the man I was never to notice, but who took care of me. Once, coming from Boston on the train, I had no money for my ticket. The conductor was rude. I must have dropped my purse running to catch the train. I did not know what to do. A five dollar bill was thrust into my hand with, boiler. Madame cell. It was Paul. Paul got a job on a farm near ours, and worked there all the time we were in Wickford. We had had to sell our city house after father died, but were glad to live in the country, and felt nearer to him there. Early the next October, one beautiful warm day, I was in the kitchen making apple jelly. I heard someone come into the back hall and open the kitchen door. I turned and there was Mike. I saw nearly fainted that he had to catch me. He had come over on the steamer with his dear friend, the Duke de Brazzi, who also cared for an American girl, Miss Catherine Elkins. Nothing came of their attachment either. I never met her, and I don't I know if she ever heard of me, but I used to read anything about her in the newspapers with much interest. She married Mr. Underscore William H. I. T. Tilda. She died very recently. The week Mike was at Cedar Spring was a week in a million. The weather was absolutely perfect, and the foliage the most gorgeous I have ever seen it. We used to ride up to Mastaran Hill and look down at Narrow River, a blue ribbon in the brilliant orange and red foliage, with the little white South Ferry Church in the distance, and then the Atlantic. Mike couldn't get over the colors. He was much changed now, and looked very sad when I could catch a glimpse of his face in repose which it seldom was. The Xarovich was worse, and had been found to be a haemophiliac, so there was no chance for Mike to relinquish his succession to the throne. I knew he had come to say goodbye. We spent that week principally picking apples, and carrying the basket swinging between us to the root cellar for storage. We laughed and talked, and he told me many stories of himself and the Russians. To this day they keep coming back to me. One of the stories Mike told me was, why the devil never became omnipotent ages and ages ago, when the earth was ruled by a wise and holy man. The devil became impatient 112, and wanted more power. He came to the Holy One and said, you know, I am more powerful than you are. All the people on earth, are wicked and want to be so. Why not give in? and proclaim me supreme ruler of all question mark 11 the holy one said what you say is true but wait a little 
Perhaps someone will repent, and be good Dotty off went the devil. In a few months he came back. I know how bad everyone is, and Aurelium discouraged, quote said the Holy One. When the leaves are off the trees, you shall be ruler point one one the next time. The devil came in the middle of the winter. Now stop all this foolishness, he said. Everything is dead all the leaves are off the trees. You have no power, and I demand my rights. Look at the oak tree. It said the Holy One. Dot oak leaves remain on the tree until they are pushed off by the little new leaves in the spring. If the oak leaves ever all fall off, then the devil will be supreme. My love to learn the foolish toast we all said in those days, such as, a Frenchman loves his native wine, a German loves his beer, the Englishman loves his half and half, because it gives good cheer. 113 The Irishman loves his whiskey straight, because it gives him dizziness. The American has no choice at all he drinks the whole damn business. Mike added Russian to it, like this. The Frenchman loves his, his native wine. A German loves his beer. The Englishman loves his half and half, because it gives good cheer. And vodka is to all good Russians a comfort each day in the year. The Irishman loves his whiskey straight because it give him dizziness. The American has no choice at all, he drinks the whole damn business. He also liked another one. Man is somewhat like a sausage, very smooth upon the skin, but you can never tell exactly how much hog there is within. And this. I have met many, liked a few, loved but one hears to you. And there was one that he criticized. Were not my first love I loved before we met, and the memory of that ardent love, is lingering with me yet. You are my last love the dearest, sweetest, best. My heart has shed its outer leaves I give you all the rest. Like the core of the apple, Mike said. That is foolish no one can really love, but once point one one in this day of suspicion, and uncertainty 114, as to what the Russians mean to do, I wish Mike were here to tell and talk. I know from him, that they are fearless, and brave and will do what they think, is right even if it kills them. They will stop at nothing to get what they want, but if treated with fairness will give in, if convinced that what they want, is impossible to attain. I also know from him that some of them are tender and gentle. The night before he left, mother had tactfully gone to bed early, and he and I sat in front of the smoking room fire. Little Nita, he said. I am five feet ten and weighed one hundred and thirty. Little Nita, marry the good Franken soon. And have lots of babies to play with. It is best so. Dot. Dot I have had my week of heaven. One should not ask for more. He stood up and put his hands each side of my head. I closed my eyes. I could not look at him. He said the sweet poem of Hein, that I have always loved. Du bis why ein bloom, so hold un shun und rein it shandchen, und well much leak ten you are in hers in ein mirist, aus obich die eene anfs hoft der legion salt betend, das got dich a hold, so rein un shun und hold. Heinrich Hein 115 then he said a few words in Russian, that I did not understand, walked away and looked into the fire. He did not turn again but said shakily, please go, darling, and don't see me off in the morning. I can't stand it. Paul is taking me to the station. If you need anything, ask him. And don't ever forget you have given me the only happiness I have ever known, and until I die I will love you. I stumbled out of the room, and cried myself to sleep. I never saw him again, or had a word from him but he sent me beautiful things from time to time. It was long after Mike had left that Paul gave me the five dollars on the Boston train. I used to try and see Paul, but he would never talk and would run away if he saw me coming. The Boltons, at whose place he lived and worked, were crazy about him. In fact, he was such Dr. def that nearly all the farmers in town tried to hire him away. About two years later, the week before I married Frank, Mrs. Bolton fell downstairs. She weighed 300 pounds, and the Bolton house was very 116 old, with narrow stairs going down to a tiny entry, and the front door opened in. 
Mrs. Bolton got wedged and could not move. Paul, the only person around at the time, heard her screams. He nearly burst a blood vessel trying to get her up, but he couldn't. He ran to the band for Mr. Bolton and some other men to help, but nothing did any good. They finally had to chop a big hole in the front wall of the house and get a small derrick to get her out. She was pitifully bruised, but no bones broken. As soon as I heard of the accident, I went over with some wine jelly and a shawl. Paul was quite a hero. It was he who had thought of chopping down the front of the house, and he told us about the accident with a solemn face, although he must have known how funny it was. It was the longest speech I had ever heard him make. He spoke good English, but with an accent, not as perfectly as Mike. But some tone of his voice made my heart beat and recalled memories. I told him I was being married. He bowed politely. I asked him to my wedding, and his face lighted with pleasure. I asked his name, so that I 117 could send him an invitation. He hesitated a minute, then said, Paul Mann. He came to the wedding. Saw him standing outside in the rear talking to Pete and many other farmer friends but at nearly the end of the receiving line there he was. He wished us happiness and said he would drink our health as I asked him to. Then he handed my husband a small box. For your wife, with the good wishes of an old friend, he said. I asked Paul if he had had news of his highness. Yes, good news, Paul said. He is a farmer too, in the west of Russia. Point one one. There was no card with the gifty. It was a beautiful circle of diamonds, with a diamond and platinum chain. Paul's vigil was over with my wedding. I never saw him again. The Boltons were crushed at his leaving. Before Anita was born I came in one day, to find a big box in the front hall. In it was a chinchilla coat. It was more than big enough for me, and reached the ground. I wore it sitting on the porch waiting for Anita. It was so light in 118 weight yet wonderfully warm and soft. What a kind thought it was. But a few friends who saw it were so curious, as to where it came from, that it made me self-conscious and I put it in storage. The following year I wore it to a fashionable wedding in New York, and was mistaken for Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, who had a coat much like mine. I realized then, that it was too rich for my blood, and that I'd better not wear it any more. It went back to storage and stayed for years. I finally sold it to finance a trip to a nerve specialist in New York for my husband. More of this trip, and the remarkable cure, later. I also bought lovely warm rabbit fur coats for my little girls, a Ford Beach wagon, and a host of useful and needed things. Mike wouldn't have objected he wanted only to help. Several years afterward Comer I heard very indirectly, that he had married. I do hope that he was happy. Later I learned that he had died on his farm in Russia. 119 Chapter 18 Gladys Blessed are the pure in heart. The week that Mike was in Wickford was also an eventful week for my sister, Gladys, who was visiting a school friend in Buffalo. They went to a ball at the Albrights, and there she met her future husband and my dear brother-in-law. He Felix Friedheim, was on his way home to Germany, after visiting some of his family's sugar plantations in Java. This was his fourth trip around the world in as many years. And he was bored and tired. He had been traveling by chance with the great bandmaster, John Philip Sousa, and his family. Sousa was making a world tour, and the young, attractive cosmopolitan was a pleasant addition to the party. Buffalo seemed tame after the excitement of the concerts and the fervor that always greeted Sousa wherever he went. I don't know where Felix met Mr. Albright, but he had been invited to the Buffalo home and there he was. He tried to get out of going to the 120 ball but Mr. Albright said, Come on you may meet your fate. T.T. Gladys had done nothing since father's death, and mother and I made her go to Buffalo and take some of her pretty French clothes. She was just 18, and it made us sick to have her so sad. Felix and Mr. Albright were at the ball, when Gladys and her friends came in. 
Felix said he realized at once that there was something of interest in Buffalo. Gladys was petite, with the lovely round slenderness of youth, fresh and sweet, with rose and cream skin and big dark blue eyes. That night she wore a worth gown of white tulle with white blue ribbons draped around the skirt and caught with bunches of pink roses. It was her coming out dress, and to this day I think it one of the prettiest dresses I ever saw. She loved to dance, and danced beautifully. So did Felix. He tells me today that before the tilde ball was over she had danced into his heart, and is still there. Mother was simply wild at this turn of events. She literally cursed all foreigners and said that Gladys could never see Felix again. 121 Gladys tried to explain that his mother was English, that he had been educated at English schools and universities. And he, in a pitiful letter to mother, promised that if Gladys married him, she could come to the United States for a long visit every year, and that he would invite all of us to come to Europe every year too. Little did an eye of us foresee the two terrible world wars which have kept us apart for years at a time. Mother did everything she could think of to keep them apart and to interest Gladys in someone else. But the winter after my marriage I knew it was hopeless. For I found that Gladys had been taking German lessons on the sly. She already spoke German, but wanted to perfect it. In the spring Gladys received a letter saying that Felix was coming to this country again. And as luck would have it an invitation came in the same mail from Colonel Robert Thompson to go to Sweden on the SS Finland with the United States Olympic team for the games being held in Sweden that year. Poor mother figured out that if Gladys did not tell Felix she was going to Sweden, she 122 and Felix would cross the Atlantic at the same time in opposite directions. But, of course, Gladys told him and he met her at the dock in Ireland when the SS Finland stopped there. Colonel Thompson politely included Felix in the party at Gladys' I request. Gladys says she had not finally decided to marry Felix until he became such a hero to all on board. A sailor, painting the outside of the Finland, while she was steaming into Stockholm Harbor, lost his balance and fell overboard. Hundreds of people, including all the American athletes, were sunning themselves on deck. The cry of man overboard, went up. Without waiting a second Felix grabbed the rope holding the painting platform, let himself down, then gave a kick, to clear the ship and jumped into the water. He saved the sailor, who could not swim, but burned his hands terribly with the rope as he went down the ship's side. He had to have his hands bandaged and tied across his chest. He was helpless. Gladys helped to feed him, and he was made much of. The Swedish government gave him a medal, presented by the king, and Colonel Thompson and the other passengers gave him a beautiful silver 123 box inscribed with all their names. Although an effort was made, our government could not give him a medal. He was a German on a Swedish ship, and had saved a Finnish sailor. But he won a wife. Gladys said that when she saw him in the ocean, and thought he was gone for good, she knew she cared for him. They were married the next summer. The wedding was to have been at Twickford, but Felix's mother was taken suddenly, incurably ill and wanted to see her oldest son married. So we all went to Germany. Tina was six weeks old, and Nita just over two years. We were nine on our side of the wedding party. Mother, Gladys, David, his wife Dorothy, Ruth, Frank, Dot Nita, baby Tina, and I. We had a strangely mild crossing. I usually attract bad weather on the ocean. Felix met us in Bremen with the news that his mother was very ill, and when we reached Berlin we were met with the news that she had died. What were we to do? Morning in Germany in those days was so prescribed. We all had to get black clothes, and the funeral was stupendous. Madame Friedheim had a beautiful palace in Berlin, with immense high-studded rooms. Every inch of those 124 walls was draped in black. I did not know there was so much black cloth in the world. The minister who gave the funeral oration spoke of each one of us by name, and I, who had never seen Madame Friedheim, was so overcome with his eloquent description of my grief and my loss, 
that I sobbed out loud. Frank, who did not understand German, and didn't want to, had quite a good time. The collation was superb, he said. But he didn't like it later on, when he had to march after the catafalk about seven miles on cobblestones to the cemetery and stand in the rain, while another minister made another oration of about an hour. Only men walked in the funeral procession. The women all stayed at home. We postponed the wedding for two weeks out of respect to Madame Friedheim, but truly really had to have it then, or go home as mother suggested and wait until another time. Neither Gladys nor Felix would wait. So we all went to Felix's brother's place about two hours east of Berlin the most beautiful gut I have ever seen, containing about 6,000 acres of cultivated land and 5,000 acres of lakes 125 and forests, thoroughbred horses and cattle of every description, and a castle to live in. Never, before or since, have I lived in such sumptuousness. The wedding took place in the lovely little old chapel on the grounds. It was a beautiful summer day. The fortune of us in the wedding party, with the bride and groom in the lead, walked to the chapel through the gardens under the ages old trees, up the moss-grown path. Everything was fine, except that the minister spoke for about an hour, and eulogized Felix for so long, that Gladys nearly fainted from fatigue. We had a wedding banquet with eleven kinds of wine, and all the footmen in maroon and gold livery. Gladys and Felix left by motor for their honeymoon. She had to wear a long black crepe veil, or be considered disrespectful to her mother-in-law. Her happy smiling little face was so incongruous. Felix's old nurse cried and said her wearing black was a bad omen. 126 Chapter 19 Gladys and Lucky What is Soiled? Make thou pure. What is wounded? Work its cure. Sister is manual when Gladys came home after World War I, our great friend Livingston Beekman, then governor of Rhode Island, said to her, Gladys. It must be hard to be here now as a German. Dot not one tenth as hard as living all through the war in Germany as an American, said Gladys. Poor child she has now lived through another world war as an American in Germany. We have not seen her yet, but have heard through American officers and lately from her son, a colonel in the United States Army, that she is alive and well and was not too badly treated. She was not put into a concentration camp although the Gestapo visited her frequently, and was able to live very quietly in Austria on the beautiful St. Wolfgang see in a small house with an old German lady. She rented her own house to the King of the Belgians 127, and found him a fine tenant and a delightful person. Gladys and Felix's son, Licky, came to live with us, when the Nazis came into power in Germany. He graduated from Brown University, and then spent a year at Harvard Law School, from where he was drafted into the army. He had already taken out his first citizenship papers. After a course at the Foreign Service School in Washington, he was shipped to England, and was one of the first to land in Normandy. As a private, he fought all through France and into Germany, where he was given a field commission and five battle stars. His good knowledge of French and German made him useful in the military government of those countries, and he worked first for the displaced persons, then with the legal branch of the military government in Bavaria. He is now a counselor for the chief in Bavaria, with the rank of colonel. As he has lived more than half his life in Europe, and knows the people and the country over dot there so well, it would indeed be a smart Nazi who could deceive him. 128 Chapter 20 The Sisters Lord, I am thine. Make me holy, truly thine. Associate Simanuel it was after Mike left, that I became, and still am so intimate with, and interested in the Episcopal Sisters of the Holy Nativity. The con apostrophe. Vent was founded in Providence. It has since moved to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, but a mission house and sisters are still here. My mother and I became associates, and no words can tell the help and comfort those dear women were to us. I spent a great deal of time at the convent, and seriously considered trying the religious life. The husband-to-be thought otherwise, and used to come to the convent for me, and ask the sister portress, 
to tell me to come and take a walk. With one accord the sisters seemed to think I should marry and not become a religious. They were all happy themselves, but seemed to know that the life was not for me. The intimacy has always lasted. They are my dear and own sisters and I pray for them and work for them and always will. 129 Chapter 21 George Cranston's store George's store was a big band-like building at the crossroads which used to be called Cranston's Corner, but now for some reason is consolation. The store was torn down after George died. A four-lane cement road goes past, and a red and green stoplight blinks, where George's friendly windows used to glow. They were especially cozy winter evenings, and around Christmas I doubt if George closed the store at all. He would keep open, as long as anyone came to buy. No clock watching, although there was a lovely grandfather's clock against the wall to the right of the front door. George's office was one corner of the big room walled off, and the clock was on that wall. Carty cornered, and to the left of the front door was a long low wooden bench seemingly made for little children. I have sat there many many hours, while my mother shopped, and talked to Georgia and the other friends, and there were always other children there to all sucking candy or peppermint sticks, and sleepily watching the ship on the top of the clock's face rocking gently to and fro. In the mid 130 lee of the room, was a high pot-bellied stove with a stove pipe held by wires to the ceiling, and which ran way across the room, and made a right angle turn into the chimney. My father, George, and other tall men had to duck the stove pipe, Around the sides of the room, and in the middle were endless tables, all piled high with articles of literally every kind, and description beautiful English leather saddles and bridles and harnesses and whips of all sorts hung on one wall, colored lithographs of Niagara Falls, the capital at Washington, Sir Walter Scott with his dogs, mourning pieces, a large tombstone, and a weeping willow, and a woman at a child's grave, etc. on another, the third wall had shelf after shelf of preserves jellies, vegetables, pickles, etc. I don't seem to remember cans. Strips of bacon and hams hung on hooks, a long white marble meat cutting table ran from the other wall of George's office to near the back door. On the other side of the back door was a trap door, and a ladder went down into the cellar. The ladder was only used in very bad weather. The usual entrance was a fine wide outside stone cellar steps which H double doors always open. George's son, half George's size and called 131 Demi John, lived in the cellar, endlessly emptying things from large barrels into smaller barrels, pails, casks, bottles, etc. He never seemed to come out of the cellar, and smelled most intriguingly of cider, kerosene, vinegar, Salt brine, grape wine, paints, turpentine, sweat, and shaving soap, etc. His hands were dead white from the acids, and he had a thin ring of soap acids, and whiskers around his face up to his ears, and down on his neck. His wife made him shave every Saturday, but omitted to see if he washed properly afterwards. Sometimes the ring was wider than others, but usually there was at least a trace. We always looked carefully to see. Dummy John was not considered quite a weather prophet. He used to look out at the square piece of sky framed by his cellar doors and guess at the weather. He was apt to guess right, and had quite a reputation. He was only outclassed by Weaver Rose. Weaver Rose predicted the blizzard of 84. That put him in a class by himself. Dummy John did predict the fire at the sand hole, or at least he said that morning that he felt in his bones something awful was going to happen. It wasn't much of a fire. Most of the firemen were at the sand hole anyway, when it started from a lighted pipe in 132 do we hopper's back pocket. Do we had been helping Demi John with some paint, and his overalls were ripe to catch fire. It really sobered do we for quite a while. He never knew anything about the comma fire. He was happily unconscious while he was rolled out and his clothes pulled off, and the sofa he had been asleep on thrown out, and the burning curtains pulled down and thrown outdoors too. S.L. Horsford's burned hands, 
and the blister on Dewey is back with the only casualties. Dewey helped George, and was a sort of runner. When a customer had been waiting four or five hours and seemed to be getting restless, Dewey would tell George to hurry things up. He also was supposed to be polite to any visiting clergy when they came for their handout. George gave orders they were to have food given them, and trusted to Dewey till he found that Dewey thought it funny to say to the parson. Got a bag. The poor parson always had brought a bag with probably his clean scissor one comma one air and a clean pocket handkerchief. Open it up like beans. Do we would take a big scoop of beans and put it in the bag. Like rice. Another scoop for. Like tea, the parson never said a word except thank you, but how mad his wife or housekeeper. 133 must have been at having to sort out all those grains. Sometimes he put in raisins or dried fruit, which made more of a mess, but always the person went home with his bag full of food and gratitude to George. All the clergy gave George their undertaking work. Do we tried to help George with that too. When George found out how mean do we had been about the food, he decided to pay him back. They happened to have three stiffs in the undertaking parlor at that time, all of them all fixed up. They had one empty coffin waiting hopefully for the next death in town. After they had finished, George said to Dewey, I'm going down to the barber, shop you shut up shop here, but come in again before you go home, and see if you think Mr. Hunter here needs more ice. Dewey didn't like to go into that room alone, but was afraid not to on account of George. While Dewey was shutting up, George moved one of the bodies, and put the empty coffin where it had been, and climbed into the coffin himself. After about an hour he heard Dewey coming. Dewey opened the door and peered fearfully in, holding his kerosene lamp up over his head. George raised up in Peter Lawton's coffin and said, You white-livered cockroach, you! You would cheat the clergy, 134 would you? I'll haunt you to the end of your days. Do we gave a terrible howl, and ran two miles to the sand hole, still holding the lamp, which fortunately had blown out. Do we was never quite the same. After that he was always furtive, and I think he never worked again. He was in much of a loss, and George got Willie Piper to help him. Willie Piper really had style and Dot used to drive the hearse so well that George and Mrs. Granston used to go for nice drives in the back. Willie would jump down and open the door and bow George and Mrs. Cranston out just as Mother tried to make Ben, a coachman, do. After they made a call Willie would drive the hearse up to the door, open the back, straighten the two folding chairs inside, and help Mr. and Mrs. Cranston in, and off they would go. 135 Chapter 22 Peps The world is so full of a number of things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Robert Louis Stevenson animals have played such a part in my own life, and in the lives of my children, that they deserve a special place in this chronicle. When my brother and I were quite young we had three goats, and under the coaching of our father we built a band for them. On the ground floor were three stalls, and an open place for tools, feed etc., and upstairs it had a loft, or lettuce, as it was then called, for storing hay. The loft was big enough for us to get into, and we used to climb up to it by a ladder and pitch hay down for the goats. The original three were a billy goat, Pluto, and two nannies, Sylvia, and Cynthia. Later they had some very engaging kids. We loved the nannies and the kids but hated Pluto, who grew ornerier every year. Mother made fancy single and double harnesses for them of blue and white striped bed king, and we would hitch them up to one or the other of our two carts. The harnesses with the 136 breastplate type collars were injurious to the goat's sensitive necks with hames and reins of leather. How we worked over those goats. We drove Pluto single and Sylvia and Cynthia double, and did quite a little work with them. Pete used them for carting grass cuttings or apples from the orc hard, or vegetables for the house from the garden. Sometimes V tried a spike team with Pluto harnessed in front, but he was always rude, and would turn around and look at the nannies, and be generally cussed. 
Even Pete's magic hand can't make Pluto behave. When the kids were young they would scamper alongside the cart, one on each side of its mother. It was a pretty sight. I have a snapshot of me driving the cart with my Mac whore on my shoulder and the kids running alongside. I also had a Cade lamb who followed me everywhere, and would come into the house in the morning, run up to my room, and lick my face to wake me up. Lamy Lamy grew enormously big the biggest you I ever saw, and had wind lambs every year for 14 years. We made a harness for her, thinking to 137 hitch her up with Pluto, but she was too smart for us, and would just sit down. We tried many times but she just sat. She was so fat and her wool so thick, and long that trying, to move her was like pushing a big soft boulder, with the same result. She loved to be H-U-G-G for, and would snuggle her smooth face into my neck, while I hugged her as hard as I could. It was such a comforting thing to do. I was very particular, how she looked and spent hours washing and combing her wool. Once a year she was shorn. Pete did it, but I helped. She dot never moved, although if I nicked her, she would jump, but then lie still, when I apologized and said I would be more careful. Pete, of course, would never cut any animal. I always took her wool to the mill to sell, and got a very good price, for it was so clean, and of such good quality. She died at 17 years of age, while we were in Europe one winter. Pete said it was pneumonia. We finally got rid of the goats. Being unable to stand Pluto's actions any longer, we sold them to some kind people who still have their descendants. Then we had two beautiful Shetland ponies, Dinah and Trixie. They were thoroughbreds and looked 138 like miniature race horses with long manes and tails. They were very frisky, and for a long time Pete had to help us harness them, for they kicked and reared and bit. But once harnessed, and with Dildarus in the cart they would give us a fine drive, never walking you couldn't make to him just running or trotting all the way. When they came in they would always be so overheated, that they had to be walked for hours to cool off. We used to bribe Pete to do this, for it got monotonous after the first hour. The Macor, Paolo, red and blue and yellow, with a long tail, was brought from South America by my mother's uncle Charles on on dotty of his trips home from the Orient. Paolo loved him, and when he died, was passed on to my mother's stepmother, who kept him until her death. Then, as I was the only one Iving person he liked, he was given to me. I could do anything with him, and when we were together he would chuckle, and make pleasant little sounds. When I rode my bicycle, he would ride on my shoulder. Sometimes he would talk a steady stream, and sing songs for hours, then again he would be silent for days. He could imitate anyone's voice and would 139 call comma tilde 90. Like mother or father, and when I answered he would guffaw with laughter. When he wanted a bath he would say, bath Polly, bath pretty Polly, until I did. I bathed him in the bathtub in about two inches of tepid water, and he loved it. He could fly anywhere, but liked mostly to fly over the house. He would take off on one side, fly over the roof and land on the other side, then do it all over again. He lived more than a hundred years in our family, and died from not eating when I went away to boarding school. I like to think that he was probably ready to die anyway. Pete knew how terribly I would feel at Paolo's death, so he persuaded mother to have him stuffed. It is the only time I ever knew Pete to guess wrong where an animal was concerned. After Paolo was stuffed, he looked so lifelike, and natural that neither mother nor Pete dared to show him to me, or tell me what had been done. Mother felt she had made a mistake, and did not know what to do with him, so she told Pete to hang him up. He was mounted on a ring, in the lamp closet until she could decide, and then she forgot he was there. The lamp closet is a small, 140 dark room where we kept kerosene, extra lamps, oil, glue etc. It is at the foot of the back stairs, and a window on the stairs, lights it up when the door is open. 
For a few days after I came home on my vacation from boarding school I needed some oil for my bicycle, and went to the closet. There hung my precious pet, a shaft of sunshine lighting his beautiful feathers. For the first time in my life I fainted dead away. When I came to, Paolo had gone. Pete had buried him, ring and all. The taxidermist was very angry, when he heard what had happened. He had wanted to borrow Paolo as part of his exhibition at the Kingston Fair, and said Paolo had been his stuffing masterpiece. My children had three memorable pets Tommy, a raccoon comrade mouse, a Dachshund, and P.T., a capuchin monkey. The raccoon was the nicest of the pets. We acquired him one day in Valdosta, Georgia, while stopping at a gasoline station on a motor trip. We happened to notice a little dark Ewok 141 in down the street. Every now and then he would stop, turn around, and call, Come, Tommy, come. A little ball of fluff seemed to be following him. We investigated and discovered an adorable little raccoon, that seemed to know its name, and followed its master when called. We bought him, and kept him with us all the time we remained in the south. He was absolutely clean and housebroken, and washed all his food comorel l k cereal, or mashed potato would dry the water. He wouldn't touch the food then, but would look up pitifully until clean water, and a carrot or some other solid tidbit had been given him. This he would wash most thoroughly, turning it over and over, inspecting it minutely, and picking off invisible pieces of dirt and chaff. He and the Dachshund, Rat Mouse, slept together all rolled up in a ball. Sometimes P.T., the monkey, slept with them, but he was too capricious and occasionally for no reason at all would pinch Rat Mouse, waking him up. Then the raccoon would wake up, and there would be a wild commotion. P.T. was a capuchin monkey about 14 inches tall, with a long tail and a cute little black cap. He was given to me to buy a friend, John Richmond, who had bought him at Panama. After eating 142 he would always run his, so human hands over the white collar and vest of his fur to see, if he had spilled anything. He kept himself immaculate. Petey nearly lost his life several years later, when our house at Whale Rock Point burned to the ground. Besides Rat Mouse we had many dogs, and of almost every known breed. My first dog was a tiny real pug dog grey fawn color with a black nose and tongue. My father brought him home, a tiny puppy, in the pocket of his overcoat. His name was Larla Palace, and he was with us constantly for ten years. He was very intelligent, and we taught him to play hide and seek. We would sit him on a chair with his back towards us, and tell him to stay till we called, then we would hide. He would look for us, and find us all in remarkably quick time. It was much more fun to have him always it than to take turns ourselves. Later I had a French poodle, pole plank and very stupid, who slept all day, and bucked all night. He didn't last long. Buck, an Airedale who lived to be 18 years old, was next. Gladys had cocker spaniels, 143 first black then brown ones. Mother had a beautiful pekinis, with very prominent eyes. A neighbor's dog bit one of Ginger's eyes out, so he wore a glass eye for about two years. Pete used to take it out, and clean it, and put it back. Mother's last dog, who lived 19 years, was a tiny Pomeranian named Folly. She weighed dot dot less than three pounds and Mother carried her under her arm everywhere. In winter, Folly was put in Mother's brown sable muff, and went to concerts, the theater, and even Chura. She never made a sound, and unless one knew she was there she was invisible. Her little head was just the size and color of the sable heads on the muff. Occasionally she would yawn, or put out her little red tongue, and anyone sitting near mother, would look incredulously at the muff and hardly believe his eyes. Mother gave Buddy a rough-haired Irish terrier when Buddy was three. Buddy loved him immensely, and named him Christmas present from Grandmother Baker. He was called Christmas for short. At the same time the little girls had Dr. Day, a Boston bull, and MC, a mongrel shepherd who just drifted in. 
one fall just before we came to Providence 144 from Narragansett, a beautiful female Aradale came to us. We tried to find who owned her, she was evidently well-bred but couldn't. Ed Batten, our caretaker, said he would like to keep her, so she stayed in Narragansett. He named her Mabel. One bitter cold night she had fourteen puppies. Poor Ed tried to keep her warm, and take care of the puppies, but she died on the evening of the second day afterward. He waited till morning. Then, as the ground was frozen, he took her body, and put it in the compost heap, and covered her over with leaves and manure. He had a terrible time feeding all those puppies. Using a few milk bottles and nipples, he would no sooner finish than he would have to begin again. He gave them one air feeding in the middle of the night. On the third night, about 2 a.m., when he was finishing with the last puppy, he heard a scratching at the door. He opened it and in walked. Mabel. He thought she was a ghost and screamed. She weakly licked his hand, and went and lay down with the puppies. He fed her warm milk, and in a day or two she was well. But Alarsis. She had no milk, and to see her sit and watch poor Ed feed her puppies was a caution. Pete came down from 145 Cedar Spring, to consult and help Ed, and took some of the puppies home. They all grew up mongrels. Mabel lived for years, but had no more puppies. Mother loved birds, and knew a lot about them. She raised canaries, but we had to stop, they were so prolific. One year we had about 100. Dot. Dot we had to stop raising pigeons too. They outgrew the loft, and we could not bear to eat them, they were so tame. At one time or another we raised about everything a farmer affords. We had a pair of wild geese for years at Cedar Spring. One may Pete found a wild goose with a broken wing. He set it and she seemed all right, but did not fly away. That fall, as the geese flew over going south, she called her mate. He came and stayed with her and never left. They raised many goslings, all of whom would join the flock of geese going south each fall, and we would never see them again. The parent birds took it very philosophically, and didn't seem to mind. We once raised a turcon, which mother insisted was half turkey and half hen. It was a queer-looking bird, and people came from miles 146 around to see it. It didn't breed and died when about half five years old. The birthday of Tom West, one of Frank's best friends, came the day before our daughter Tynals, and it was his custom to send her all the birthday jokes he received. She loved them, and for many years she had gay, merry birthdays. One year Tom's friend sent animals to him, which he, of course, passed on to Tina. We had the most awful time with waltzing mice, a rooster, rabbits, a kitten, goldfish, guinea pigs, and a small sick-looking snake in our cellar, until we could get rid of them. The mice got into the doll's house, and we are still looking for them. We have never found the snake either. Speaking of snakes reminds me of the sick boa constrictor I saw at the Angel Memorial Animal Hospital in Boston. I had taken Paolo there for a bad cough, and the doctor asked me, if I would like to see the giant snake which had an obscure and undiagnosable complaint. The snake certainly looked sick. He was grey and listless, and lay uncurled in his den. The doctor politely asked me, if I had any idea, what 147 could be the matter. I had no idea. A week later, when I went for cured Paolo, I asked for the snake. He was well too. He had regurgitated a red table cloth. 148 Chapter 23 Abby and Lucy Reynolds Abby and Lucy were sisters, and spinsters and the last of a distinguished family. They had one brother who was a great trial to them. He bent his elbow, as we say in Wickford, frequently, and he died quite young. As soon as he was gone, he became the dot our beloved little brother and my father had difficulty in remembering the respect he had to show Joe's memory. He had spent many a Saturday night driving from one dive to another to get Joe for the girls. Joe was a small man and my father very big and strong, and after Abby and Lucy had come tearfully, 
and begged him to go and get Joe. He would start off in the buggy and drive out till he found him. Joe never put up any fight, but let Maya Faithy pick him up like a baby and drive him home. The girls were always grateful and would give my father lovely presents to thank him, but nothing made up to my mother, and she really only lost her temper when my father went on one of these rescuing trips. She was afraid my father would be hurt, and she and Abby and Lucy did not become 149 friends idle after Io died. Then they became very intimate, and Abby and Lucy were always at our house. They sewed beautifully, and carried gold thimbles always, in the pockets of their dresses. They dressed just alike, but each wore a different color. Abby had red hair and blue eyes, so she wore blue or black. Lucy had dark brown hair and ice, so she wore green or brown. The boys in town named them black and tan. They wore lots of petticoats with a rough fled white Swiss embroidered one over the lot. They wore their skirts to the ground and tight-fitting bodices. Each held up her skirt in exactly the same manner as her sister, and showed a small triangular bit of immaculate white starched petticoat. They wore small high-buttoned black shoes, and were dainty, and feminine and adorable. How we children loved the days they spent with us. They sewed and mended and talked with my mother of this and that, but always gently and kindly. They were very religious and I think it was their influence that made my mother become an Episcopalian. She had been brought up a Unitarian. When we were christened Abby was godmother to 150 David and Lucy to my sister Gladys. Because David and Gladys belonged to them, they went very often to their great white farmhouse for the day. Such stories of eating all the cookies they wanted, of playing hide and seek in the attic, and finally being walked home in the dust by Winnie, the loyal maid who had been there for five years. In spite of Winnie's L-O-Y-A-L tilde Y and honesty, Abby and Lucy were very suspicious. For instance, before they went out they would fix a letter on a table with one corner under the table mat. Or they would take a pencil and mark slightly on a card on the card tray in the entry. If these things had been so much as breathed on they could tell. Why it made any difference we never knew, but they would nod their heads in unison and say to mother, yes. She picked up Peggy Hidden's letter. We had the place marked, so we know. Mother would soothe them and tell of some of the really awful things our help did. We always spoke of and worried about what would happen if one sister died. They were so united, always said we think. We did, we have a cold, one ever separated and lived for each other. One lovely spring day Winnie telephoned 151 and said the ladies had a cold and the doctor thought Miss Abby was far from well, and could I come? When I got there, each sister was sick in her adjoining room and Lucy was miserable enough not to know how very ill dear Abby was. She died that night. Lucy was quite calm, said she would be with her soon, said little prayer, and asked me to telephone the undertaker. She did not want the local undertaker as there had been some unpleasantness at Joe's funeral. The sisters did not think Joe looked his best. When the undertaker from Providence came, Lucy sat up in bed and told him why she dot would not have the local undertaker and that Abby was to have every attention. The funeral was delayed three days to give Lucy time to get better and also Lucy hoped a beloved cousin, Peggy Hidden, could get there. She was ill and couldn't. Finally, all was ready. Lucy dressed but very white and IG came downstairs. The coffin was to be opened, so she could see Abby, and it was to stay open during the house ceremony. The undertaker took off the top of the casket. Lucy 152 gave one look, and gave a little scream. Why, that is not Abby. Who is that woman? Question mark one. Abby was over 80, but her red hair had never become white. The poor undertaker had curled it in a most fashionable manner, and had given Abby some long, curling, black eyelashes and quite a lot of rouge and very pink lips. He had put a tight collar on, so her neck did not show, and, really, she could have been any age, and she looked lovely. We did have a time. The eyelashes would not come off, 
The undertaker tried. It was very unfortunate. Some of the rouge was washed off and Lucy had to be content with that as the minister had come, and the mourners were coming in the door. The coffin was closed. Dear Abby, she had spoken of, and bemoaned her very light eyelashes many times. Perhaps she was glad to have the dark ones. Lucy traveled quite a little after Abby died and seemed contented. She became very intimate with her cousin, Peggy, who was always a gay, delightful companion. Lucy was well out till she was Abby's age, and then died after a few days' illness. 153 Chapter 24 The Shiar Mans We may find means to cure a fool of his folly, but there are none to set straight a cross-grained spirit. Underscore La Rochefau called years ago, Jesse and Sarah Sherman lived in the lighthouse, two miles offshore, with their father and mother. The father, Peter, kept the lighthouse, and was in essence addict. He drank vanilla and lemon extract, and used to be drunk for weeks at a time. The family and everyone else in town was afraid the federal authorities dot would find out, and that he would lose his job. Jesse and Sarah were experts from the time they were eight and ten years old, and took splendid care of the lighthouse lamps. Mrs. Sherman was so fat she just sat. When Sarah was about eighteen she had a beau, Nat Perry, a high-spirited fisherman with his own boat. Nat wanted to marry Sarah and take her ashore to live. She wanted to marry, but insisted that Nat leave in the lighthouse, for she would not leave Jesse to run the light alone. Her father was a 154 doddering a fool who only knew enough to sign the government checks which came twice a month, and were their only support. Nat would bring Sarah ashore for shopping and supplies, and they would fight and argue all over town, and ask everyone's advice as to what to do. The town was as divided as they would Nat certainly didn't want to support all the Shermans, as he would have to do if they gave up the lighthouse and Jessie couldn't take care of it alone, or said she couldn't. Finally another girl, May Taylor, began to make up to Nat, and told him he was a fool, to wait any longer for Sarah, because she would never marry HFD.M. One lovely June night Nat went in his boat to the lighthouse and told Sarah, that if she did not come with him, that very night, and be married, she would never see him again. Sarah, of course did not believe him, but he meant, and married May that night. It would have been hard enough on Sarah anyway, but what he did afterward nearly killed her. The next day he repented and went to the lighthouse and told Sarah, that he was married, but that he hated 155 May, and the fault was all Sarah's. May all this time sat bobbing about in Nat's boat, tied by rope to the lighthouse, she had brought the license with her in case Sarah did not believe Nat was married. After Nat left in the boat with May, Sarah fainted and was unconscious for three days. Peter had to sober up and get a doctor, and Mrs. Sherman had to help Jessie tend the light. It was a kerosene light in those days. Just as all this was happening, of course, the government inspector had to come. He saw what a bad way things were in. Peter lost the job and all the Shermans were moved to the mainland and a new keeper installed, while Sarah was still unconscious. They found a place to live, and Sarah stayed in bed forty years. Mrs. Sherman and Jessie took care of her. Mrs. Sherman got very thin. Peter died soon, but the government gave Sarah and Jessie and Mrs. Sherman a small pension. While she was in bed, Sarah did beautiful sewing and used to make all our underclothes and nightgowns. It was always so queer, to have her try to fit the things on us, while she was in bed. 156 One Christmas Eve, after she had been in bed forty years and Mrs. Sherman had been dead some time, their house caught fire from a candle in the window blowing against the lace curtain. Jessie had gone to church and Sarah was alone, she screamed, but no one heard her. She tried to walk but couldn't. So she crawled to the front door, and down the street in the ice, and snow to the next house. The neighbors came, got the fire apparatus, and put out the fire, but Sarah in her nightgown caught pneumonia, and was on the verge of death for several weeks. Everybody in town spent their hard-earned savings 
to pay the doctor for pulling her through. It seems so futile, Sarah died nine months later. Jessie lived alone for some years, and then I helped get her into St. Elizabeth's home in Providence, where she was contented and happy up to the day of her death, just a few months ago. 157 Chapter 25 Photographs I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and, if God use apostrophe I shall but love thee better after death. Elizabeth Barrett Browning mother and I could always laugh over the Crocker's Christmas picture. The Crocker's were very poor relations a big family and no sense. One year when we were little, about a month before Christmas, mother received a forlorn letter from Aunt Betty telling, among other troubles, how Uncle Crocker had no job, and the children apparently none of anything. Mother and father talked late that night and decided they would give up Christmas that year except for some cheap toys for us children, and send all the money to the crockers. And David, mother said eagerly, let's do it right away, so the poor things can have a Christmas, and get things now, when they need them. My parents sent the money right away. The day before Christmas a big flat package came to the house, and we opened it. Inside was a huge, elaborate photograph of all the smiling 158 crockers not one comma copy, but enough for each of us. They had spent all the Christmas money on that panoramic family photograph. My father kept his copy of the picture hanging beside this bureau to the day he died. The card addressed to him was inserted in the corner, and under his name H. Tilda had written, Saka. He said it was one of the best lessons he ever had. They were a very homely family. I often wonder whatever became of those pictures. Another photograph, which made Mother weep gently, was the one taken the day before Father's funeral. We had been in Europe that summer and had had the most wonderful time, and had all bought beautiful clothes. We wore those lovely clothes at Gladys's coming out party. Maya Fathia kept begging us to have our picture taken for him in our worth dresses. But after the coming out ball there were lots of parties and football games, more parties, David home for vacation, more parties, Christmas, more parties, David leaving for school. Dot, dot we couldn't stop long enough to have a picture taken. Then like a ton of bricks father is pneumonia. It could not be fatal, of course. How old be all right? He was only 52 and so big and strong and red-cheeked and gay. Dot. Dot but he wasn't all right. He gasped for breath. We sent for more doctors. First we couldn't speak, then we begged the doctors to do something. Father turned gray and choked. We huddled in the corner of his room, mother on her knees beside his bed holding his hand all night. Toward morning he spoke, hoarsely and haltingly. Nita, darling, I can't make it. It is a stone wall, and I can't get over it, oh, my darling. Mother put her head on his hand, and we didn't look. But after a while a terrible noise crackled in his throat, and one gasping groan. The nurses came and put us out, and said it was over and that father was dead. The doctor gave us all something to make us sleep. When we woke the next day, father was gone to the undertakers, they told us, and mother was white as comma a sheet and my aunt had come from Boston. There was much to be done. And we were very busy. We all had black clothes and big black veils on our black hats. People came and offered to lend us things. Someone I have forgotten who lent me a big black muff, and I lost it. I had left sixteen of it in the undertaker's hack at the funeral, and had a hard time finding it. Every time mother looked at our sis, she cried. We were sights. She cried all the time, as we did. The day before the funeral, there was a lull. We just sat and looked at one another, all funny with swollen eyes, and David in his first wing collar, and a black suit and tie. Mother began to cry more than ever, and Comma sobbed, if we had only had our pictures taken as your father wanted us to. Now we look so terrible, and my Luffy is over point one one let us do it right now. What are you talking of? I mean what I say. We can never wear our beautiful clothes again, and we promised Papa. Someone I think David telephoned the photographer, 
who came within the hour. We got dressed up, sobbing and butting cold water on our eyes, so they wouldn't look swollen, and had the picture taken just as he had wanted us to. And it was a comfort, and made him see nearer, and we a eh, promised that we would always live as he would have wished. 161 It was a secret and a bond, and in the awful days that followed, when we had to give up the house in town and sell almost everything, and mother was so lonely and frightened, that picture which came out perfectly, and everyone looked really better than he or she could was a symbol, that we were united, and could rise to emergencies. Everyone who saw the picture said, how lucky you had it taken, and didn't it wait? Dot. Dot didn't your father love it? Dot. Dot it flatters you or you look really starry eyed. Whale Rock Point 162 Chapter 26 Whale Rock Point Few things are needed to make a wise man happy. Nothing can make a fool content. That is why most men are miserable. La Rocha Fau called after Frank, and I were married we bought Whale Rock Point, a farm belonging to some cousins, right on the Atlantic Ocean near Narragansett Pier, and we spend over six months a year there, from spring through autumn. I wanted to be near mother the place is just 10 miles from Cedar Spring. Frank wanted to be near his mother and father point Anna who go to Saunders town for the summer, just halfway between Cedar Spring and Whale Rock Point. But in order to give Frank a rest and get him away from the TE phone, we usually take a trip for six weeks each summer. One year we went to Europe, take my car. Frank and our nephew Clark Hinkley took turns driving. I who drive incessantly at homage, was not allowed to touch the wheel, and what a vacation it was. 163 We landed at Southampton, and drove directly to London. The grass was so green, and the hedgerows were so lovely, that it seemed like heaven. We stayed at a small but comfortable hotel. Browns, and everyone admired the children and seemed to think such a large family. My nephew was thought my son and we let it go. Frank and I renewed old acquaintances, and the children went sightseeing frantically. At the British Museum they caused quite a stir, by insisting on seeing Cleopatra's mummy. The guide said there was no such mummy, but they stood their ground, and said their mother had seen it, and it was small, and they would stay there until it was produced. Finally, after a very long wait, the curator himself, I wish I knew who he was, came and asked them quite seriously, how long ago their mother had seen it. Tina remembered that I told her of having seen Cleopatra's mummy, when I was there 25 years before. The curator smiled and admitted .The truth about 25 years ago the mummy, of what proved to be a child, or young girl named Cleopatra had been found, and exhibited for only a short time. It had caused too much controversy, and was not a very good mummy anyway, but if they cared to come with him, he would show it to them. They 164 went to the storerooms, and sure enough they saw the mummy whose name was Cleopatra. He asked their names, and told them to tell their mother she had a good memory. There is nothing they did not see. They walked about so indefatigably, and became so well acquainted with London that years later, when Bob and Frankie went to the coronation of King George and Queen Elizabeth on their honeymoon, she knew the city so well that Bob said she was better than a map. Frank and I didn't see a coronation on our honeymoon, but we did arrive in London the day King Edward Vire died. Everyone, including ourselves, had to go into deep mourning, and one of the most ludicrous things I ever saw was the derby run the next week with everyone yelling and screaming and jumping up and down with excitement, and all the women in deep black he many with great veils, and all the men in tall hats with deep black bands. We didn't travel in those days as simply as we did later, with the children. We would be gone two months on our honeymoon and we took two steamer trunks, a big square trunk, a shoe trunk, and five bags. We got so sick of our luggage that we began 165 leaving parts of it behind everywhere, and ended up in Venice with a duffel roll which we could both sit on, and my knitting bag with bathing suits in it. That forsaken luggage kept coming back to us for nearly a year, and the day Nita was born a customs official telephoned, 
that valuable trunk and shoes belonging to us were waiting to be called for and could be recovered on payment of $106 duty. We never called for them. I wish I had those shoes now in these days of shoe scarcity. For three years during the summer we went to that gem of a place, St. Andrews, New Brunswick, where Frank had some delightful cousins. One year we went to the Olympic Games in California, and for many years we went to Cape Cod. We used to take these trips as a family, but now Frank and I go off alone, and we like best to go to the Berkshire Festival and hear the wonderful music of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. It rests Frank more than anything else we do. Our fee most of the year is pretty strenuous. It was after we had moved to Whale Rock that the other two murders at Cedar Spring were come 166 mitted. After beginning this chronicle by saying there were three, I told about only the first one and postponed the other two because they happened so much later and because the third murder involves B.T. Freeman, the champion egg eater and the man who loved and cared for animals. The second murder took place after the First World War, in the early days of Prohibition. Both Whale Rock and Cedar Spring were involved. During that period we were kept on the jump by bootleggers and hijackers. Whale Rock Point, which juts into the ocean, was a natural, the bootleggers said. They would run their high-powered speedboats progenitors of the PT boats of this war out to the big vessels carrying the liquor three miles offshore, then make a dash for narrow river where trucks were waiting, unload in faster than fast time, and off they'd go. Of course, they didn't come every night, but on foggy or rainy nights we knew enough to stay indoors and to see or hear nothing. The bootleggers were mostly high-class men who felt they were in legitimate business and would not shoot unless forced to. But the hijackers were daredevils with nothing to lose. Their only investments were guns and high-powered automobiles. Three brothers, the Mogiris, were the most 167 noted hijackers I knew about. They were young and gay and loved the excitement and the profit. We have a good road that runs right through our place down to the ocean. How the automobiles on a F9 guy night would whiz by. One time my mother was ill, and I was staying with her at Cedar Spring Farm. About 8 o'clock one morning at Stan Even, who had worked for mother 42 years, first as farmhand, then as chauffeur, came into her room while we were breakfasting and said, with a white face, Charlie Maggie or is sitting dead against the big sycamore tree up the road shot through the head. Mother asked, Are you sure he is dead? Yes. Quote answer dead. He's stiff. Mother never said another word. She reached for the telephone and told Mamie Rice, the telephone girl, to get John, the biggest bootlegger in town. Then after a minute hello. Johnny is that you? This is Mrs. Baker. Come this minute and he come rake your corpse off my place. How dare you do such a thing to me? In less than half an hour poor Charlie was gone. How mother knew who had put him there, I never discovered. 168 Chapter 27 Pete No father seek his merits to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode, there they are like in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his God. Thomas Gray this story makes me so unhappy, that even after all these years I hate to write about it. Pete always played the drum in the Memorial Day Parade. Memorial Day was, and still is the biggest day of the year in Wickford. The parade starts early, and marches two miles to the Elm Grove Cemetery, where the graves are decorated, and there are speeches and a band concert. Then it marches back. Anyone can march, but only a chosen F you play in the band. As I see it now, Pete was lonely, especially during that winter and spring, when mother was in Europe visiting my sister Gladys and the house was closed. And because he was lonely, he began to drink. Ed stand even. The caretaker was an awful tease when he had time on his hands, and to scare Pete from drinking he told Pete that if he didn't 169 stop he couldn't play the drum in the Memorial Day Parade. This parade on Pete is mind. 
When mother got home late in May just the day before the parade she found beat half says over. She got the cook to give him plenty of black coffee and told Ed not to tease him any more. But the next morning, when Pete went with his drum to march in the parade, he was told that he was drunk, that he would have to go home. It broke his heart. He had played in the parade every year for 40 years. Souching back he came, went to his shed, and then came up to the big house. Mother was alone, for everyone else had gone to the parade. He mumbled something to her about shooting Ed. He blamed Ed for not helping him and taking his side at the parade. Almost everyone lickered up for the occasion and Pete was probably no worse than many semicolon but Ed, to prove his point and stop Pete's drinking, had told the marshal that Pete was unfit to play his drum in the band. Pete was crazy mad, and when mother looked at him, she realized that he was, and that he would shoot either Ed or himself. It never entered her mind that he might shoot her. 170 she begged him to give her the gun, but he wouldn't, and said dot he was going to wait at the gate, and shoot Ed as he came in. Mother didn't know what to do. There was no way to warn Ed, or get the gun from Pete. So she called up the state police, and told them the story. They sent her splendid young trooper on a motorcycle right away. When Pete saw him coming, he ran down to his house and sat in his door with his gun across his knees. Mother warned the trooper, telling him to stay with her till Ed got back, then he and the trooper could get the gun away from Pete. The trooper smiled and said he could manage Pete, and although Mother held onto his arm, and begged him to wait, he went ahead. Pete put a small stick across the narrow path, about twenty-five feet from his door, and as the trooper approached he said, if you step across that stick I shoot you. The trooper smiled and said, What have you got against me? Question mark 1J and kept on walking. Pete shot him between the eyes. He dropped dead instantly. Pete looked up to see mother rushing down 171 the driveway screaming at him, not to shoot the trooper, and then he realized what he had done. He ran across the Banya road to the old stone ice house, and barricaded himself in it. His poor dog followed, and went in with him. Just then Ed and my nephew Licky, and the two maids came back from the dot raid. Mother was beside herself with grief and terror. They got other state troopers, and had to shoot Pete and his poor dog to death, before they could get at the trooper's body in front of Pete's shed. Pete had them covered from the ice house, and there was no other way to get him out. The undertaker later told my husband, no wonder Pete could understand animals. He was like one himself. He had hair an inch long all over his body. Point one 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 hundred and seventy two chapter twenty eight mother in law hitch your wagon to a star. Ralph Waldo Emerson, my mother in law, was a very gentle little person. Her family had been abolitionists and followers of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Theodore Parker. They were all radical Unitarians. She was most artistic and very musical, fond of opera and the theater, and a very good amateur astronomer. Every Sunday evening in the winter we would all go to Mr. and Mrs. Hinckley's and have a family orchestra. Mrs. Hinckley played the piano, Frank the cello, Nita, and Frankie violins, Buddy the drum. Tina and I, with no voices, tried to be the tune. I hate to think how it must have sounded, but we all loved it and kept it up year after year. Mr. Hinckley was the audience and I laughed to think of the things he suggested their playing. They attempted anything and sometimes through sheer luck all ended together. Mrs. Hinckley was the youngest feeling person for her age I ever knew. She rode horseback 173 until she was over 70, and when, on her 80th birthday, we asked what she would most like to do, she said she wanted to waltz. We cleared all the furniture out of our back room, rolled up third rug, hired a pianist and violinist, and invited Mr. McNair, the dancing teacher, to come to the party. Mrs. Hinckley was like a girl in her delight. She danced with her sons and grandson, and with Mr. McNair beautifully, and to see her little skirts flying, 
and her happy face smiling up at her tall sons and grandson was very moving. Her favorite relatives, Louise and Emily Dimon, and I looked at one another in appreciation. What a wonderful institution marriage is. One acquires not only a husband and children, but so many other perquisites. My own and my husband's family have been so satisfactory and satisfying, that I have had a hard time making outside friends. The days are only so dot long, and I can't begin to see all of them, that I want to. 174 Chapter 29 The christening innocence is most fortunate, if it finds the same protection as crime. La Rocha Falcor Dart wins, Gladys, and Francesca, and my brother's twins, David Ivy and Ashton, were christened in the old Narragansett Church in Wickford. It is a lovely old church built in 1704. We had two ministers and a bishop for the event. The husband and I couldn't decide on names. Four daughters were too much for us. Nita, our oldest, had been named after mother and me, and Elizabeth after my mother-in-law. What to name the next two was beyond us. I knew that even if I had twenty children I would keep going till I had a son, so did not want a Francesca. But Frank, the husband, was a little discouraged, and wanted a child named for him. One of the twins looked very much like him, so we agreed on Francesca for her. I wanted Gladys, my darling sister's name, for the other one. Then Frank decided his favorite name was Edith. I had never heard that before. And my mother 175 said she really felt that with four daughters one should be named deaf for her mother Lucy. Mrs. Hinckley, my mother-in-law, who had been very gentle and quiet up till then, said it would make her very happy if we named one of the twins Felicita. Her favorite story had always been Old Madame Marcel's Secret by E. Marlott, and the heroine was named Felicita. She had always hoped to have a daughter to receive that name, but had three sons. Mr. Hinckley then spoke up and said F, or the first time he was glad he had had no daughter. He was only joking, but Mrs. Hinckley looked as if she was going to weep, so I told her I would surely name one of the twins Felicita. We were, of F then, and everyone in the family, about thirty in all, including three godparents for each child and they had ideas too, took sides and we sat up till two in the morning, fighting, and arguing over the baby's names. At the christening next day Frank and I, each holding a baby, delayed the ceremony while we argued. The Baker twins were baptized first, for we cold knit come to a decision. We argued right up to the font. My brother and his wife, each holding one 176 of their own twin boys, tried to help. Finally David said distinctly to the bishop, quote if you will start baptizing the Hinckley children, I will tell you the names. T and he did. He gave each child all the names that had been suggested. What a party we had afterward. Mother was in her element. David had been so successful with getting our children baptized, that he tried to make Mother Mary Irving Rudman then and there, and asked the bishop if he would perform the ceremony. How angry Mother got, and looked so pretty as she blushed. Irving was already, he assured us. It was a successful party in more ways than just the four twins christening, for one of the boys' godfathers met and fell in love with one of the girls' godmothers, and before long we all went to the wedding. About four years later, when Frank Jr. was christened, I tried to make him wear the beautiful christening dress that Nita and Tina and generations before them had worn. The twins had had to be dressed alike, so none of them could wear it. Suppose the dress was rotten, it was so old. Anyway, Frank was very big for his age, and unusually 177 strong, and he gave a kick and a leap as the bishop took him to carry him to the font. The dress, and the old slip, that went with it, split and fell off him, and he was baptized in his diapers and shirt, with the dress and slip draped over him as best we could. I never saw anything disintegrate as that christening dress did. 178 Chapter 30 Father-in-law love flings a halo round the dear one's head. 
Caroline Norton my father-in-law comma comma who died two weeks before his 90th birthday, was a tall, spare, handsome, dignified gentleman whom I found perfectly fascinating. He came to Providence as a young man from the Cape. He became a leading citizen and highly respected for his judgment. I turned to him in every problem, especially about the children, and miss his counsel more than I can say. I have felt the loss of his advice on books too, and what to read. His taste was so cosmopolitan, that he knew just the book, to advise for every mood or occasion. As Mr. and Mrs. Hinckley had no daughter, and neither of them had had a sister, our four little girls were a great amusement and interest. Day after day Mrs. Hinckley would come, and take first one child for the day, then another. I know how naughty the children were with their grandparents, for they sense the absence of restraint, but neither Mr. nor Mrs. Hinckley ever told on them. 179 One day Nita ran away, just to be devilish, and one of the tellers at the bank, of which Mr. Hinckley was president, told of seeing Nita running down the street with her dignified grandfather chasing her, half a block behind. She was returned to me a little early that night, but no tale was told. Bless their kind hearts. I try to be the same kind of grandparent. 180 Chapter 31 Buddy, and the horse a farmer went trotting upon his grey mare, bumperty, bumperty, bump, with his daughter behind him, so rosy and fair, lumperty, lumperty, lump. A raven cried croak, and they all tumbled down, bumperty, bumperty, bump. The mare broke her knees, and the farmer his crown lumperty, lumperty, lump. Traditional Buddy and I were out walking in Narragansett one day he was about five, when we came on a very dead horse in a field off the highway, where it had been struck by a truck and killed. Its side had been cut comma and the intestines were coming out. Blood was on the road, making a path comma to where the horse lay. Buddy was intrigued. I thought I would never get him to leave such a fascinating scene. Early the next morning he made me take him again to see the horse. It was even deader now. Flies had come, and we scared away two crows. The third day the wind had changed, so we knew we were coming to the horse long before we arrived. Ants and little black-winged creatures 181 were running in and out of its eyes and nose. It was horribly unpleasant. Buddy said, take a good look now, for I simply can't come again and look at this horse. T mother, quote he said plaintively, is nighty it too bad you, and your little boy haven't the same STF? Taste? It was, and I was ashamed. We visited that horse almost daily until there were only bones left. 182 Chapter 32 Buddy I's clothes I gave him some garters to garter up his hose, and a little pocket handkerchief to wipe his pretty nose. Mother Goose probably because I had had so many daughters, I made foolish mistakes with my son. I loved her so, and had made most of the clothes for the little girls. I tried to make over girls' clothes for Buddy. After he had been in school a few weeks, his exasperated teacher wrote me a letter. Dear Mrs. Hinckley, please get told to rank some boys' clothes and underwear. I can't spend half an hour dressing and undressing him each time he has to go to the toilet. Every yours, R. W. Williams 183 Chapter 33 More so in God bless Pitchy Patchy, devil takes fly away, when mother went to Europe she used to bring home either a French coat and hat, or dress, or both, for the little girls. I would give it to whomever it fitted, and copy it for the other three. One fall she brought a beautiful camel's hair coat with a cape, which just fitted Nita. She also brought material for the duplicates. I made one slightly smaller for Tina, and took great pains with it. The one for Frankie I rather hurried, and the one for Gladys was just pasted, with one sleeve pinned inches, when my sister Gladys took them to church on Thanksgiving Day. All went well till little Gladys began to wiggle during the sermon, and to Gladys's horror her coat began to come to pieces. Our pew is way up in front, and everyone in the congregation knew me well, and also my slapdash habit of doing things. They all began to laugh, 
and after the service was 184 over someone lent Gladys a fur cape to take little Gladys home in, and they picked up the pieces of the coat, and sent them to me at home, wretched with German measles at the time. 185 Chapter 34 Fire at Narragansett We were in a clamorous appealing to the mercy of the fire, in a mad expostulation with the deaf, and frantic fire. Point 1 T. Edgar Allan Poe The house in Narragansett burned down, for no known reason, one beautiful Sunday morning in July. We were 22 people in the house. The Roman Catholic help had gone to 9 o'clock mass. Mother, who was visiting us, and I were having our breakfast cozily in her room, and Buddy had just come in to say good morning. I heard a queer crackling noise coming from the third story and Buddy went to see what it was. I shall hear his terror-stricken voice till my dying day mother. The house is on fire. I rushed upstairs. The ceiling and sewing room were ablaze. I slammed shut the door to the sewing room, screamed fire, and opened the door across the hall where the only son of some dear friends was asleep. I yelled, Sandy, get up. I feet the house is on fire. With one leap he was in the middle of the room. As he jumped up, the blazing 186 ceiling fell on his bed. He would have been killed, if he had not been as quick, and lithe as a cat. We did everything we could to save the house got the garden hose playing water on the roof in no time, used all of our many fire extinguishers, Call the fire department. Mother Shulfred stand even and a youth visiting us climbed onto the roof, and nearly got caught when it fell in. It was all a nightmare. The house burned to the ground in 28 minutes. When the help, who had left a well-ordered house at 845, returned from church, they found only a smoking ruin, and most of us in our night clothes. We were able to save only a little furniture and a few books. P.T. The monkey, was so frightened at the first smell of smoke, that he found a hiding place, and when the firemen got there they thought we were all crazy, far instead of trying, to save our furniture and other inanimate bows comma comma sessions. We were all crawling around the floor in our night clothes looking under things and calling, P.T. P.T. Neat to found him at last under a corner cupboard so low to the floor, that no one knows how he ever got under it. The fireman chopped away the 187 wall and P.T. was taken out safely in Nita's arms. A dogs and cats and Tommy, the raccoon point and saved themselves, and came trembling up to us out on the lawn, while the house was burning. We sat there exhausted and bewildered on some rescued chairs and sofas, surrounded by everyone in the county. How people do love their fires. They all came to ours and many helped themselves to souvenirs. I heard one supposedly dear friend say to his ten-year-old son, Here, Phil take this book home. It might have burned up point one F Phil took it. I was too sunk to say anything. Another youth, trying to be helpful, said brightly to me, Well anyway, you had a lovely day for the fire, Mrs. Henkley. Suppose he meant it wasn't raining. 188 Chapter 35 Cape C.O.D.I. In my youth said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, T. Kept all my limbs very supple. Alice in Wonderland Frank's forebears were Cape Carders. His grandfather's little old house stands in the centre of the high and sport golf course or a little Cape Cod cottage with a love dot com a live fireplace and mantle in the living room. Whenever we are there more than a day, Frank spends his time going gaily from one graveyard to the next finding relatives. I used to go with him, but the low-growing blackberry vines that flourish in the cemeteries used to trip me up when I looked about at a he gee stones instead of directly at my own feet. At various times I have sprained my ankle, skinned my nose, and torn a gash out of my arm. I wasn't any help, anyway. I couldn't tell, for instance, that Olive Thatcher, who died in 1862 at the age of 28, daughter of C and H Hinckley, was the long-lost Aunt Olive. I had 189 thought Thatcher was her middle name, that her full name was Olive Thatcher Hinckley. Dot. Dot not at all. Thatcher was her married name. Her husband was a mean one who ran away, and left her for no good reason, 
and she died after giving birth to a baby, who also died. Her father, Hazekiah, was away fighting in the civil war, and on her deathbed she told her mother and sisters, to bury her far away from home, and to make no mention of Thatcher on her tombstone. The poor women had her buried at Orleans, twenty miles from where they lived. In my mind's eye I can see that forlorn little funeral procession taking the long, tedious, all-day trip to Orleans and back in the slow-moving horse-drawn carriages of that day. We looked all one summer for Sylvester, not quite sure that he had a grave. But he did a lovely grave under a pine tree. Except in Italy, nowhere do the pines grow as decoratively as they do on Cape Cod. I have always been glad that the pilgrims spent their first winter in the new world off Cape Cod. Even if they were on a ship they must have seen the pines in the distance, and nearby the golden sand dunes and the blue-gray grass, that looked purple against the HB snow. The color of the ocean I go, and the shape of the land, are so serene and satisfying, that uncons commissively the pilgrims must have been encouraged. Sylvester had a nice grave and a beautiful tombstone at all, square shaft but he wasn't there. He had been lost at sea in the great gale of 1815. My best friend, when I first went to the Cape, was cousin Gussie. She was Uncle Henry's fifth wife. He had had no luck with wives they had all died, either in childbirth or from consumption, so he decided he'd better marry one of the family, for they were all long-lived and tough. Gussie was his first cousin and they looked exactly alike tall and spare, with sandy reddish hair, blue eyes, and an aquiline nose. Real aristocrats they were and looked. He and she lived happily together 68 years. She was 18, and he 30 when they were married, and each died at the age of 98. They had one son, Pradhan, the crankiest, most disagreeable, ornery man I ever met. He thought of nothing but graveyards, and was the village historian on inconsequential things, knowing the dates on every tombstone in every cemetery on Cape Cod. Only once in his life did he I.G. leave the Cape, and then he went to Plymouth to see the rock. He and Frank were quite congenial, F. or Pardon was a great help on family graves. Like many people of his type, not wholly sound of mind, he was psychic. A surprising number of his prophecies came true. But he was never able to find and recover his stolen overcoat. This theft happened after his parents had died, and he was living alone. After that, whenever he left the house, he would take everything of value with him, and the poor man would struggle to mark it with the flat silver, and a coffee pot and other treasures, so loaded down that one wondered how he could carry the groceries home. 192 Chapter 36 Frank's 50th birthday it was meet, that we should make merry and be glad. Underscore underscore St. Luke, Chap. 15, V32 We celebrated Frank's 50th birthday during a summer spent on Cape Cod. It happened during Prohibition. Nearly everybody came to it, including Cousin Gussie and Pardon. Labor Day was just a week off when everybody would be leaving on account of the beginning of schools, and the end of the men's vacations. A good party seemed to be in order. Everyone was told to bring whatever he had on hand, for the punch. Dot. Dot we decided to hold the party at Edith Buckland's house, because it opened up the best, and had the biggest dining room. At about two o'clock in the afternoon we put a big new round wash boiler in the middle of the dining room table, then all the women went home to make sandwiches, chowder, etc., meet guests coming for the party, put babies to bed, and promise the bigger children a picnic soon. Then get 193 ready for the party. I arrived at Edith I.S. about six with two hands, a gallon of chowder, three angel cakes, the birthday cake dot dot and candles, and sandwiches. My mother and brother, Dr. Dot Dr. Colin Y., Betty and Rush Sturges and Sam Dexter came with me. We found an earnest little group around the wash boiler, testing. Already champagne, white wine, brandy, sherry, and half a bottle of Benedictine had been put in. Dr. Day had brought some claret and my mother some brandy. The Sturgeses brought creme de menthe, 
which we all vetoed. Someone suggested more ice, and a howl went up. What do you want to weaken it for? Isn't liquor hard enough to get? The always tactful Malcolm commented. Who put in the kerosene? Now, Malcolm, said Betsy, his wife. All right, Betsy, but don't you drink any point one one people were pouring in now, and everyone added a little, or a lot to the punch. Howard insisted and put in a big cake of ice. We sat anywhere for supper in the porch, in the parlor, on the stairs. The old house seemed 194 to beam. Any party given by Edith or Harris is always good. I everyone made speeches, then we had a mock trial. If the participants know one another intimately, a mock trial can be amusing and most embarrassing. There were so many lawyers, and everyone felt so cheerful, that there were many searching questions and many informing answers. Evelyn Smith, who has a quick wit, was defendant in a breach of promise case. Everyone was called as witness and the most outrageous questions were asked, to the delight of everyone except the witnesses. In spite of the long personal histories that hovered in the background of all of us, we all felt very young and gay that evening and deeply happy in our long-standing friendships. As Frank fell into bed that night he said, it was a swell party, but I'm glad I'm not 50 every day. Point one, one we had but one casualty our dear, dignified doctor. Four stalwart men carried him up the hill to our house, and he comma slept until late the next afternoon. The next day we had to fulfill our promise to the older children. 195 suffering cats. How can we have a picnic today? I never want to see food again and neither does anyone else. You do the darnedest things. Yes, dear, but you know how good the big children were, and we promised them they could go to the birthday party. It wasn't till I saw that punch I feel as sick as you do, but you ought to see Tommy. He's still in Edith's hammock. I looked out the kitchen window at him when I went over there to get some of our silver. He is the queerest color. But he talks. Guess I'll go and have a look at him. Please bring back a couple of saucepans and any vegetable dishes you can. K and E tell Edith we'll take the children off her hands tonight. It's only fair. Dot. Dot I wonder where our children slept last night. The telephone rings and I answer it. Hell comma comma tilde can need to this is clover. We've just found a big pail of chowder that somebody forgot out on our back porch. Daddy thought it was Uncle Tommy he smelled, but it was the chowder and Bridget says it is alright, but we better eat it tonight. Dot. Doc tell your kids we'll meet them at 196 the dock at F5. Daddy is going to take us out on the pearl necklace. The pearl necklace got its name from Betsy's wanting one and Malcolm's wanting a boat. They compromised. Tell them to bring a watermelon and some peanuts and Coca-Cola. Clover goes on and raincoats. It's squalish. Dot. Dot Daddy says he will bring his cabbage. Ha, ha. Goodbye. Quote Malcolm always brought a head of sea. Abbage to all picnics or Dutch street parties, and considered himself fully equipped. They tied up at the dock toward evening as it got rougher and rougher, but after supper the old boys decided it was just the time for a race. There are many small one design sailboats in the cove, and the greatest rivalry exists. The boats are chosen and taken on the principle of first come first served. They are as like as peas in a pod, but one, the Abbot Abbey, is considered the best, and everyone rushes for it, as the boys did this evening. It is tied to a stake out in the cove. As the first boat got there, Jack threw his arms around the stake to establish ownership. Another boat, rowed by Malcolm Jr., with Howard Jr., 197 and George aboard, hit Jack's boat and pushed it away from the stake. Jack clung to the stake fiercely, but it was wet and slippery and he would slide down till he felt the cold water, then shinny up again, f or all the world like a monkey on a stick. It was rough, and the tide was running, and Jack was soaked before Malcolm could come about and pick him up. We on the shore were weak with laughter. Even Tommy got out of the hammock 
and came to see what the shouts were about. 198 Chapter 37 Mr. Child, the plus visitor well, I hardly know. I'm all of a fluster myself. Underscore underscore Bill. The green lizard, in Clice in Wonderland once, when Frank was away on business for a few days and I had been a vef on the pearl necklace overnight on a short cruise, I found on my return a telegram to Frank, saying, if convenient will spend Wednesday must see you about the hot crisksy. Edwards H. Child it was Wednesday at this moment. Just then the garbage truck which was also the ice truck came around the corner in two wheels with little Malcolm driving, and I and a stranger sitting on the front seat. Malcolm, about twelve years old, announced, we found this man down by the bridge. He wants to see Uncle Hink. It the men got slowly out. Do you always get the ice first, and collect the garbage on it, or do you sometimes do it the other way around? Question mark T199 he asked solemnly. It will, said Malcolm, it's easier if we cause we dump it down can, get the garbage first, by the bridge, then we get the ice. But it doesn't matter does it, Andy? Question mark LT no, said Andy. They're so glad to see us, nobody say yes nothing. They pay us too. I got $26 already, and Malcolm's got twenty two. Why the difference? Ashes, said Andy. I'm bigger and stronger. He with that he took the broom from the side of the truck under the garbage, and swept a veffa piece of ice, and took it into our house just as I appeared. The gentleman shuddered and looked up. Does Mr. Hinckley live here? Quote he asked. Yes. I'm Mrs. Hinckley. I'm afraid I looked rather a sight. Our crews had been informal only women. I had on a wet bathing suit and a yellow slicker, and my yesterday's evening clothes were over my arm. It was then about eight o'clock in the morning. We had been out to dinner the night before at Wiano and I must have looked as if I had had a night of it. How do you do? Is your husband 200 home? Quote little I'm so sorry hefs in New York until Friday. I've been away and just this minute read your telegram. Please come in, and have some breakfast. The children came pouring downstairs. Three didn't know you had such a big family. Only five. The rest are visitors. I'm not a visitor, I live here, comma feet, said the baby. Andy came in, still holding the broom. Say, would you like to play tennis? He asked the visitor. We're having a round robin at ten. I haven't any tennis things.110, that's all right. We got everything. Uncle Malcolm always plays in his bare feet. You can have his sneakers.11 Mr. Child played tennis, and seemed really to enjoy it. Then we had lunch. Then he had a nap. Then a race in the small boats. The race had hardly started, when Mr. Child's boat capsized and he, not knowing how tricky they are, nearly drowned by getting fouled in the ropes. Malcolm and Andy he seemed to belong to them saved his life, and brought him ashore and pumped water out of him. Naturally, I helped. The boat 201 would not have capsized, if he had not been so clumsy, but no one said so. He went to bed, while his clothes dried. I gave him some whiskey, and begged him to spend the night but he said he must take the 8 p.m. train back. Also, he said, I really feel as if I had seen everything and done everything. I've had a motor ride, helped in the service of the place, had athletics, sailed, been shipwrecked, been to bed twice, eaten three times, had a drink, and met about 50 people. I don't see what else could happen to me. Well, you never can tell, said Andy, persuasively. But Mr. Child lefty. The husband says it is lucky I cannot hear the story as Mr. Child tells it, but Mr. Child has offered Andy a job in New York any time he wants it. 202 Chapter 38 Sisters Fair I did give 10 shillings and no more, though I believe most of the rest did give more, and did believe that I did so too. P.P.'s I Diary, November 5. 166 so oh, some time ago I went to New Bedford, to lunch dot with some dot old friends. I always love to go there. It has atmosphere and the most delightful, 
friendly p. Opal in the world. One of the mysteries of my childhood happened in New Bedford. It was a mystery to everyone, in fact. Mr. Hathaway, mother's friend and Emma Dot apostrophe s father, was apparently a happy and prosperous citizen. His only fault was the unforgivable one of going out after tea. He only took a short walk, and probably liked the evening air, but it just wasn't done in the best circles, and Mrs. Hathaway's neighbors used to condole with her. An evening he went out, and was seen standing on the bridge to Padanarum looking at the sunset. He was never seen again. Every clue was run down. Even China clippers were asked to inquire 203 in distant lands, if he had shipped on a far-going vessel, but to no avail. Mrs. Hathaway became resigned to widowhood, and except for the fact that she did not feel certain enough of his demise, to wear mourning which she apparently longed to do, was happy with Emma. Emma was never allowed to go out after tea, and I dispensed her. I was told of her death at the luncheon, and it awakened old memories for us all. Another thing I learned of at the luncheon, was a share the Prophet Church fair they had just had. The idea was so good, that I took it home, and for years now we have had share their profit sales, to help support our sisters of the Holy Nativity. The idea is to put up for sale any of your possessions, that you don't want. You name the price and receive two-thirds of it, when the article is sold. The seller takes one-third. The fun we have had buying each other's china and glass, and clothes and furniture can't be measured in dollars and cents, but we have made a lot of money too. Even if you done it get new things, you get something different. I have heard many of 204 our brides being consoled with, never mind. Dear it's a nice ore, but you can sell it at the share fair profit and probably Mrs. D, the donor, likes it and will buy it back. Of course. Great secrecy is maintained, and no one is supposed to know where the things come from. It adds to the excitement. My best friend teased me for years by not selling a set of dinner plates that just match some of mine. She knows I want them, and at every meeting, when we rack our brains, to see what we can sell this year, she speaks of those plates, says she hates them and wants others. I have tried to tempt her with almost everything I have, but she is too foxy for me. I overheard her tell one of my daughters she was afraid that if I got those plates I would stop working for the sale. One of the worst things was the time a not very happy member sold her engagement ring. We had it appraised how our retail stores hate us for our endless requests and were all surprised at its high value. She sold it to a Boston woman. People come from everywhere to buy things and spent the money on a mink coat. Her husband, she said, never noticed anything. But he saw that coat. Further, he thought that a friend of his, whom he knew 205, to be crazy about his wife, had given it to her. She was in a gem. Then at a dinner one night I was ranting on like a fool about our last share the prophet fair and said that her biggest sale that year had been a diamond ring. What kind of ring? he asked. Gently. I blustered and said I mustn't talk shop any more. Every woman then knew of the ring and poor Kitty nearly fainted. After dinner he came to me and said, Quietly, you managed that sale and you go and get that ring. The stone belonged to my mother, and if Kitty doesn't want it, I do. She is just spoiled. I've given her too much. I had a terrible time getting it back, but I made real friend of the generous Boston Largy who sold it back to me. I had to pay her a lot which took a large chunk out of our vaunted profits for that year. I had to take her into my confidence, tell her how angry George was, and that Kitty was a flibbertage but all's well now, except that we had to have a smorgasbord to add a mite to our reduced funds, and we have all just had a fine time at the Chris 2 or 16 of George and Kitty's twins. Mrs. B came down from Boston and gave them a nice present. George and Kitty each had thought the other didn't care, and this had brought them together. The husband says Kitty was scared into having the twins. They had been married eight years, and these were their first children. Another year we sold a diamond ring, that had quite a history. It belonged to Bishop Perry, 
the former presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, having been left to him by a Philadelphia woman, to provide part of the funds for a memorial church to her husband which was to be built in the place farthest from another church in the United States. The bishop tried to sell it, and found to his surprise that the diamond, which had been bought for $10,000 years ago, would bring no more than $700 from many of our dealers. Don't ask me why. I wore that diamond for six weeks, and tried my best to sell it. The stone was a beauty and the value was there it weighed over five carats. Finally one of our friends, worked her husband up to giving $2,100 for it. Our bishop's share 207 was $1,400, and he sent this to the bishop of Wyoming, who built a humble log church at Bondurant. It is still the most remote church in the United States, but a dear, fry and the white place nevertheless. One of the greatest difficulties at our share the profit sales is one of standards what to accept, and what to reject. No one will buy absolute trash, although some have given me doubts about that. We have a committee on accepting articles. Everything has to be listed, and a receipt given and taken back, if there is no sale. I am very hard-hearted, and only accept things, that I think will sell, but I cannot stand at the door every minute. One woman brought 5,000 buttons, and wanted each one listed. A man I think he was crazy brought the greatest lot of awful, moth-eaten, bugenfisted furs. I was away from the door when he came, and some kind-hearted woman let him in. He priced those things at $100 to $300. Of course, none of them sold, and we had to put them in an iron ash in with a tight cover, for they were crawling. In the lot, were a number of worn out for tails, and when he came for the things and we gave him the 208 can to take them away in, he demanded $30 of us $10 each for three main details which he said we had stolen. But usually all goes well. Many times we have no idea what the thing is we are selling. K an enterprising young woman sold a curious, liver ship china bowl with an antique mahogany stand about 15 inches tall and it is still in a neck Wintons's parlor, filled with begonias. Our old wheelbarrow wheel is a chandelier. Washstands were always in great demand. They are now bars and good ones. All we had to do with old sewing machines was to throw them away, and paint the wooden stand. They served as coffee tables, or end tables for sofas. Pictures and photographs never sold, but empty frames did. And of course the demand for children's clothes and shoes is simply staggering. This year we had an intriguing torchy era for sale the Queen of Sheba. This graceful and charming statue is about three feet tall, and stands on an imitation marble pedestal, holding a light in her upraised left hand. She is wood covered with gesso, with ebony skin and brilliantly colored crown and scarves and ornaments. Her story is 209 romantic. About 90 years ago a sign of one of our well-known families went to Europe on a grand tour, after graduating from college. In Venice he saw and fell for the Queen of Sheba, bought her, and had her sent home. He wrote to his family, that he had bought them a gifty, and hoped they would like it as much as he did. When the time came to unpack his gift, all the family gathered and waited breathlessly. He took the covers off, and there was the queen in her ebony spender with a gold crown on her head, a bright scarf around her bosom and one around her hips, but still with a great deal of soft ebony skin showing. His mother gave a little shocked cry, and buried her face in her hands. His brothers laughed and his sister snickered. His stern father turned on him and said, This is carrying a joke too far, my son. Carry that disgraceful statue to the attic, and cover it up until we can think what to do with it. Nothing was ever done. It was pushed way back in a closet in the attic, and ninety years later I pulled off the yellowed sheet, and looked again on 210 the charming little figure. The boy was deeply hurt, and it caused a rifty in his family which never quite healed. Now such things are all the fashion and I expect to get a lot of money for her. I hope he knows. 211 Chapter 39 The Sewing Clump, nor shall we ever, if we wise, 
the meanest or the least despise. Underscore Jeffrey's tale and other of my activities, is my sewing club. Just after I was married, a few freefts of mine started sewing together Monday afternoons, visiting each week or to different members' house. In this group, as in any other there is a presiding genius one kind woman who keeps us together, and to whom we owe the idea of our club. We make baby clothes for the poor. I do not think I was a shark member, and cannot recall just how or why I was asked to join. We vary a good deal in ages, but most of us are grandmothers now, and since we have been meeting we have had four deaths. We have never been more than 30 members, and usually about 15 come to the meetings. We have no rules. One member voluntarily does the cutting out and planning of the work. When she needs money for material she says, we really must have some system in this club. How do you expect me to provide all this stuff for you to sew? Pocketbooks 212 are opened, and our only officer, the treasurer, is given money. Someone said our dues should be $2 a year. Perhaps they are I never heard. We make lovely layettes, dainty useful things difficult to buy, and they go to anyone who needs them are lying in hospital, the Frontier Nursing Association in Kentucky, to poor babies overseas who have no clothes, to Providence churches who gather for the needy. Sometimes we are lazy and accomplish little. Then again the drive is on, like the present one F4 Europe, and we work like mad. We know each other intimately, and have shared joys and sorrows, births and deaths, for a long while. Of course we talk. During both wars we have read letters occasionally, we always talk of current events, and sometimes one of us reads aloud. If someone has been to New York, she tells of the plays she saw. Another one tells perhaps of a trip to Mexico, or a visit to a married daughter, or a wedding. Why we don't gossip? I don't know. I think we all love each other too much for gossip, I find. Usually steps on someone's toes. 213 Chapter 4 O Pictures Sometimes there are accidents in our life, the skillful extrication from which demands a little folly. La Rocha Fau called every summer Frank, especially since we have had Grand Hildreni tries to take a family picture at the beach. There are so many of us that he must wait to choose a day, when the greatest number happens to be here. He plans and talks of it for weeks, and at last dot he, when everything seems as auspicious as possible, he asks, can the children put off their naps until I get a picture? That is a heavy preset to ask for a picture, but no one dares to say anything. Attempts at assembly are begun, word is sent around, and my mother is placed in a comfortable chair on the porch of the cabana. The family will be grouped above, below, and on both sides of her. We discover first, that Nita is missing. She finally shows up, quite late, from a luncheon engagement. Meanwhile, three friends of Gordon's 214 have postponed a foursome of golf, and are waiting for him to join them. Frank can't find the colored film, and drops the camera in the sand. Buddy, in his bathing suit doesn't want to put on his uniform. Gladys insists on a place in the back row, so that she can hide her shape. By the time there is some semblance of order, the occupants of the neighboring cabana begin to arrive and give advice. A confusion of talk begins, lasting until the camera is finally snapped. The same things seem to be said every time a picture is taken, and it is immaterial who says them. Why do you take a picture of such a homely family, Frank? There are too many anyway. It will look like a convention point one day or a camp meeting. Sure, that's it a camp meeting. Say, boys do you know the one about the Baptist pass and the boys go into a huddle, and after a minute break up, guffawing loudly. Daddy, F or heaven I s say Kai I v got to feed this baby point one 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 all right. All come right. Now all the 215 biggest ones in back, kneeling. I can't kneel, Papa. I have a bandage on my knee. The next size sitting, and the little ones in front. Point one one. I am a big one this year. You said I was, Mummy. Point one one. No, you're not. You're not as big as me. 
Of course she is. She seven. Just because dot why are you eat too much? Ty don't either. My father's a doctor, and he says quote listen, darlings if we all keep quiet, and do as papa says. Dot. T to horrors. Here comes Miss Smibbit to call. We'll never be finished. Oh, Frank, dear, says Miss Smibbit. I'm so glad I happen to be here, and can help you pose Evelyn.11. Frank likes he dot r, dev, Miss Smibbit continues. Run and get that long bench from our cabana. Tina, dear, you look dead. You must sit on it and stop kneeling. I don't care what I do. If we could only hurry. Dot t to 216 last year when we used our bunch, Miss Mibbert, none of the heads, got in point one t can't you keep those babies from crawling off? Give them something to eat. Don't you do anything of the kind. TTA howl from Ben. Mother, saw Jack bite him. He didn't either. You always say things about my brother. TT look at his um. See the mark. T make the punishment fit the crime. Comedy to says Phil from a neighboring cabana. Bite him back. Dot you know. Shout all the mothers. Phil, you go chase yourself. It q what does he know of family life? T Arnathan, somebody says to Phil's brother, fix him. T I certainly will. Phil tears off down the beach with Jonathan after him and all the bigger children following in the light. Now where is Buddy? He really is a pest. Need to get them, and see that they don't go into the bar. TT217 say, that I s an idea let I s all wet our whistles just once in order. I want a whistle. To, mummy. Can I? Can I? For goodness' sake, this gets worse every year. When you children were little we had a man come once a year, and take our pictures and th81 was that. Well, I think it's terrible that all the family isn't here, anyway. And Charlie and Evan Dunn Egon maybe they'll never come home. All right, all right for God's sake don't cry now. Just a minute. Dot. Buddy, do kneel down. I hope you drown Phil. No, he didn't. Grandpa and Phil's making faces at us behind the cabana. Point one point one stop, Dev. And Charlie, stop picking your nose. Turn candy over on her back. One, two, three good dot now just one more. 218 chapter 41 clamber keys your Johnny Cacus side up beneath the waters of the sea, our lobsters thick as thick can be. Alice in Wonderland the most aggravating thing the 1938 hurricane did to us was to destroy a clam big ground at Whale Rock. It was a lovely grassy glen between big rocks. The tidal waves washed out all the soil and grass. The second hurricane, six years dot later, added insult to injury by taking more odin soil. Almost every Sunday evening in the summer we have a clam big. Ed stand even. A past master at clambics prepares them. There are master clambic creators, just as there are master chefs and master brewers. He gathers his seaweed at morning low tide and starts his fire to dot heat the stones. Then he wraps all the contents of the bacon cheese cloth squares the clams, lobsters, chickens, potatoes and sweet corn. After the big stones are red hot, the wood is raked off and a blanket of fresh green seaweed is laid on the stones. Quickly on top of this are put the wrapped young split broilers. Then, 219 after another layer of seaweed, the potatoes and sweet corn, then more seaweed and the lobsters. More seaweed still, then the clams about two quarts to your cheesecloth square. The last layer of seaweed is spread over the clams and over the whole mound is fastened a big piece of canvas or an old sail. Baking time takes about two hours. The bakers eaten in the order it is uncovered clams first and chickens last. We always provide a whole lobster for each person, and a quart of clams, and usually don't have enough. Once, a few years ago, a Russian brought by a friend at 20 lobsters. He simply grabbed a lobster, twisted the tail and pulled out the meat and ate it grandly, throwing away the claws and the body. There are incidentals at the bake's clam broth. For instance, and brown bread and butter. Something to drink, and dessert. The broth is made, 
by steaming a bushel of clams in a big kettle with a cupful of water over the fire made of the raked off wood. This takes about 20 minutes and is ready by the time the cocktails are finished. For a drink with the bake we usually have softy drinks and beer, unless it is a wedding bake, or a 220 very fancy one, when we have champagne. We consider watermelon or some other fruit the best dessert, but sometimes we sink solo, as to have ice cream cones. My father always used to insist on having Johnny cakes and cider with a clam bake, but he always had both for dinner every night and Johnny cakes for breakfast every morning. Every meal that he ate at home he had Johnny cakes. Dot. They were, incidentally, the first food father and mother had, after they arrived at Cedar Spring on their honeymoon. Father made them in the fireplace that first evening, for there was no stove. Johnny cakes are a ritual, just as a clam book is. First of all, the white corn meal must come and be ground very slowly, so that the millstones do not get hot, and burn the meal. To make the perfect Johnny cake, two-thirds of last year's meal and one-third of this year's is used. To use all this year's meal makes it too moist. The meal, with some salt, is put in a pottery bowl and heated red hot, either in the oven, or over a fire. It must be so hot, that a slight crust forms on top. While the meal is heating, a soapstone or 221 iron griddle should also be heated, and a kettle of water set to boil. Any fat bacon, lard, butter, etc. can be used on the griddle. After the meal is red hot, and the water is actively boiling, the water should be poured onto the meal a little at a time and stirred in. The meal should be kept on the stove, or as near the fire as possible, for it must not be allowed to chill. When the water and meal are well mixed the more stirring, or beating the better the meal should be soft enough, to drop off a spoon. When the griddle is red hot, and covered with a very thin air film of grease, the top of the meal, should be scraped with a large spoon and dropped onto the griddle. The cake should never be patted, or touched until it is turned over to be cooked on the other side. The meal should always be scraped off the top. And when the first batch of cakes is on the griddle it should be beaten up again, and the top scraped for the next batch, and so on. All this trouble is worthwhile, for the Johnny cakes will be light as air, and the crust will melt in one's mouth. We were very particular about our cider too. 222 no wormy apples were allowed every apple was carefully picked, and the straw used in the press was clean and changed every time. We were sure that the pressing was never hard enough to break the apple seeds. We thought the best cider apples were Gravenstein, and the best eating apples Baldwin's, or seek no further. The sweet cider was nectar, with the loveliest aroma. The hard cider was pure, and dusty wrong, and the apple jack had a cake that nothing else could equal. Apple jack is simply the part of hard cider that doesn't freeze when hard cider is frozen, the part that freezes is thrown away. At the clambics we always sing, and it is fascinating how our guests change the type and tempo of the songs. When we have with Fen Booth boys we of course have charming close harmony. Southern friends mean Dixie and such like songs. On the rare time in the past, when we were only family, or had old fashion guests comma comma we sang the standard old tunes and mother's dear voice rang out with every word of every verse of Johnny Sands, the flying trapeze, in the gloaming, the Spanish cavalier, tell me, Kynesia, seeing Nelly home, now the day, is over, home on the 223 range, when day is done, etc. One apostrophe it is always beautiful at our clambic place, but when the moonlight is on the water it is very lovely to sit looking at the ocean, singing with friends, and being at peace with the world. 224 Chapter 42 Memories of Food Who Come Doth Ambition Shun, and Loves to Live Will THL Son, Seeking the Food He Eats, and Pleased With What He Gets, Shakespeare Such Quantities of Everything. In the Fall, Getting Ready for Winter and Collecting All the FOOD For, To Be Stored Took Much Planning, and Lots of Arguing and Arranging. Our Cellar at Cedar Spring Was Large and under the high windows along the south side f the cellar were the barrels of molasses, 
hard cider, sweet cider, salt pork, and oysters in their shells. The oysters were the last things put in the cellar, and winter was really at hand, when my father and Ben and Pete carried the big barrel of oysters and seaweed down cellar. Every Sunday the oysters were fed a hand comma full of bran and they made a sucking noise eating quite plain to be heard. Whether the ones on the bottom of the barrel got any bran, I don't know, but as the ones on top were the first eaten, their turn came soon enough. Pete would ask Ben if he 225 had given the oysters the assos. He was so kind-hearted that he didn't want even oysters to go hungry. It was Ben's job to attend to the barrels and open oysters and buy dot ck out the salt pork. Once during a party my father took some men down cellar to get some more oysters and show them how the oysters were fed and they fed the bran to the salt pork barrel. Mother didn't stop teasing father about that for weeks. It didn't seem to hurt the salt pork any. We had hams and bacon hanging in a wine room and the barrel of Medford drum was locked in there too. Housekeeping was easier then. For the same day every week we would have the same thing. Every Saturday night dinner consisted of oysters, or little necks in the months with no R, on the half shell. Then a clear soup, then broiled live lobsters, a green vegetable, and of course Johnny cake. And Indian pudding with thick cream for dessert. Sunday dinner was always a thick soup. Roast beef with grated horseradish and cream and a green vegetable. Yorkshire pudding, and floating island with jelly on the islands. Thursday lunch was roast chicken, and that night cook's night out cold chicken, always so dot good. 226 to 43 Newport exhibit next summer Newport Rhode Island, is to have an exhibition in the old state house of Chinese articles that were or could have been brought home by clipper ships. Remembering a previous exhibition in the lovely setting of the old state house, this one should be charming and well worth seeing. We first heard of it a few weeks ago when a letter came from a Newport lady asking if she might see our Chinese things and could she call either Friday or Saturday of next week. Dr. Cates, curator of Chinese art at the Brooklyn Museum, was to come with her and he could only come on one of these days. I unfortunately had engagements in Boston of long standing for both days, so wrote and asked Miss Wetmore if she cared to come when I was not home. She didn't the date was made. I asked my nephew if he would show Miss Wetmore and Dr. Cates around and told him what I thought would interest him. The week before Dr. Cates and Miss Wetmore 227 were to come had been unusually busy. The maid who keeps my house presentable was ill and away. I woke that Friday morning with the sickening feeling that my house was really unpresentable and that I must take the 10 o'clock train to Boston. I rushed downstairs, swallowed a cup of coffee, and for two hours hid things. I hope no other housewife sinks so low. I had three grandchildren visiting me. The two big ones left for school at 8.30, but neater. The three-year-old stayed with me, and was entranced with what was going on. Fear, Granny, she would crow, and hand me ashtrays which we emptied, faded flowers which we burned in the fireplace, magazines, toys, rubbers, gloves, etc. In fact, all the misplaced articles of a much lived in and neglected house. I hurriedly swished the dust from one place to another, and put all the things I could not put in their own places, for lack of time into an obscure closet, and closed the door. Nita watched me put her beloved dirty doll with no arms into the closet and said gleefully, Doll all gone all gone doll. Nice Nita to help Granny, said. I will 228 bring you a present from Boston. Bubble gum, she said hopefully. Two rooms were done. I hope Miss Wetmore's eyesight was not too keen, and I knew Dr. Cates was artistic. So we left that and went into the back room. I heard voices behind me. For heaven's sake, what are you doing? You'll catch your death of cold. Why don't you get dressed? I thought you were taking the 10 o'clock train to Boston. What is Nita eating? The husband and son stood in the door on their way to the office. 
Please don't bother me and go away. I have got to slick this place up before I go to Boston, for some people are coming to find Chinese things, said. Find Chinese things? What do you mean, said my son, and, when I did not answer? Well, happy hunters. The husband looked too disapproving to speak, and they left. I looked around the back room appraisingly. It wasn't too bad. I spied a box on the sofa. It was our handy box and held nails, screws, bent pins, some wire, a bulb, a broken hammer, gold roses off 229 the dining room mirror, glue with no top on the can, and the brush head stuck to the can, and all head stuck to the bottom of the box, a bent screwdriver, picture hooks, half a tape measure, etc. I did not even notice that the box was Chinese. It had been the handy box, as long as I could remember, and I had been using it the night, before trying to mend Nita's doll. I picked it up, and slid it under the sofa, and gave it a little kick inches, so it did not show. There, Nita. We are finished, and you are a darling, to help Granny.11 good girl, said Nita. Yes, you are a good girl. Quote we went slowly upstairs. It was 9.20. I called my nephew. I must hurry, dear, and I think the downstairs is presentable. Nita and I have fixed it as best we can. Tell Miss Wetmore and Dr. Cates I am so sorry not to see them. I have dusted the Sangbibi Ufvars. I am sure that is what they will want for the exhibition. And those clippership paintings on the stairs. Don't worry, called Lecky. We will look after them, won't we? Neat question mark 11 when I got home, that night Licky was very non-committal about the visit said, how delightful Miss Wetmore was really grand dame, and that 230 Dr. Kate spoke Chinese, and knew everything about China. Yes, but did they want the sang to be oof vars, or what? No, they did not want the vase comma feet he said, and began to laugh. Back quote well, I might as well tell you, he said. This is his story. Miss Wetmore came punctually, and sat in the parlor and was charming. Dr. Cates came a little later. He came by train. All went well. Nita was good as gold sitting on the floor playing with a box of matches. Ttne child is good, if they have a box of matches. How could you let her? Said. Well, I was right there watching her, he said. Then Miss Wetmore and Dr. Kate said they would walk around the house. They spoke politely of certain things, and wanted the sewing table in the parlor, that belonged to Grandmother Candler, and when we came in the library Nita rushed to the closet, hung on the doorknob, and said, Doll, doll, my doll. I never thought not to, and opened the door. It really is a mess. Why were all those tennis and skiing clothes? And those broken dishes 231 there question mark told Anita rushed in, and dragged that terrible doll out and was happy. Dr. Kate said, I am sorry, if your aunt wanted this kept duck, but now that we have seen it could I look at those china trees on that shelf? He wants those trees and that vase with the little boys on it that is on the floor, and that old red and black screen. T.I. was speechless. What else happened? I asked. Well, we went into the back room, and Nita took Dr. Cates by the hand, got down on the floor, and pointed under the sofa, and said, See, I T T C. Dr. Cates crawled under too, and pulled out that old box, said it was the best thing in the house, emptied all the truck that was in it into a waste paper basket, stuck a piece of paper over the glue, and made me promise to take care of it until it goes to the exhibition. See, there it is. I put it on the piano. What is so precious about it, he asked. Why didn't you ask Dr. Cates? Said. 232 Chapter 44 Why I am happy in Emma Felix Vivers, may you have a happy life. Now that I have reached four score years I am alarmed at not having told my beloved fellowman one of the sources of my happiness. Almost every day someone says to me, you are the happiest person I ever saw. It or why are you so happy? Years ago a discerning and observing man, Henry D. Sleeper, 
at whose beautiful place in East Gloucester my husband and I were visiting, said to me, I have been watching you since you came, and I think you are really the only perfectly happy person I ever knew. I made reply, why will nighty I be happy you are giving us such a lovely time, and you know how I adore your exquisite taste, and the beauty of this place. No, that's not it, it is something in you, but I felt sure you would not tell me. I wish I had, but as always I was shy, and knew I would be laughed at as I was whenever I did try to talk about it. 233 Dean Philemon F. Sturges, one of my husband's and my best friends, said when I tried to tell him of my Chicago experience, no asterisk I on go psychic, you are not the type. Say your prayers night and morning, send your children to Sunday school, and be good to Frank. That I saw duty in Luffy quote now Dean Sturges and Harry Sleeper are both gone, and many like them who have thought me happy, but if before I go I can make one person a little more contented, and give one soul a little lift, and be less afraid to die, I will feel repaid, and grateful to my Heavenly Father for making me so happy, and giving me such a wonderful life and experiences. After my first daughter was born, I had what were called postpartum hemorrhages. Later it was discovered I was a partial hemophiliac. My blood coagulated imperfectly in 18 minutes. Normal blood takes I think 5 to 8 minutes to coagulate. I was young, and the baby was big and fat. The doctors and two nurses did everything possible to stop the hemorrhages. But, after trying frantically for a long time dear Dr. Mitchell said shakily to a nurse, tell her husband she has gone, and he fell sobbing on its knees beside my bed putting his poor head on my hand. He had worked over me for two days. 234 at that moment I felt myself leave my quivering, pain-racked body. I was free and floating upward. I looked down, and saw myself white as chalk with the sobbing doctor beside me. Then the walls and ceiling of my room disappeared and I was in a place of such beauty and radiance, that it defies description. Everything was happy and serene. I was being welcomed and longed for by beings who loved me, and wanted me to come. There was no comma dot hurry. I just hung in space in a divine enchantment of well-being and contentment. As I was floating far away, I looked down again at myself and the kneeling doctor, and I saw the door open to let my husband in. I was very far away, and they looked so small, then my baby cried and my father was there up high in the sky. He had died ten years before, and been ill and gaunt and haggard. Now he was young and handsome and so happy. He held his dear arms open to me with longing, but he shook his head and looked down at my little family. I knew from him, although he spoke, not that my work here was not done, and that I must go back but I felt I could not go into my most unattractive form. I tried with all my willpower again and again. I would go down semicolon then I would float off again into the 235 peace and glory of the heavenly vision. Every time I floated up it was more alluring and I wanted more to go to my father, but although his dear face was loving and tender it was stern and quite severe. I must go back. I was told afterward that for dot dot over twenty minutes I was dead. There were no heart stimulants or injections in those days, and only my father's firm determination sent me back. I hovered over my body for some time, but I sensed approval for what I was doing not only from my father, but from others of the heavenly throng. I do not know when I entered my body, but it was with such a jolt and jar, that I felt sure the doctor and nurses and my husband would hear, but they did not. It was some time before they noticed. Then dear Miss Falvey cried, why she breathes. One thing I have not told was that, while I was floating, my body seemed to tingle in ecstasy. I have been a happily married woman for years, and know the pleasures and delights of married life, comma, colon, but this was greater far for permanence and bliss seemed to enter, and I was conscious that immortality and peace forever were at hand. Is it any wonder, that I am happy, when I have this knowledge of what awaits us after death? 
236 I uninspiring my next experience is very I was sitting under an apple tree on our farm in Wickford. I was peeling apples for a pie, and every now, and then I I for old stop, and pray a little. I love to pray out of doors. It seems so near heaven, and is the nearest I can get to the radiance I once saw. I was praying for many things, the end of World War I this was in July of 1918 the recovery of my mother from illness, safety for my dear sister married to a German, and also for a son we now had four darling daughters. I looked up and there for the fraction of a second, was the radiance I fell on my knees, thank you, dear God, I cried it was gone. Suppose I was too eager, perhaps if I had sat quietly, I don't know, Three full house underscore two hundred and thirty seven full house full house you tilde tilde forty five chapter one six war december the seventh nineteen forty one wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding it proverbs Molly I telephoned frantically don't tell mother but the most terrible thing has happened the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and sunk a lot of ships I will be right over. She knows already, Maram. We were listening to the radio and heard everything. I rushed to mother in her little old house just around the next corner from full house. There she sat, pale and composed, her only sign of agitation the clasping and unclasping of her hands which rested in her lap. Since the one tilde American she has not been strong and has come to Providence every winter. How good of you to come at once, dear. She greeted me. Isn't this news terrible? Of course. It means a world war. I did hope to escape another one whom do we know in Honolulu now? Molly tells me her sister Nellie's boy is a sailor there. Full house, full house, was I there twenty or twenty-one years ago? Twenty-one, I think, mother. You came home to be with me before Buddy was born, and he is nearly twenty-one. So he is, dear. How time does fly. Ours or Lally's already in, the C.RV now. Suppose the authors will go too. She was quite right. All the boys enlisted and left soon. I am so glad you had that lovely trip to Wyoming with Buddy this summer, Mother went on. We had motored out after Buddy's graduation from Harvard. You will always remember it and he will never be a boy again. Dot. Dot war makes the young old so quickly. Grandma said it took her 15 years after the Civil War to be young again. She was always ashamed, for nearly all the men in the family bought substitutes and sent them to war in their place. Many of them said they felt it their duty to stay home, look after their families and businesses, and to hire young unemployed men to fight for them. They said money was needed more than anything to keep the war going, but I think they were afraid. In our big family only Uncle Charles, the doctor, and Uncle Will, a daredevil, went. 231 Full House Full House Do you remember Herbert Harris, and the trouble he was always causing us for yes, mother? Why? Well, he was the man my father sent in his place. He was wounded badly, and felt we all owed him a living, and everything else ever after. How he made us suffer. Don't tell me he was the man who married Aunt Sue. T. Of course he was comma eleven, said Mother. And he was a terror. But he had been brave, and indirectly saved your grandfather's life, so we gave him all we could, and forgave him his many indiscretions again and again. Can you remember their wedding? You were only a baby, I don't see how you can. T. I was four, and carried a nice bunch of flowers, said. I remember it well Dottie and I will never forget his screaming with pain, when he tried to nail on the white satin cushion as the minister told him to. Yes, I recalled, and he yelped. My God! I've got a cramp, and jumped all around the room on one leg point one T, so he did comma eleven agreed mother. I had forgotten that. He also insisted on not cutting the wedding cake, full house full house but taking it hold on the back seat of the carry all as they started off on their wedding trip. Aunt Sue must have had a terrible time with him, said. Well, she was 62 when she was married, and she had always wanted a man, so I suppose she knew her own mind. Dot. 
Dot she seemed happy enough, mother added, the time I went to see her in Peterborough. Herbert was to meet me at the station, but was late. I stood waiting when I saw a cloud of dust coming up the road. Herbert came lickety cut around the corner so fast, that the poor horse fell on her side, tipped the wagon over, and spilled him out. He got up, turned the runabout right side up, helped the horse up by sitting on its head for a minute, straightened out the harness, then climbed in again, nonchalantly. He brushed his hat off with his sleeve, put it on, then took it off with a flourish and greeted me. Glad to see you, Nita, he said. He had never dared call me anything but Miss Nita, or Mrs. Backer B6 if it was a shop tree or member he was family, but Aunt you seemed happy enough and awfully proud of being Mrs. Poor thing. I only stayed one night. Mother said, please come home with me full house full dot house tonight. I want to have you near me, and we can sit in front of come the fire and talk. Perhaps some of the children will telephone. They will all be terribly upset at this news. Molly can go and see how Nellie is, can't she? Quote mother asked. Of course she can. I love so to take care of you. TL Molly was my children's nurse for many years, and now is taking loving care of mother, who is 86. We walked slowly back to our house. I have never become accustomed to Frank's, and my living in our old house with no children except for occasional visits. Buddy is not married, but is in law school and away a great deal. We sat cosily in front of the fire, but felt we had to listen to the horrors coming over the radio. Tina telephoned from Long Island. Her voice trembled as calm as she said that Dev was enlisting at once in the Air Force. They had just moved into their first home, and had one baby boy. Dev graduated last spring from law school and had just started work in New York with a large law firm. Life had seemed so rosy for them, and now this had come. I begged her to come home, as soon as Dev left. Dot dot point to the right parenthesis, full house full house Z77 tilde I look back on that night as the last normal night for many years. Things happened so fast after that. The girls and their babies all came home, one by one. We were so delighted to have them, and thankful that we had a place to welcome them to. I adored having little child run under our roof again and so did Frank. Mother came every afternoon for tea, and to play with the babies. They all adored her, and she seemed to understand them better than anyone else. Dot we have big red sofas and a red rug in our back room where we have tea, and the picture of the lovely little old lady with the snow white hair sitting surrounded by children grandchildren and greet grandchildren is very sweet. She was so gentle and understanding. Full house full house underscore Z786 chapter first daughter. Neat curiouser and curiouser, said Alice. During the war I heard an observation many times, that was supposed to be funny, namely, that this was the grandmother's war, and would last, as long as the grandmother held out. I would smile agreeably, but it made me think. I am sure that our experience in this war was the same as thousands of families. But one forgets so soon. I want to remember the pain and the joy, the happy and the sad, and the ridiculous things that have happened. Full house isn't large. From the number of people in it during the war, one would think it enormous our four daughters, four grandchildren at the beginning and nine at the end, two nurses, plus an extra one. When there was a new baby, four maids, a chauffeur, Riley the dog, Bizer the cat, the husband, and I. The girls are now all married, and their weddings took placky within the space of two and a half years. I don't know how we ever managed. For years my nightmare was an ogre whose name was Wedding Expenses. I had made up my mind that, when my daughters were my full house full house it cried. Even if they did not have a clergyman they would each have a good mink coat. They each have, and I have never felt to wrong decision. Dot. Dot I have never had one myself, comma dot L dot though point one almost did once. The husband, just before we were engaged, went to Canada on a business trip, 
and wrote that he could get me a good mink coat like one his client had bought for his wife, Commodot, if I wanted it. I was very busy, and didn't read the letter, nor answer it, and to this day I am still waiting for that mink coat. Frank knew I wanted a mink coat more than life itself, and he really needed no answer. I hope he reads this. When Mary Sharp was so badly burned by an exploding kettle at Wilhelmina West's coming out party, and her husband and I carried her up the back stairs to the third floor of the West's house, and put her in agony into a cool water bath, the one thing she thought of was the Harvard Yale football game coming in a few weeks. Her nephew was to play and get his H. She went to the game in her nightgown and her mink coat, and was none the worse. Telling of the nightgown and mink coat dot makes me think of all the work I used to do, before I got dressed in the morning. While my children were little, and later in full house full house day school, Frank got an obscure nerve trouble which caused him great pain, and he went to bed. We had doctor after doctor. He thought he was never going to get well, and that we would have no money, and he told me to discharge all the servants. We had in us, a useful man, laundress, and cook. With dears on all sides I let everyone go but Mary Murphy, the cook. I expected her to announce that she couldn't stay either, but instead, she hugged me and said, sure and the rest of dot them are more bother than it worth. We'll get on all right. And we did. I ate with the children and after supper, while I was upstairs with Frank, who was still in bed, Mary would put a red and white check tablecloth on the kitchen table, and all the children would sit around it and do their homework. Mary was so good at arithmetic that she taught the children, and the teachers were surprised at their rapid progress. After I had given Frank his supper, and bathed dot the children or seen, that they bathed themselves, put them to bed, and done a good size washing in the bathtub, I was ready for bed too. I never knew why it seemed easier, and kind of dejidge, to wash in the bathtubs instead of our well-ordered laundry. We consulted doctors in Europe and hear about full house full house I and our Frank, and I finally went to a nerve specialist in New York. I was pretty tired and a little haggard by that time, while Frank looked rested and handsome from his three months rest in bed, so when we went into the doctor's office he looked pityingly at me and said, Cancer you are suffering. Tell me about it. Oh, no, said. It is my husband who is he looked solemnly at us both, read all the data sent him by our home doctors, then said, I have no cure or treatment to offer you, but I have a sugestine which may help. Always have your breakfast in bed. Move around as little as possible before eating good breakfast. The stimulation to the nerves and keeping warm until you have eaten sometimes helps. That was all. We paid him $100 and left, and it was the best money we ever spent. Comma Frank in all the following years has never had a bad attack, but he would never stay alone upstairs in the morning. I used to dress the children, see that comma they ate their breakfast, find rubbers and mittens, etc., get them off to school, and tear around in my wrapper and nightgown, then take Frank's breakfast to him, along with mine. It was relaxing and I did unconsciously get full H.O.U.S.E. till the full house 18's rested. Mary helped and understood. Now, of course, I am so lazy, that breakfast in bed is second nature. I do all my housekeeping, telephoning, and even the writing of these scraps warm and comfortable in bed, with an open fire purring on the hearth, and Frank reading comfortably in his room, with the door open between his and mine and exchanging news and comments with me. We have breakfast fairly early, so the day is not too far gone, when he gets to his office or I to any M.E.E. tildering or engagement I might have. We are still a little ashamed, and do not like to be teased by the children at being so lazy. But as my father used to say, the he sick you sussest, tibi utto possessed facto, face. So is it requisite for me? Do thou as needful is for thee, Terence. Ho! Oh, to go back to my daughters I am glad they have had their happiness, and their splendid husbands and babies. Not even walk and take that from them, and as my grandfather Candler used to say, 
the future is uncertain, the present is usually unsatisfactory, comma, comma, but the past is your own. They have had at least a little past. I have always heard that the relation of 27 tilde full house full house mother-in-law to son-in-law in my case sons-in-law was very difficult. Probably it is, but life has crowded us, so that we have not had time for reservations and enmities, and I feel toward my sons-in-law as I do toward my dear brother they are the handsomest, most charming men of my acquaintance, and how my daughters ever got them is a mystery. Of course, we had some bad moments. Nita was really spoiled. She seemed to have a way with her, and how Frank and I worried. We thought that she was going to marry, among others, an atwit with millions, a divorce, a degenerate with a famous name, a great athlete with no brains, a bandmaster, a German prince, a lifeguard, not a bad sort, a clergyman who had taken the vow of celibacy, but said he would give it up, a charming youth. Dot, son of a dear friend, who had spent years in our mental hospital, and whose parents fervently believed that Nita was just the thing for him. Eventually the dear boy had to return to the hospital neither she, nor anyone else could help him. And then she married the one man we would have chosen, and is radiantly happy with her handsome, six-foot-six lawyer husband, Charles Fox Hovey. In June, 1941, six months before Pearl Harbor, Charlie volunteered for the Naval Reserve. He had Al. Question mark comma left parenthesis F full house full house one and four ways been interested in boats, and had sailed every kind since a child. His father had owned many racing yachts, including the type which used to defend the America's Cup, and Charlie developed in his youth an uncanny knack of knowing the time, tide and wind, and could get to the starting line just as the gun went off. He was invaluable to the defenders. Charlie was commissioned as a lieutenant at the time he volunteered in June, but was not called to active duty until August. Like so many thousands of young couples with the shadow of war just beginning to darken over them, Nita and he took a last vacation together. They went to Maine, to the Rangeley Lakes region, where they fished, hiked and swam in the most out-of-the-way places they could find. They had visited friends on the way up, and were given many farewell parties. On the way back they arrived in Holderness, to visit Charlie's aunt and uncle, Jenny, and Ned Webster, and Charlie's orders, which had been forwarded, were waiting for him. He and Nita rushed back to Boston. Charlie went into uniform, and received his first assignment, as a recruiting officer, aboard the USS North Station. They moved into our recently inherited Commonwealth Avenue house and lived together, while Charlie remained in Boston. It was a short, 15 full house full house 48 exclamation point our mile moved from Brookline Finita, but before the war was over Charlie saw duty in the Mediterranean, and the Pacific and Nita moved 32 times. Many of her moves were uneventful, but her trip to San Francisco and back when Charlie was stationed briefly on the west coast, before going on duty in the Pacific, had its share of typical wartime difficulties. She took the two babies to San Francisco with her, after a great deal of delay in getting accommodations. We finally secured two staterooms on a train, and I went to the station to see them off. They had the usual luggage of a mother and nurse with two children, one of them an infant in arms 26 pieces in all, including sterilizer, toy de chair, go-kart, ice box, hat box, bags of every known type, and a big yellow rabbit. Little Ben was two years old, and baby Candy was five weeks. Just before the train was due to start, the conductor came up and said, I'm sorry, but we're not taking your car. You have to low was in car 256, why? I almost shouted. You can't do this. They have a new baby and my daughter must see her husband, before he goes to the Pacific. And then, overriding the truth in my eagerness, to make a good case full house full house 186 for Nita, I added, she hasn't seen him in nearly two years. It well, said Dr. He conductor, looking at the baby, he's in for a good surprise. The Pullman took them only as far as New York, 
and they had to change to a coach. Barney the nurse and the children occupied one seat, and need to share hers with a female marine and a sailor that is, the three of them took turns, one standing and two sitting. This went on for the almost 48 hours that the train took to crawl to Chicago. The children not only endured it, but seemed to enjoy it, thank goodness. They were lucky enough to get a plane from Chicago all the rest of the way and flew overnight, arriving in San Francisco at 6 a.m. Charlie met them, having come ashore at 4.30 a.m. to reach the airport. When they came back two months later they flew all the way, but were bumped of F quote F five times, because of priorities once at Harrisburg, so near home. In the middle of the night, they waited eight hours and luckily got a morning plane that took them to New York, from where it was an easy joint home. After his duty in Boston, Charlie went to Yorktown to mine warfare school, and then was assigned full house full house 187 as executive officer to a newly commissioned ship at Hoboken Minnelaya which the men immediately nicknamed the SS Bullet, because it looked like a hen with its tail cut off. In the convoy going over, one ship was torpedoed by a German submarine, but the crossing was otherwise uneventful, although Charlie says now that he wonders why there were no collisions at night as the ships followed their monotonous blind zigzag course. From his Mediterranean duty Charlie has two vivid memories. One was the Christmas at Casablanca just after the invasion. There were thousands and thousands of servicemen, all with one thought in their memories of home. They had been bravely overlooking the season and acting as though they didn't know what month it was. But on Christmas Eve a convoy arrived, and all those thousands of suppressed and thinly disguised hopes rose as one man with the thought of mail and gifts and reminders of home. But the convoy arrived with no mail whatever, for anybody. Charlie said he will never forget the vast disappointment and depression that permeated the service personnel like an evil ground fog. Those thousands of fierce young daredevils were nothing but full house full house pathetically homesick boys. His second vivid memory is an incident in the Sicilian campaign. The Americans stormed the beach in Chile and were met by a division of German tanks roaring down from the heights above the town. The American cruisers and destroyers got the range and shot a barrage over the landing troops into the advancing tanks. After the initial American success, many barge loads of German prisoners, under guard of American soldiers, left the beach to be transported to the battleships. At this moment the Luftwaffe appeared, and began strafing the whole area. All the Germans in the barges, were wearing good iron helmets. Charlie was watching them, and as the German planes came into a position for an attack on the barges, the American soldiers with one accord picked the helmets off the prisoners' heads, and dropped them into the sea. They were not going to be killed, and let the Germans be sped if they could help it. After the Sicilian campaign the SS Bullet was assigned to the Pacific. When Charlie reached Pearl Harbor, however, he was ordered back to the Naval War College at Newport. We rejoiced to have him so near home again, and Nita and Charlie had a wonderful summer together. Full House Full House 1 and 9 Ben, their first child, was christened at this time. The christening took place in lovely old Trinity C.H.U.R.C. Tilda in Newport. It was a gay affair, the women in pretty summer dresses, and most of the men in white uniforms. After the ceremony, Charlie and Nita invited all the guests to their apartment on Mill St. The small quarters were filled to overflowing. Newport residents were so hospitable to the young people who lived there, while the men were at the Naval War College. They were invited to parties in the beautiful homes, welcome to all the clumps, and generally treated like visiting royalty. It is hard to believe that all Newport citizens were pleased at this war in flux, but they were certainly sporting about it, and the young people who had the privilege of living there have taken away happy kindly memories, and all want to go back. As Nita says, Newport is tops as a place to live. When his course at the War College was completed, Charlie was assigned as Chief Staff Officer of an Attack Transport Division in action in the Pacific. It took him six weeks to get aboard the flagship after an erratic pursuit by boat and plane. 
the Philippines' operations were just beginning, and everything was so secret, that even one's own ship was our full house for house 190 most impossible to locate. He finally caught up with it at Guadalcanal. In the Solomon Islands they rehearsed for the invasion of Okinawa, and then went north for action, landing the first marines. We knew nothing about it, of course, but the ship was so badly damaged, that it had to come into San Francisco for extended repairs. Nita, still assuming that Charlie was in the far Pacific, was astounded to receive a long-distance call one night from Charlie in San Francisco. He would be there for a long time, he said. She must come out, and bring the children. He had not yet seen Dot their second child. She went. This was the trip described a few pages above. When the ship was finally in condition, Charlie sailed westward again, but Japan capitulated, before they saw any action. They put in at Cebu, to pick up occupation troops for transportation to Japan. They made two of these trips, and Charlie had the good fortune, to ride in a jeep through Tokyo the day General MacArthur moved in. He brought me an exquisite peanut cloth table cover from Cebu. It is one of my most prized possessions. Full house, full house, one nine tilde one four seven chkterif second cutter. Tink yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born, not to shed a tear, I know now how thy joy we avert should come near. Percy Bysshe Shelley our second daughter Tina and her baby son came home just after Gladys's second little girl Priscilla was born. Her husband, Dev Milburn, was on leave from the Kerr Force, and brought them the very day Gladys and her baby came back from the maternity hospital in Boston. Nita and I had been closing the lone Boston house, getting Gladys and Priscilla, in a baby basket, and trying to reach home in time, to welcome the Milburn family, but they were here and settled in the front parlor when we arrived. Gladys's doctor had wanted her to stay in Boston at least another week before motoring home, but Nita and I knew what that house was with no screens and no ice box, and thought that anything would be better. That sizzling July the temperature die comma D not go below 90 day or night, while we were there. Our cook, Mary Murphy, met us with, sure, and where will you put the blessed babies? Full house, full house, IGT, she meant Gladys and Priscilla. My niece, Barbara, she went on to tell us, had come and brought two girls, tan they're taking a nap now till young Mr. Powell comes to dinner with two young gentlemen, and to take them to the prom at Brown afterwards. Dot, Dot and please, ma'am, where is Miss Barbara's white tall dress, didn't she take it the last time she went to Greenwich? I asked. Of course Mary did not know. Nita and I conferred, while getting Gladys and Priscilla settled, and felt sure, that Barbara had left the dresses behind on her last trip to Greenwich. Gladys then said that Barbara could wear a dress of hers, and kind Mary took the dress, and started away with it over her arm to have it pressed. As she left she said, TLL I'm glad you out a home, madam. We missed you. What will we have for dinner? There are four dot thirteen already, and no ice. The ice man is sick. Dot the idea, kind Mary, who has been my best friend for nearly thirty years. Nothing upsets her. She tackles every problem serenely. She never thinks of herself, only of others. What would I do without her? Frank telephoned to ask how we were getting on and announced that he had to go to the Hope Club with a client. Sam Powell and three other boys came full house full house 193, but decided they wanted to go out for dinner, and took Barbara and her friends with them. Tina went to play golf with Dev and they did not come home until Nita and I, alone at a table set for 143 try to appreciate Mary's fine dinner. I think I have few obsessions, but one is my front parlor. It is a beautiful room, with the door opposite the fireplace. Four windows with wooden shutters, an alcove, lovely wood carving, and a delicately executed overmantel. I have taken such pride in keeping the parlor nice and always clean and tidy. Of course I knew what was happening to the room when we moved the sofa from the alcove into the hall and put the big double bed in its place and put the desk 
My great grandfather is made in Newport in the hall. Two. Dot. Dot one reason our house is so well preserved is because it has always been lived in by poor people who could not afford to replace the old pine floors or put new brass locks and hinges on the doors instead of the old handmade iron ones. But although I knew what had happened to the parlor, it nevertheless hit me between the eyes the next morning when I realized that for a time it had gone. I went into the room and picked up wide awake full house full house 14 comma asterisk little dev and saw the big bed and baby dev's crib and high chair and fire engine and toy chest and endless toys in cozy disorder and Tina and dev sound asleep. Little dev. You know where of the ravages to my parlor, gurgled delightedly. I took him, gave him his breakfast and played with him air for an hour until Tina woke. Dev Milburn was a navigator in the Air Force. He went to flight officer's training school, to train as a pilot, but could not focus two objects on a table at the level of his eyes, which meant that he would never be able to judge the distance of planes coming towards him. So he washed out as a pilot. He is a fine athlete, plays polo and golf very well, and has a good eye for both, but evidently flying requires special sight. Hence he became a navigator. He is much too big to be a pilot in fact, he says he is always grammed in a plane anyway, and being in the Air Corps has taught him to hate flying forever. In helping Dev pack for transatlantic flights I used to be fascinated by his equipment. The Army has its failings, suppose, but the care and infinite precaution taken by the Air Force, to safeguard the men I know, has made me grateful. Their contour maps of the world are simply uncanny. That the direct way to Full House Full House VLRC tilde go to Paris from Wilmington, Delaware, is via Stephenville, Newfoundland, and the Azores, is astounding. I should think the new geography, to be taught children in years to come, will be radically different from all previous geography. These contour maps gave me a preview of what the new geography will be. While overseas, Dev had had a terrible case of athlete's foot, and had sat in a hospital for weeks with his feet in pails of Epsom salts. He said that if could only have had garbage pails he would have been alright, for the sores went up his legs beyond where the salts in the pails reached. He still walked gingerly, but was due to go off on a no third flight at once. He is so large and wholesome and friendly, and much too big for any plane. He said that he used to get so cramped he could hardly stand it, but then he would think of the way we used to jam little Dev who is also big and wholesome and friendly into his carriage or high chair or toy de chair, and he would laugh, knowing that if he could only get home to his loved ones he could stand anything. After that visit Dev left he again, and was gone 18 months. Tina second little boy poor little war casualty whose mother had had too much worry was born dead. Then Dev came home, and they had a lovely six full house full house colon tilde 96 a months in Florida. He was now in the ferry transport command. After Dev had left for another tour of duty overseas, Tina had adorable fat Jack. I have never sympathized much with fathers, while their children were being born, but now that I have taken the place of a father many times during this war, I do sympathize and appreciate how they agonize and suffer. Part of Dev's last tour of overseas duty was spent in Egypt, and he enjoys telling of a foolish party which in a group of US flight officers had in Cairo, while on leave from their station in the southern part of the country. They stayed at Shefford's Hotel and felt, while there that they were at the hub of the world. I remember feeling the same way, when there many years ago. The world and his wife seemed to be passing along the street in front of the big, comfortable hotel veranda. When Gladys and I were there we attended a beautiful ball at the Kedville's parlor, to a welcome for Lord Kitchener, who had just finished a victorious campaign in the Sudan. He was a wonderful looking person, and, like the few great people I have met, absolutely simple. He had very light blue eyes and white teeth, and was down to a dark bronze, so full house full house 197, that his eyes and teeth just glistened. He did not dance at least not with us, and we were disappointed. But there were lots of other British verfices who did, and we had a good time. 
we found Egypt a perfectly wonderful and hurtling place, regardless of the history and the monuments. The moonlight on the desert is heartbreakingly beautiful, and if the Nile is in the picture it is unbelievable. Picnics in the moonlight were quite the rage. A great friend of ours, an American girl, Maud Watrous, met a British officer, Colonel Grace Brooks, that winter and married him the following winter at home. We were bridesmaids. Their romance was a great interest, and while he was courting her, he gave us soul parties, and introduced us to many charming people. How I run on. I had started to tell of Dev's party. Dot. Dot the ridiculous thing that happened was that after a six-day part why Dev and his friends were terrified at the thought of the hotel bill. They decided to draw lots to determine which one should pay it was better for one to be stony broke, they decided, than for all to feel the pinch. A round of drinks was ordered to toast the decision. When the whiskey and soda came, one bottle of soda had a big moose in it. The moose is so big, how full house full house 1.99 it ever got into the sealed bottle is the greatest mystery. It just doesn't seem possible, but there it is. I have seen it. Of course all the officers wanted that bottle with the mouse, so they had to draw more lots. Dev got the moose and still has it. Poor Paul Cook got the hotel bill, which he gallantly paid. After Dev came back on leave from that duty, he was ordered to stay on this side of the Atlantic and make his flights from the United States. He was stationed in Wilmington and Tina joined him there, where they rented a house. Tina was miserably ill again, and in bed eight months. I would go to visit her, and as soon as I would return to Providence her kind, efficient doctor would telephone and suggest that I come back. Fortunately I was usually free, for Frankie and Gladys and Nita were still with their father. The doctor wanted me with Tina when Dev was on an overseas mission. Dev was due to make a flight every six weeks, and would be gone anywhere from 5 to 21 days. The starting time was usually 2 a.m. The mental strain of waiting for Dev to take off was very great. When a flight was due he would full house full house first pack, and then walk about and play with the children, and give Tina and me last minute instructions. The car simonized. Pay my racket club bill when it comes. Tell Dad to bet on Redbird for me in the Preakness. Tell Catherine we want her beach wagon. Dot. Dot ask Honey Porter to enter me in the golf tournament on the 18th. He and I would have dinner together all his favorite food, while Tina lay sick and white upstairs. He would entertain me with his goings on at St. Paul's School or at Oxford, and the evening would drag on. Finally, about midnight, the telephone would ring. Dev would answer it and then announce. Grounded. The old man didn't get here. The old man would refer to the high-ranking officer or celebrated person they were taking overseas. It was Dev's duty, as navigator, to pay attention to the route they flew, and IT was his responsibility to judge when they should turn back or go ahead if anything went wrong. The wind, the amount of gasoline, the conditions of the motors all had to be taken into account. He said he would always heave a sigh of relief when they passed the halfway mark to their destination and had more than half a tank full of gas and it was shorter and quicker to go ahead than to return. Full house, full house to Gar. After he got his message we would all go to bed and the next day the same routine would start over again. Sometimes it would go on for five days and nights. Many times, after he had gone to the field with his equipment, I would hear him return to the house, and hear Tina's little cry of pleasure as he came into their room. Once earlier in the war, when they were in Asheville, he left to be gone on three weeks temporary duty overseas. They said goodbye every day for at least four days. After she had driven him to the field for certainly the last time, she came back to town and went to the movies alone. She was sitting there lonely and forlorn when she was aware of someone slipping into the seat beside her. This person then reached over and gave her a bear hug. It was Dev. That night he put her on the train to come home to me, and then he really left around 3 a.m. 
The new baby was born in Wilmington, and was another fat little boy or darling named Frank after my two Franks. The only person disappointed was Dev3. We had foolishly talked of a baby sister, and when he saw Frank he said, Yes, he's alright, but where is Dina? Zoo Full House Full House 249 TQ Tilda Chapter 1 GR Third Daughter Gladys when we do not find peace of mind in ourselves, it is useless to seek it elsewhere. Point one one underscore Lara Chafau called, that this terrible war should have been called a grandmother's war seems most inappropriate. All the grandmothers and grandfathers I know, have been peace-loving, hard-working people, eating their hearts out over the boys away, and the broken homes of their children. Our daughter, Gladys, one of the twins, and her baby daughter, Pebble, came home to us five years ago. Just for a show. RT visit comma comma dot mother, Gladys said. Arnie is sure, that doctors will not be taken right out of internships. There are so many older doctors who want to go. If Arnie was overseas more than three years, and except for a five-day leave, when Pebble was two and a half, he had seen her only in early infancy. She was born in Boston. Arnie was interning at a Boston hospital at the time, and wanted his chief, to officiate at the birth. At about the time Priscilla, Gladys, second child, was due, my daughter Nita and I went to Boston QJ67 Full House Full House to us with Gladys, and stayed in a closed winter home of a kind cousin who lent us the house. The house on Commonwealth Avenue which Frank inherited had been sold. It was the hottest July possible. There was no icebox, it had gone to Prout's neck with the family, and no screens. We waited three weeks for that fat baby, and to this day I hate the smell of flit. We had to be covered with it day and night. Priscilla looked just like her mother, and is a beauty blue eyes, and yellow hair and a will of her own. Arnie and his family have been lifelong friends of ours, and years ago, when he had his fifth birthday party, his mother invited Nita and Tina, but said plainly, that she could not ask the three-year-old twins. I dressed the big girls, who were five and six then, and set off with them to the party. The twins came along in dirty play suits. It didn't matter how they looked, for I intended to bring them right back home with me. All Teehee children arrived at the same time, and in the confusion of getting into the house the twins crawled under the arms of the bigger ones and disappeared. When I finally found them, they made such a racket at being taken away that Mrs. Porter said, Never mind. Put these big bibs on them. There's full house full house underscore twenty four tilde tilde plenty of ice cream, and you really need you here to help me, as Bridget is sick, and Mrs. Harrington couldn't come. TD there comma was plenty to do, and it was a fine party. We played all the children's games we knew blind man's buff. London Bridge is falling down, pin the tail on the donkey, and after a while we played forfeits, so that everyone would have to sit down, and be quiet for at least a minute. The twins, full of ice cream, were sitting sleepily on a sofa at the back of the room, their fat legs stuck out straight. When Annie's turn came to bow to the pretty comma comma for you, kneel to the wittiest, and kiss the one he loved the best, to his mother's and my surprise he went over to Gladys. No, dear, said his mother, she's not in the party. Choose one of the other little girls sitting in the ring. You know I like her the best, he said and kissed her grimy little face, made a polite bow, and knelt down. From the bits of his letters I am allowed to hear today, I am convinced that he has never changed his mind. The last letter was written from Berlin, on Adolf Hitler's writing paper a perfectly plain, full house full house to e four splendid quality paper with the name in gold on the left, and a place for the date on the right. Goring's paper, the letter before last, was very ornate a big crest, and lots of gold lettering to proclaim his importance. Arnie's first overseas assignment was in Ireland at an RAF station as post surgeon for an American detachment. He was told that he was to take over a hospital. When he arrived he found a small Nissan hut in a cow pasture under three feet of water. It rained all the time. The hut was 12 by 8 feet, 
and in it was an office, dental or barber chair. Point nine a treatment room, and two beds, no electricity, no water, no sterilizing equipment or supplies, and two enlisted medical corps men who had had no direct orders to sweep the floor, refused to do it, and had to be sent outside the hut every day, to fi to tout. One of these men, was a private with an IQ of about 50, and comma the other was a sergeant engaged to a girl in Belfast. The private, whose duty it was to sweep the floor, did nothing except write about 15 letters a day to people in the USA telling them to keep smiling, that he was keeping them flying. He had never been in a plane, and was offered a ride once to 174 house full house to Tilda, but was afraid to go. Arnie had to censor his 15 letters a day. Once in a while, if they got a patient, they quickly sent him to a hospital, so they could lie in the beds themselves. Arnie was a well-trained surgeon. This was the most surgery he got in his four years in the army. His living quarters on this post consisted of an ice and hut the same size as the other, but this one was four feet underwater. It was shared by three other officers. Whoever got up first in the morning took the cleanest, driest clothes. They slept in sleeping bags, and one night after too much Irish whiskey Arnie, and a brother Ruffus named Murphy got in the same bag, but didn't know it until the following morning. Murphy, an ardent Roman Catholic, loved to visit neighboring families. He didn't like the Protestant chaplain the only minister on the post, and would pretend he was a priest. Once he went to visit an Irish family who lived in a nearby bog. He told the old woman, bedridden from rheumatism, that he was a Roman Catholic priest, and she was so pleased and honored, that she got right out of bed and walked. He was terrified and rushed to Belfast to confession to Full House Full House to at get his clearance, as he said. The latrine at the quarters, was 100 yards away from the hut across the pond of Shabby, wet little place that nobody used. There was no running water on the post, so Arnie and his hutmates, one of whom was the RAF operations officer, would take a B-17 each morning to Langford Lodge, a Lockheed Air modification center three miles away, to go to the bathroom. It must have cost the government $1,000 a trip, but was worth it, the boys thought. Arnie left Ireland, because the colonel at headquarters in London happened to make an inspection tour of the various air bases, and found Arnie's dispensary in what he thought was a superior condition. As a matter of fact, they had heard comma he was coming, and had swept out the hut and made the two beds the day before. It was lucky he didn't arrive while they were on their other daily trip, this one to Prestwick, Scotland, for the daily newspaper, to find out the baseball scores. They used to get all the U.S. papers within 24 hours, thanks to the steady transatlantic air traffic. On the basis of the above-mentioned inspection, Arnie went to London as executive officer of the medical section of the division. He was there 15 months, and was given a big desk with an in-basket, an out full house full house two jai basket, and lots of papers to shuffle between them. The desk was just the right height for his feet and had a refined roll for his cigars, he says. Actually, his job was the arranging of air evacuation of wounded to the USA. He was in London through the V-1 and V-2 flying bomb raids. One day there were 200 alerts, and the little man who had control of the all-clear signal was so confused, that half a minute after the all-clear sounded a bomb fell and killed some people. An additional duty was that of a division medical inspector which gave him the opportunity to visit air bases from Scotland to Athens any time he got tired of shuffling papers at his desk. A special assignment took him to Madrid and Lisbon, where it was necessary to wear civilian clothes, because the countries were neutral. A mustering out suit was loaned to him by the English on reverse lend-lease in exchange for 500 airplanes. The suit was much too small for him, and he had to take the coat off when he ate in order to get his hand to his mouth. In Madrid the cheapest things were the bullfights. Everything else was so expensive that it cost $25 a day just to subsist. 
7 colon 3 4 house 4 house no the special mission took him to Berlin as doctor at the airport which was used to receive the personnel attending the Potsdam conference. All the brass came, he says. As there were no casualties at the airfield on the day of arrival and the day of departure, he spent three weeks scrounging around in .the ruins of the Reichen Cellary. He couldn't find Hitler, but in his office he found a beautiful red needle point hanging with gold braid, and a black swastika in the center, which he sent home to me, and a collection of Nazi medals. He also gave me the handsome white enamel and bronze medal for the mothers of five children. It is just as good looking as the silver one for ten, or the gold one for fifteen children. So what is the use? Just before coming home for good he had charge of a big air evacuation hospital in France. Toward the end of his duty there he had only about 25 patients, all convalescents waiting to be sent home. He had 114 nurses, all of whom were disgruntled at not having more to do, and they were homesick besides. Knowing of the shortage of nurses at home, he wrote to Washington, telling them of his surplus. The answer was a shipment of 90 more nurses to him. He jokingly says that there is nothing like full house full house water gained surgical experience. Now he is back at the Boston hospital, working 18 hours a day trying to relearn all he forgot during the war. 1 semicolon 7 715 full house full house 2 tilde QQ chapter ale fourth daughter. Frankie up. Lazy thing comedy to said the queen, and take this young lady, to see the mock turtle. Alice in Wonderland when the twins, Gladys, and Francesca, were seventeen and freshmen at Smith, they were invited by a classmate, to go to her coming out party in Aten. They were crazy to go, had never been off on their own, and liked the sweet daughter of the well-known people who had invited them. I had a nice letter from the girl's mother and the father, when he came to New York, called me up and said, what good care they would take of my twins, if I would let them go. I bought them some nice, and really grown up clothes and we were all excited at the thought of their trip. They had arrived at their destination a few hours before the dot party a most beautiful, elaborate affair, with gorgeous decorations and a world genoed orchestra. Gladys was the first of the twins to walk down the wide staircase into the ballroom. An usher met her, and danced her over to the receiving line of hostess and debutante. As Frankie reached the foot of point two of full house full house 211 the stairs an usher started towards her, when a very tall young man elbowed the usher out of the way, and stood right in front of her and said, My, I am glad to see you. I always knew I would. You are the girl I am going to marry. Come along and meet my mother. Frankie looked frantically for her sister, while the comma possessive young man, who told her his name was Bob King, took her by the arm and piloted her to a small room where some older people were having coffee. Here, mother, he said, pushing Frankie to a lovely looking woman. Here she is. I always told you I'd find my dream girl. This is the girl I'm going to marry. It poor Frankie was so frightened she thought he was going to marry her then and there. She began to cry. You may be going to marry her someday. Bob, but you are certainly going about it in a strange way, Komatiti said his mother. And then to Frankie. Come with me, dear. My son is not as crazy as he sounds. He has strong likes and dislikes, and since he was a child has always said he knew he would someday come and meet his ideal girl. You should be complimented, but this must be a shock. Point two seven seven full house full house two tilde she took Frankie to her room, and bathed her eyes, and comforted her, and told her she would not let Bob bother her. When Frankie got back to the ball the story had gotten around, and she was given the rush of her life. Bob cut in as often as he could, and when he was not dancing with her, he was with Gladys asking her endless questions about her sister. Poor Bob had a three years wait, and lost about 40 pounds before Frankie finally gave in, and said she would marry him. Mr. King came to see us to plead Bob's cause and told Frankie, how lonely Bob was on his ranch, and how much he needed her. He stayed with us, 
and was his own charming self, smoothed us all down, went to see mother, and made a fuss over her, and told us entrancing stories of the ranch. Although he works harder to demanding business in Cincinnati, his heart is in the West, and he loves ranch life and ranching. Bob has lived on the ranch, since he left college, and would never call anywhere else his home. Bob had an enormous family, as we did, and when Bob and Frankie left for their honeymoon in Europe we let her take only a short list of people, to write thanks to for her wedding gifts. We at home the 3-2 TV full house full house to your sisters and I slaved over those remaining letters of effusive thanks. A member of the sewing club received three letters in three different handwritings, to thank her for a cream pitcher. After their return from Europe they went to the ranch, and stayed till the following spring, when Bob brought Frankie home to me to have her baby a dear, fat little daughter, with beautiful eyes like her father's. It is really extraordinary, what a grandchild does to one. Instead of making me feel older, it gave me a new lease on life. I felt young, and vigorous and as if my life really had a meaning, and a wonderful sense of continuance. Mother said when my Nita was born, that she felt the same way. What a really matriarchal family we are. Boys are just incidentals, or to be acquired by marriage, but the firstborn is almost always a girl and so welcome. Of my four daughters, Tina, the second, is the only one with all boys. She has had four the oldest just two weeks under five when Frankie, the youngest, was born. Nita's oldest is a boy, but she had a girl later. When Kina, Frankie's baby, was a month old we flew out to the ranch. I had never flown before and supposed all the things that happened to us were 77 full house full house RT at routine. We left the Newark airport in the early evening and all went comfortably to bed Kina in a basket at the foot of her mother's bunk. The stewardess woke me up at midnight. The plane was bobbing about and I felt a pressure in my ears. She told me to take the baby and make her swallow. Frankie was awake, and very airsick. The baby was limp, and blue and the stewardess made no bones about being very worried about her. She simply must be kept swallowing, the stewardess insisted. The only way I knew to keep a month old baby swallowing was to feed her, so I knelt on the floor in the aisle of the plane for four hours, and held the baby to Frankie's breast to keep her eating and swallowing. We finally arrived at Cheyenne, and were met by Bob and a trained nurse. As I handed Keena to the nurse, she started and said, Mr. King didn't tell Mike was a blue baby. Poor little Keena was limp as well as blue, but in two days, was her own fat rosy self. The reason she got so blue was that the pilot had flown very high to avoid too bad thunderstorms, and the high altitude had affected the baby's circulation. We drove 90 miles to the ranch in Bob's high full house full house. 245 powered car, never traveling under 80 miles an hour. The road is high ground, just wide enough for two cars to pass, with deep ditches on each side for snow. The ranch is 22 miles across the prairie from the main highway. I had never been on the prairie in the spring before. It is indescribably beautiful the waving grass like a soft green ocean, and great big yellow and purple flowers, that can cover the whole side of a mountain. The ranch house is on a fork of the Powder River a gaily rushing shallow stream, when I first saw it. It can nearly dry up, or become a raging torrent and overflow its banks for miles, they told me. There are flower gardens around the house, and the house itself is charming along. Lo, an estuaried log structure with many L's. One enters a small entry, with double doors for the cold, then into an enormous living room, a grand piano lost in one corner, a full-sized billiard table in another, windows on three sides with gay chintz curtains, big leather sofas and chairs, Indian rugs on the floor, plants and flowers everywhere the epitome of comfort and charm. My room was one small L, with my bathroom off it. Every morning a man entered from the outside door, and built the fire to heat the water, and also a two-tilled full house full house 99 fire in my bathroom fireplace.
an old RL consisted of the nursery with bathroom, while Bob's underscore Iron Frankie's apartment occupied still another. The guest rooms were on the opposite side of the living room, while the kitchen, pantries and dining room were on our side. On the first morning I stood at the outside door of my bathroom overlooking the corrals full of horses, beyond them the river, and across the river the mountains covered with wild flowers. I was transported with delight at such beauty. Frankie said, you never told me how magnificently beautiful it is. Point one one I know said Frankie, but it is impossible to describe. I thought you'd better come and ask Comrie for yourself. The bunkhouse, where the fifty farmhands and cowboys lived, was down a wide lane, on one side, with the cookhouse opposite. Bob and Frankie had a smart Filipino boy who cooked for them, and looked out for their house. The cookhouse was presided over by one of the most remarkable women I ever met Mrs. Cummings, a middle-aged, grey-haired widow of a rancher, who did all the cooking, and had time enough besides to crotch at bedspreads and every other known thing. Her only helper was a lame man, Joe, who lifted the heaviest full house full house 2,17 kettles. She could serve the most incredibly delicious meals. It used to make Frankie and Bung, the Filipino, angry when Bob would sneak over to eat Mrs. Cummings' cooking, but I did not blame him. Her apple pies were a dream great juicy in its piled high and flaky pie crust, so good one wanted to eat the crust alone. Breakfast at the cookhouse was at 6 a.m., the dinner at 11.30, and the supper at 5. The men all turned in about 7. They all had bedrolls which they slept in, and kept their treasures in, and which they carried with them wherever they went. A first question asked a new hand was whether he had his role. He always did. The morning after Frankie, Keener and I arrived, I thought, my, this is a busy place, lots of noise, men calling, cattle stampeding, horses being taken out of the corrals, and calves hundreds of them being driven in. Bob seemed very nervous and finally he said to me, I'm terribly sorry you had to come just today, for you will not like what is going to happen. We have been waiting for six weeks for the veterinaries, and of course they showed up this morning. All the calves have to be castrated, oh, that's all right, said, easily, eleven I have lived on a farm all my life. Tt yes, but this is different it's the hyphas. Comma 93 full house full house 2 1 and we have contagious abortion, and the authorities are making us stamp it out. There is nothing I can do. His lips trembled. I did not wonder. For it was perfectly horrible. The Haifa's beautiful thoroughbred potential mothers were thrown on the left side, then a vet with carefully sterilized rubber gloves, and instruments made a two-inch incision just back of the ribs, put his glove finger in and pulled out a piece of abdominal viscera with the ovamies attached small, whitish globules which he cut off with a sharp knife, then carefully put the viscera back. A helper took two strong stitches in the tough cowhide. It took only a few minutes for each one and there was little bleeding. The poor animals were held down skillfully and gently by three cow hands. All the men hated the job, and got through it, as soon as they could, but it made me actively sick, and I was thankful, that Pete was not there. I think it would have killed him a mother to him was something to be so revered and protected. The calves all got up and walked off after the operation and the mortality was remarkably low. Only a few got infected and died. Hundreds were done. It went on all day. Full house, full house, most things on the ranch were pleasant. I even rode on a safe and quiet horse. Everyone rode as a matter of course. It was the way one got where one wanted to go down to the south ranch to see if the irrigation ditch and water wheel were in order up the mount in .to see how the new colts and their mothers were, to Taylor's ranch to see if the corn was up. The ranch was so big over a hundred thousand acres, that it had many divisions. One day we went sage hen hunting. They are so tame, that you have to shoe them, and make them fly, in order to shoot them. They can really be killed by clump, but that is not sporting. They are the best eating imaginable, 
when young a combination of wild turkey, partridge, and something better than other. They are the size of a small turkey. There is every other kind of game on the ranch. 2. The cowboys won't eat it, but live on beef fresh killed on the ranch. It is different from the beef we get, not dot being corn fed, but it is equally good. Once or twice, while I was there on that first trip, Bob and I went out to dinner. Frankie was not strong enough to go, but she wanted me to meet her friends. The distance we went was usually between 90 and 150 miles. It seemed funny to put on an evening full house full house dildera dress at 3 in the afternoon and drive for all 5 hours, stay till midnight, have a beautiful time, but have that whale of a ride to get home. I was afraid Bob might go to sleep at the wheel, but to keep us both awake he would tell me stories of his life before Frankie came into it. Some stories, most of them. When his father first bought the ranch, Bob decided he must give a party. It was the custom for a newcomer to entertain. He asked advice from old-timers, and did just what they told him. He hired the schoolhouse, had posters made and distributed telling the time and place, and inviting everyone. Then he bought a big barrel of whiskey, and engaged a man to play the violin. By three in the afternoon, seventy women, most of them with small children, had arrived. The babies were put on the benches around the room, and the women went into the kitchen and started to cook. They had all brought food with them. Bob had provided coffee, pies, ham, bread and butter. The men folks came from 5 p.m. on, and the party lasted till dawn. When it was over, Bob went to bed, and slept without waking for 36 hours. Full house, full house to MNL chapter Angus and I say unto you, my friends be not afraid of them that kill the body. St. Luke. Chap. 12. V4 when Frankie's time diary told of near for her second child, I made a second trip to the ranch. I had been there about ten days when Frankie said, one beautiful Sunday morning, I am telephoning the doctor, not to go on the visitors today I think the baby is coming. My precious one, have you had pain? Not exactly. But I know today is the day. The Visitadas is a trip taken by a party of friends on horseback from one ranch to another. It lasts from a few days to a week, and the party spends the night at different ranches en route. The women usually have rooms, but the men sleep anywhere in their bedrolls. It is a very gay affair, and at each place they pick up more people, so the group at the finish is much larger than the one which started. I have never been on one, but always wanted to, and the stories they tell are fascinating. A group had gathered, for instance, at the Cranes, the Dieters, house to make plans, and to send advance notice are, full house full house to 22 to the ranches to be visited. Poor things a rainy day meant that all hands would stay over, and the host would find perhaps 50 extra to feed when everything had been eaten up the day before. Once when they came to Frankie's and Bob's ranch the advance rider said that about 12 would come on Friday for the night. Sunday morning 34 arrived. The Friday food had spoiled, but the liquor was still there, and more food was quickly prepared. It was lucky that Dr. Crane had stayed home, for one enthusiast fell off his horse and broke both wrists that first afternoon. He was brought into the hospital, while I was sitting in the visitor's room waiting for news of the baby. His wrists couldn't be set by the doctor until the baby had been delivered. The next day when I went to Visita I found Frankie very well, and chatting cozily with Jim Fuller, of the broken wrists, who was in a bed beside hers. He had just been wheeled in to call, and she was lighting a cigarette for him, since he was helpless. Also in the room was Charlie Robb, the son of a friend getting over an appendectomy. Frankie was supposed to have no visitors there for a few days, but these men were fellow patients. After a few days, when the restrictions were let up, the visitors began to come in droves. One of two common nine F full house full house underscore underscore twenty one tilde underscore the most constant of them was Angus. He was Bob's best friend a huge, beautiful black ameth. 
The aristocracy of ranch life are the veterinaries and blacksmiths. Angus and his father each made about $100 a day, and still could not begin to fill their orders. They had a fine outfit for a little blacksmith shop on wheels, everything in perfect order and beautifully kept. Angus was also a real sportsman a dead shot, a fisherman, and a superb rider. He always brought me presents of trout or partridge or wild flowers, that he had caught or shot or picked himself. Everyone was so kind, while Frankie was in the hospital. Keena, the first child, who was two years old now, and I could not keep up with our invitations. When the time came, that I got ready to leave, Frankie told me, that I must go and say goodbye to all my friends. Keena and I drove around, where I knew the way, and otherwise Bob piloted us. I hated to say goodbye to these adorable, kind friends. Frankie and Nita, the new baby, were both fine, and had come home the day before I was to leave. Bob asked me, if I had said goodbye to Angus. Why, no, said. Philly's a young man, and I'm an old woman. I didn't think of it. Full house, full house, two Q2 number well, he expects you, said Bob. I had endless last things to do, but I got dressed up and off we went, 35 miles, to Angus's house. He was certainly expecting us, and from the pile of whittled chips on the ground in front of him, he had evidently been waiting a long time. He sat on a bench against the wall in front of his house, immaculate in a white shirt open at the neck showing his magnificent smooth throat. His sleeves were rolled up above his elbows revealing his brawny, hairy arms, and with his huge hands he played with a jackknife and stick. He was terribly pleased to see us, and took us all over his house, which he had built himself. It had a big living room with one corn walled off for the bathroom, which contained, in addition to the conveniences, a combination hot water heater and furnace. Behind the opposite corner of the rear wall was his kitchen separated from the living room by a counter three feet high and two feet wide. This also served, on the living room side, for a bookcase, and on the kitchen side as a scullery, where he stored all his pots and pans. While Bob and I sat in the living room, Angus made tea in the kitchen, and entertained us at the same full house full house two comma two tilde time, being out of the room, and yet not out of it. He knew I was funny. That way I liked tea in the afternoon, so he was prepared. Along one wall of the living room, beginning in a corner, the staircase rose to the unfinished loft and bedroom upstairs. If I ever get a wife, I'll finish it, said Angus. The staircase was charming no railing on the outside, but a good one along the wall. Nearly every stair had something on the edged books, pots of begonia, ivy, fern, some decoy ducks, tobacco. It was absolutely unstudied, but no decorator could have done better. Easy to clean too, said Angus. We stayed so long, that I was ashamed, but Angus promised to come east and visit me. He had never ridden on a train, or been in a church, but had seen both, he said. Dear child, when I arrived home a few weeks later, a heartbroken telegram from Bob was waiting for me. Angus, who drove his high-powered automobile like mad, had just not made the turn on a high bridge over a dry creek coming home from one of his blacksmithing days, and had been instantly killed. Poor Bob had gone out to pick him up. He said the car was in splinters and dot Angus unrecognizable. Semicolon Z tilde slash for her use for house 42 tilde 6 Bob and I often talk of him, when we are alone together. His death is one of our lifelong sorrows, and our love for him a great bond between Bob and me. Bob had piloted a plane for years, and used one for long hops from the ranch. He tried to enlist in the summer of 142, but was turned down. Frank Jr., who was there with me at the time, also tried to enlist, and both boys came back from the enlistment office red-faced and chagrined. They had not only been turned down, but were told, that they would never be taken. Bob started a fly irig school. The government approved it and he taught officers for three years, 
and gave them their diplomas, and did a fine job. His pupils were sent all over the world, and he held the rank of major in the civilian air patrol. At last one of his enlistment applications was approved, and he started in his own plane with three other newly enlisted men for Texas. They got as far as Denver, when a wing came off and they crashed. What caused the accident, no one knows. Bob broke his shoulder and arm, one man was killed, and the rest were injured badly. Bob was in the hospital three months. Full house full house our underscore tilde the day he was to leave, he reported to the doctor for his discharge. The doctor said, say, King, are you always that color? He had measles, and was awfully sick with them. After another month, he left, and Frankie went to see him the first time she had been allowed to. He was sent to officer's training school, but was not strong enough and got pneumonia. It was fortunately not a bad case, but it washed him out as a pilot. He was then sent to quartermaster's officer's training, and while there he got the mumps. In all, he has been trained for seven different branches of the army, but he the man who organized and conducted a successful flying school, and was addressed as major remained a private had a stiff arm, and worked as a grease monkey. On his ranch he left 4,000 head of prime beef cattle and hundreds of other animals running loose, needing care with no one to care for them. The war took all his ranchmen, and left one old man as foreman, with a few cripples, to do what they could. Frankie and her two little girls came home. How glad we were to see them. They fitted in, as if they had always been here. Full House Full House Chapter 2 Tilda T. Buddy on Rising Moon, that looks for us again, how are off to your after will she wax and wane, how are off to your after rising look for us through the same, garden and for one in vain. The Rubeyut of Omakaya my son, Frank Jr., called Buddy, went to war August the 26th, 1942. Only those whose loved ones went, can know what it was like. He tried hard to enlist first in the Navy, and one time he thought he had made it. But as he left the room the examining officer said, Say, I forgot about your eyes. Point one T buddy is very color blind, and was therefore ejected. In spite of all we could do, the defect could not be overlooked or waived. Then he attempted, time after time for two years, to enlist in the army. Time after time he was rejected. Far always the same reason eyes. He had rode four years at college, and played football all through prep school, and now to be rejected for a physical defect was mortifying, he felt. At the end of his junior year he got a job for the summer, on the Massachusetts North Shore, tutoring a splendid 14-year-old boy. It was one of the best summers he ever spent, he says. Johnny, his pupil, Full House Full House had a younger sister Dot older Jeannie, and they were simply buddies slaves, and waited on him hand and foot, cleaning his Ford Roadster and running errands, while Buddy lay on the beach. Why the long-suffering parents stood it I don't know. Johnny did pass his exams, that fall so perhaps they were repaid for their kindness. The next summer Buddy was hired by a famous financier. Mr. J.P. Morgan, a fellow member of his college club to tutor a ten-year-old titled English refugee, Lord Primrose, comma, dot, dot, who with two small seousins, dot, had been sent to this country, to escape the Blitz in England. Mr. Morgan took them, and their English nanny to his beautiful estate on Long Island, and did everything possible to make them comfortable and happy. Little Lord Primrose expected to find Indians everywhere in the USA, and complete freedom of word and action, and brooked no restraint. He was a handful through bread and food at anyone at table, including Mr. Morgan and behaved generally like a little hellion. When he found that this country and its manners were similar to England's, he wanted to go home at once. It was at least more exciting there with the war and air raids. Buddy said Mr. Morgan was perfectly wonderful no detail of the children's lives was too trifling for his attention. He tried so hard to make young Eric see the error of his ways, and be a good citizen. Full house full house Buddy grew to respect and admire Mr. Morgan and Mr. Morgan has been Buddy's hero ever since that summer. His death a few years ago was a great grief. 
Eric is now doing well in school, and perhaps likes it better in England. When Buddy entered law school he spent almost every Saturday trying to enlist in any branch of the service. Then he studied radio, and got licenses for sending and receiving. He worked so hard at radio, that his father feared he would not do well at law school, but he averaged well the first year. In the second year he lived in the house on Commonwealth Avenue which my husband had inherited from some cousins, and had a nice quiet place to study. Then Buddy was drafted. He was apparently doing well at law school when it happened. If he could have waited two weeks he would have finished the second year, but he had to leave, go home, and sit until cold. The night before he left was a beautiful one and there was an eclipse of the full moon. Sat in my window overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, watching the huge orange ball being gradually eaten up until only a dancing gold circlet came from behind the black disc. Then, as gradually, the shadow passed and the moon B.253 full house full housey. At JT came orange, and then gold again. The few clouds were all colors, like a dark sunset. Sat there all night and couldn't sleep. I prayed that my son would come safely home, and might be able to do his duty. He wanted to go and wanted any kind of a uniform. He could have applied for limited service, but nothing would make him. After my all-night vigil I woke Buddy at six o'clock, and he and Frankie and I motored to the point from where he was to take the bus to Camp Devens. He had a small bag and looked so young. All the other mothers seeing their boys off felt the same as I did. I am sure. One very fat swarthy woman kept moaning, Toto. He's my la come arresty one, my baby. All the others have gone. Zero one. Oil well, what shall I do? Just then she slipped on something. Her feet flew up, and so did her skirts, revealing white stockings and red silk drawers with six inch lace trimming, and black velvet bows. Her moaning changed to a rare form of cursing and Toto came up to her and said, For Christ's sake, Ma shut up. Do you want to ruin me, before I even get to Devens? The rest of the family led her screaming full HOUSE asterisk full house asterisk 5 colon P, away. I heard one boy ask Toto, where she got the red underpinnings. He grinned and said, She's a dressmaker. Aren't they something? The bus moved off. Frankie and I came forlornly home. I was fortunate in being able to see Buddy the following Christmas, which I spent with him in Kansas City. Buddy was in the Signal Corps school there, and expected to go on to officer's candidate school afterwards. He never reached zero CS. His eyes kept him out, and also from being sent overseas to his, but not my, regret. I left home in a bad blizzard and arrived in Chicago Christmas even a worse one. Never will I forget the crowds of people, and the huge ramparts of packages in that station all waiting, to be delivered for someone's Christmas. All the trains were hours late, and I spent a long time in the waiting room. Saturn held a very sick colored baby, while his mother tried to find accommodations for them somewhere. I was rewarded by the mothers trying to run away, and leave me with the baby. She was getting into a taxi with her three older children when I caught her. A kind red cat who had evidently underscore seven I full house full house point two tilde five had much experience told me where to go after her, and we just got there in time. Why my luggage, left alone on a seat in that populous waiting room, was not stolen, I don't know. When I finally got on my train I was comfortable and arrived in Kansas City in time for Christmas dinner that night. Kansas City was a great surprise to me. Such beautiful homes, cosmopolitan, charming people, and the most beautiful, comfortable railroad station and perfectly wonderful art museum filled with the choicest exhibits all arranged in exquisite taste. The people were exceptionally hospitable, and I found many invitations from friends Buddy had made and from some college friends of Frank's. Everyone seemed prosperous and friendly. The Christmas gifts they all gave each other made my eyes bulge. Beautiful oil paintings of each other, and famous canvases by renowned artists seemed to be the favorite gifts. 
Once my husband gave me an orchid for Christmas, and he usually gives me a Phillips Brooks calendar, if he does not forget it. I air found Buddy thin and peaked, with a terrible cold. He had two friends with him, both forlorn one a boy from Georgia, almost comma frozen to death by the cold there, and a kid avarice young man from New Full House Full House Orc State. Buddy said that ever, since he had known the one from Georgia his teeth had chattered, so that Buddy still did not know his name. At the wonderful Kansas Tea Club we had a delicious dinner, and lots to drink. After dinner we went into the lounge and sat in their big, comfortable, overstuffed easy chairs. I tried to be polite and make conversation. For one second I put my head back against the chair, and the next thing I knew a man was dabbing me on the shoulder and saying, that they were closing the club for the night. The three boys were sound. Asleep too. I woke them, and we had a good sheepish laugh at our own expense. Buddy was later sent to Washington with a rating as sergeant technician. He had expected to stay there overnight, and be shipped out the next day, but he stayed for three years still working in the Pentagon building, at first he said that working in the Pentagon building was exciting. It is the largest building in the world, and it was like being in another city inside Washington.N. He did radio and radar work. Part of the time he was on such a secret shift that he was locked with his equipment in a small room with the photographs and names of four high-ranking officers on the wall. If he wanted to leave the room except at the full house full house hyperlink mail to colon to at Saint Tildrig to at Saint Tildrig regular time, he had to telephone to one of these gentlemen to let him out. He never did telephone any of them. The highest part of his service in Washington came the day he was listening to foreign messages and heard Japan calling. This is history. Japan has surrendered unconditionally. The message was signed by Caporal on a battleship. Don't ask why the corporal was on a battleship. He just was. Buddy radioed back the message and said it sure was history. He has the corporal's name. He will not tell me how long he heard the news before we got it. His orders were to send it at once to the White House and then to the State Department. I spent one Christmas with him in Washington, and while there I had a bad case of flu. Buddy was on the 4 p.m. to midnight shift. After leaving at night he had to get something to eat, then would sleep till noon the next day, get a combination breakfast and lunch, come and see me for a few minutes, and go off to work. He saw that I was sick, but did not realize how sick. Neither did I. After a couple of days he got the hotel doctor, as I was not getting better. The doctor was horrified my temperature was LO 4.6. He 301 full house full house 2 colon tilde R and gave me sulfur, which, I learned after looking in the mirror several days later, had turned my usual white hair to the most awful shade of pinkish yellow. It took months for it to grow out. At home, that Christmas wasn't so hot either. The husband was there, and our daughter Tina and Nita's baby Ben. Nita had left the infant behind, so that she could spend Christmas in Norfolk, Virginia, with her husband, Charlie, who had a high temperature when he met her, and had to go to bed immediately afterward in a small room at a friend's house. By New Year's Eve he had recovered enough to get up, and had only been up a short time, when Tina and her father telephoned Nita, to come home at once as Ben was terribly ill with a strep throat. She called the airlines at once, and was lucky enough to get on a plane leaving Norfolk at 8 that he New Year's morning, and she was with Ben in no time. Full House Full House 2 tilde 57 6 112 Chapter 2 tilde October 20 1945 So, when that angel of the darkest drink at last, shall effend you by the river brink, and, offering his cup, Invite your soul forth to your lips, to quaff you shall not shrink. The rubaiyat of Omakia my mother is dying dear. Gallant little gentlewoman. She is ninety, and has had a life of wonderful health and great beauty, and now as she lies unconscious her patrician face is so noble and so kind. I have had her a long time, and during the last years, when we have been so worried about the war we have clung together, she has been my baby and my comfort. 
she is so wise, and humorous and has lived through, so many wars or, as she says, about nothing, and they have proved nothing, only killed the best, and broken hearts and homes. In this war she had four grandsons, all of whom came through safely, thank God. Nita, Keener and I were visiting her at Cedar Spring, when VJ Day came. We were, of course, beside ourselves with joy. Our first feeling was gratitude, that the war was over at last. We all piled in our Ford mother, Felix, my brother-in-law, the little girls and I full house full house 21 semicolon e tilde, and went to the Whitford Village Church. Many people were there. After we had said our prayers we met friends and acquaintances outside the church and we laughed, and talked and congratulated one another, that the war was over. It seemed almost too good to be true. Then we all went, and had an ice cream cone, and the children were elated principally at being allowed to stay up way beyond their usual bedtime. Mother failed rapidly after VJ Day. Nothing definite just a general lassitude. I know I should feel reconciled. Ninety is a great age and mother really wants to go. Just the you know, dear, I feel as if I other day she said, would see your father soon. Just think it is a forty-two years. Mother, darling, I begged, don't go and leave me. I need you now more than ever. Yes, we have had lovely times together she said, and I never want to be away from you, as you know but we all need our own kind and age, and nearly all my friends have gone. And I need dear, I am very tired. When you are old, you will know the kind of tired I mean. It is a different tired I mean. It is a different tired. She sat so peacefully in her corner of the full house full house sofa in the little smoking room. I feel now, sitting looking at her beautiful tranquil face, as if life holds nothing except anguish for me, and I would gladly give years of my own life to keep her. It is wrong, and what dotty does she deserves her rest. But oh, she is so precious. I do want her so. I am afraid we are not doing all we can. The doctors, we had a consultation, say it is hopeless, and that she is not suffering, that this pneumonia is the friend of old age. Every time Ruth or David or I talk to her, or smooth her forehead, she makes a sound and tries to smile. It has always annoyed me, how easily doctors say one is unconscious. Twice in my life I have heard a doctor say I was unconscious when I wasn't, and couldn't live when I did. And another time I heard a doctor declare me dead and instruct the nurse, to go and tell my husband. God give me courage to bear this parting. Full house, full house, s right parenthesis, chapter right, a cocktail party, such a bowl get high, in truth lies salvation, in arrogance that we live near the big naval air base at Quonset. In my childhood it was the conch ground for the Rhode Island State Militia, as it was then called, and every year we would have a week of fun going to parades, and seeing our otherwise humdrum friends all dressed up in fine uniforms. One of our childish chants was, Brigadier General Hiram Kendall. We would march around by the hour saying, No I'm Brigadier General Hiram Kendall. He was in command of the state militia then. No one remembering those days would know Quonset now. It has been built up into a base, and the earth has been moved to change the landscape. It has flowers and trees and lawns, wide streets, pretty modern houses, clubs, a huge commissary, endless barracks and quonset huts, machine shops, aeroplane sheds and hangars, and usually a few warships and flat tops at the docks. The old cove has been dredged out to accommodate the largest ships afloat. Needless to say, it was under the strictest guard during the war, and no one could go in or out without a pass. 30, underscore full house full house e40 tilde with all the husbands away I was lad dot to have nine my daughters see officers from there, and have parties when they could. It kept the girls young. Almost every evening some officer would call. Ohm, the butler, would answer the phone and the crossfire of conversation in the room, would go something like this. Ohm was it for? Mrs. King, madam. Tilda 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 anki. Telephone for you. 
ask him if he can't get some friends. We all want to go. We usually had other girls visiting us too, so we all usually meant anywhere from five to eight. Then later is it Coca-Cola or that guy from Washington? It's neither, you fool it's Mary Heeman Way, who wants to borrow Buddy's crutches. Ted's home on leave, and has a bad leg. Feet better luck soon. A few dark minutes later, the phone would ring again. Yes, um, telephone for Mrs. Hovey. Now, Nita, see what you can do. We simply can't sit here another evening. Underscore 367. Full house, full house, Nita would go to the telephone. Yes, Captain. Dot how good you are. You really want three of us to come? Wait a minute, I'll ask my sisters if they have an engagement this evening. She holds her hand over the telephone. What'll I say to get you two other bums an invitation? Tell him I don't I tea eat. Say I'll still own to table. I have a sweet voice. T.I. Hush. Captain, they'd love to come. Dot the only trouble is we have two girls staying with us. Perhaps I'd better bring them and let my sisters come another night. Are you really sure? Well, I dot suppose there are enough men at concert for even our big family. Dot. Dot yes, we'll be ready at 8.30 and you'll have two cars. You are kind. Off they'd go to fun and dancing. I would make the rounds and see that all the grandchildren were asleep and covered. It gets cold towards morning at the seashore. The nurses needed the recreation as well as the mothers, and every night one of them would sidle up to me and say something like, Teresa Mrs. Meadows' nurse's brother is home on furlough, and will take Nelly and Josie and me to the movies, if you are full house full house going, to be in and off they'd go. Every few days, it seemed, we would have a cocktail party to help return some of these invitations. Just before the morning swim, while I was doing the ordering, one of my daughters would turn up with, Mother, I really think we must do something for Liz Minchin. She has had us there, so much and her in-laws, are with her now, and she's desperate trying to entertain them. Do you think you could get another case of rum? That's really the easiest thing to have. That aquarium mix you got was simply spiffy. All right, darling, but try not to have more than a fifty people. Why? Of course, we won't there will be Helen and Jim, who's just home, Betty and Phil, Sally and Edith. The Meadusses, the Henrys, all the bunch from Saunders Town, and about 30 from Concert, and those new men from the Naval Training Station in Newport. My, they are attractive. I'm so glad Charlie wrote to Commander Lucia, to come and see us. He has just the nicest friends. Sighed to myself. It sounded like more than 50 to me. I bought two cases of rum, one of gin and all the whiskey my kind wine merchant friend would allow me three bottles. Full house, full house, we had lots of peanuts, popcorn, and crackers of every kind. The girls tough fed six dozen eggs and made sandwiches, but the grandchildren got into them, and they were nearly all gone before the party started. The first arrivals came from Faithist away Boston and Watch Hill arriving about 3.30. They and I, with two dirty, naughty puppies and the three middle children F, Nita, and Fortune, a cousin aged four spent aboard two hours together before the first of my daughters turned up. They had all gone to play golf after lunch and got delayed, they said. I was ready to murder them. They always did this and always had the comma same answer ready. Well, mother, why should we worry? We know you'll be here, and it comma was so lovely at the country club. Gladys made an 82. I took a great fancy to one young man L, T, dot, comma, Price Gilbert, who came fr 6 m Newport. He was such a charming southern gentleman. Poor child I found out afterwards that he had had no lunch, and he tried so hard to be polite and courteous. He looked beautiful in his white uniform. About 5.30 some older guests came. Among them Captain Morgan then in command of the CB training base at Camp Endicott. I was cross and angry with my daughters, and I'm always perfectly vague about rank. 3104 House Full House.
at Saint Hilda, so I introduced the poor young lieutenant as Captain Gilbert. Captain Morgan's eyes twinkled and he said, well, if he is a captain, I must make a comma curtsy, and he did. The poor lieutenant was so embarrassed. I knew I had done something awful, but was too ignorant to know what. Lieutenant Gilbert went off by himself, and stood in front of the big empty fireplace. The temperature was about 900, so we needed no fire. Saw so he had a glass on the mantel, and was emptying it, and then taking another. There is a long wooden bench in front of the fireplace, and to my horror I saw him sit on it a minute, then roll off into the fireplace. I spoke to Ome and he and I went over, and looked back of the bench. I thought the boy was dead. Charlie Cunningham, husband of one of the girls staying with a big, strapping athlete on leave at the time from the Navy said, No, he's not dead just passed out cold. It Charlie got home and my nephew Licky and they carried the lieutenant to his room in the top of the garage, where he was going to spend the night. If you can believe it, before the party was over he was back, and dressed up again, and although full house full house ghostly pale seemed all right. I don't know what the boys did to him. Ohm said, I think the young gentleman gave the lieutenant the works, whatever that means. Anyway, he went to the dinner and dance and the next day was so humble and apologetic. He had not known how to find our place, had gone to Providence, then down to Narragansett by bus, had had no lunch and all those cocktails put him out, as they say. The last people arrived at the cocktail party at 9.20, and him and the maid started picking up glasses, and fixing the house about 11 o'clock that night. Why do my help stay with me? I have never understood it. The Lord has been so good to me, and sent me such kindly lovable people, but the work is very hard, and the hours are so long. Full house, full house, chapter grow not too high, grow not too far from home, Edna St. Vincent Millay, son of Telex I.V. James, now dead, the husband of a great friend, came to me at the beginning of World War I, and asked me, if I would join the Secret Service. He told me to think it over well, as I might have to go overseas. How can I leave Frankie and my two babies? I asked him. I don't know. I didn't think this up myself. I was told to ask you. Who told you? Never mind. I don't know you have to think it over at all, quote I said, a little triumphantly. I am going to have another baby next December. I am so glad, quote he said, his face wreathed in smiles. Don't ever mention this to anyone even Frank. I never have till this minute. Stayed home and had the twins. I would have been a poor spy anyway. It must be terribly exciting, though. Full house, full house during this war I tried to do my duty, by serving as an air aid warden in the city during the winter, and as a spotter for rare airplanes from the courthouse tower in Narragansett during the summer. I took first aid, made surgical dressings, and kept house for my big family. Not spectacular, but it kept me busy. Spotting planes from the courthouse tower was fun. It was a small 6x6 six six tower with windows all around. We had a special telephone to somewhere. When we saw an aeroplane we would lift up the receiver and say, flash, and give the name, I think ours was moored. Many, or a few or one, as the case might be. Southeast to northwest. High, low, or not visible. We were on what Duchess of two hours day and night. The men did nights usually, and the women and girls days. The first aid and home nursing courses by the Red Cross are indispensable. I have taken them in both wars. The home nursing course should be compulsory for every woman and girl, and the first aid for every man and boy. Some years ago, between wars, the knowledge of how to resuscitate a drowning person, learned in a first aid course, saved the lives of a Portuguese school teacher and her young rescuer. It happened at Narragansett, where we have high rocks on our point. After a storm, the water remains turbulent and violent around the rocks, and it 3v full house full house de quote is fascinating to sit and watch. Just out of reach of the waves. Miss G, the school teacher, 
and two friends were sitting peacefully and safely they thought looking at the surf, when an extra large wave broke over them, and pulled Miss G into the water. The two women friends could not swim and went screaming for help. The only person on the beach, was my 14-year-old nephew, Ashton Baker. Clemming. It is so rough, and I don't it is swim well enough to save her, he said, but I'll try. He stripped his underdrawers, and went into the cauldron of boiling surf. Fortunately Miss G was unconscious, when he got to her about a quarter of a smile of sorrow, and lucky too, that she had long hair. He turned her over on her back, caught hold of her hair, and swam with her to the rocks. When he got there the surf was so strong, and the rocks so slippery, that he could not get a hold, so he had to turn, and swim around the rocks, half a mile with her to the beach. Most of my children, Omer Butler, and a man friend, Bob Ladd, had just reached the beach as he came up. Omer and Bob Ladd waded in, and helped Ashton and Miss G to shore. By this time Ashton was as near to drowning as Miss G was. The first aid learned by the full house full house two men on shore saved both lives. Ashton, incidentally, was given a received Carnegie Medal for the rescue, and has been the hero in our family ever since. Full House Full House 1 tilde 0 underscore chapter 2 T observations feet leisurely the thunder rolls and stumbles across the sky. Victor Hill the longer rile of the more I realize the vital importance of early training for children. A child is formed for his whole future by the age of six or seven in his attitude and conduct toward honesty, responsibility, considerateness, goodwill, and care of health. It seems a big order for a six-year-old, but it is, alas, true. The child may not want to put on his rubbers when it rains, or brush his teeth, or show moderation with candy, but he knows that he should. The gentle care the older brother or sister takes of the little ones shows that he knows what's right. He may pinch, or hit the smaller ones, or take toys away, but he knows he is doing wrong, and is ashamed, even if he braves it out. He does it for the excitement of hearing the little one cry, or because he wants the toy. Children supposedly out of earshot are usually much kinder to each other, than when an older person can be brought running by the agonized pleas of the teased. Most children are too much spoken to. The full house full house dot a wise mother of a big family, has to ignore much, and it is all for the good. The continual asking of questions, and getting answers is worse for the child than for the conscientious parent or teacher. Usually the child does it only to claim attention, and soon forgets. A child can assimilate only so much. Even if you knew the answer to, how far can a snake spit, it would do no one any good. A very painstaking friend of mine was bothered by her young children's questions on babies and sex. She asked doctors, she read every book she could, and finally the day came when she assembled her three children. Two boys and a girl sat them down, and announced that she would tell them the facts of life. Painfully she told them everything she could, then asked if there were any questions. After they had all looked solemnly at her a moment, Alice said, I don't think it is very pleasant, mummy. Less than a month later they began asking the same questions all over again, and comma a careful interrogation showed, that they had forgotten nearly everything she had told them. Don't attempt to answer every question. A child respects, I don't know, much more than a stupid answer which shows that you don't. Full house full house animals or zoos provide wonderful means for answering sex questions, and rabbits in the backyard are the best of all. Dev, at five, was almost in tears at Smokey's treatment of Snowball, his wife. Mummy, he said, but we must take Snowball out of the cage. He is so mean to her. He never leaves her alone at all. Comma, perhaps she likes it, said his grandfather. No, she doesn't, and I'm going to be nicer to my wiffy than that. Snowball lived in solitary grandeur until the baby rabbits were born, and the tender care given to her, and the little ones by the children was really touching. Some weeks later, while the children were at supper one night, 
I overheard Dev say, I think she'd like some more babies now. Let's put her back with Smokey. Nita, aged four, said, why do we have to put her back with Smokey? Cause it takes a father and a mother to make babies. The father gives them to the mother, and she has them. Oh, it takes a rabbit six weeks to have babies full house full house asterisk underscore rk, and we only have seven weeks till school, so we have to hurry. Won't she mind leaving her little babies, comma right parenthesis at one, two, and three. No they're all right now. They eat like anything. Nita, you put her in with Smokey. She likes you the best. Nita is very gentle, and both Smokey and Snowball ate out of her hand. They all started to the rabbit hutch. Full House Full House 6 for Chapter 2 The little children yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. Proverbs the poem a grasshopper once had a game of tag with some crickets who lived nearby. He stubbed his toe, and over he went in the twinkling of an eye. The crickets leaned up against the fence, and laughed till their sides were sore. The grasshopper said, you are laughing at me, and I won't play tag anymore. So off he went, though he wanted to stay, for he was not hurt by his fall. And the gay little crickets went on with the game, and never missed him at all. A bright-eyed squirrel called out as he passed, swinging from a tree by his toes, what a silly fellow, that grasshopper is why he bit off his own little nose. I do not know who wrote that masterpiece, but I like the moral. Many times I have. He said it to myself, and now I am teaching it to my grandchildren. Full House Full House Chapter Omnipotence Go ye into the village. Ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat, loose him, and bring him hither. And they brought him to Jesus. Dot. And they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. St. Luke, Chap. 19, V3035, 36 Dev fell and hurt himself. I tried to comfort him, and told him to be brave. Is God brave? he asked. Yes, I am sure he is. Is Jesus brave? Yes, dear. I know he is brave too. How do you know? I started to tell him the story of Christ's bravery on the cross. When something called me away, that night as I read my Bible I read the above chapter of St. Luke. So the next day I told Dev that Jesus rode an untrained colt that had never been ridden before and that men threw their clothes in the colt's way, which would have terrified almost any horse. So it proved that Jesus was not only brave, but a fine horseman. Dev, who loves horse flesh better than anything else, was impressed and I later heard him telling Full House Full House P5FF the story to the other children. So you see, he concluded, Jesus is brave, and he is smart too, to ride a colt like that. It a visiting cousin comma dot dot fortune fell weller, what a much awed by the story, and at the end he asked Dev solemnly, can Jesus really do anything? Fties, Dev affirmed. And fortune asked, can he hang by his heels from the chandelier? Full House Full House 258 FF Chapter R Tilda underscore the miracle Nita is very religious. She believes what sweet sister Paula tells her in Sunday school, and uses her religion in her daily life. One afternoon during her first year of school she came home to find Priscilla locked in the bathroom. We were all in the hall outside the door trying to make Priscilla open it. We had done and said everything. Margaret had called in Mr. Flaherty, the officer on our beat, but so far he had been no help. At the moment Nita arrived he was saying, Zero One think we better call the fire department. With the ladder they can climb in the window, and get her out. Wait a minute, comma 11 said Nita. I know what to do Sister Paula told me. I will pray. The darling little thing knelt reverently outside the door. Folded her hands and said, Dear Lord, please let Priscilla open the door of the bathroom. FD the door opened, and out walked naughty two-year-old Priscilla. There you see, said Nita. It is a miracle. We all agreed that it was. 
Full House, Full House, R exclamation point P number 57. Dot chapter 4. Ben I S and Fumonia. One rainy day, Ben was playing happily with Priscilla, and their merry little voices rang through the house. Just before the older children came in, they played party comrade sitting at their small table and pretending to eat, then singing lustily, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, then puffing out their fat cheeks and blowing out imaginary candles. The older children came in and of course upset them. Don't let's play such baby games, they said. Let's play Woolsicket. Come, Granny, come we're all going to play Woolsicket. They were seven strong. Woolsicket is not a highbrow game. It consists of making a train of chairs, stools, pillows, etc., with many more places than there are sitters. They all sit down at one end of the train, then I... The conductor, come in and say the horse bellow, here's your through train to Woonsicket, Longwood, and Chapel Station. Passengers going beyond need em take the forward car. It at that everyone gets up, and rushes bell-mell for the forward seats. The next move is just the reverse, for everyone turns around. But the fun is just 13, 20 full house full house 260 the same. Why they like it, I don't know. But we play it until my poor husbandy trying to read in the next room goes almost mad. Dot. Dot as a child, when visiting my maternal grandfather in Brookline, we took a train for Longwood, and that is what the trainman called. How one gets to Woonsicket now is a mystery. No train from anywhere goes there. Bennett is supper with the other children, and went to bed quite well. His father and mother went to a dinner and dance, and when they got in about 2 a.m. they fortunately wakened Nellie, the nurse. She got up, half asleep, to look at the children as a routine thing. She found Ben breathing very heavily, and with froth on his lips. She called Nita and Charlie who came, and were terrified at his looks. Charlie telephoned Doc today who came in 20 minutes. Ben's temperature was 104.8 and he had another convulsion, while Charlie held him for the doctor to see. Dr. Day said he had pneumoconia. He gave Ben sulfadiazine, and in the morning, since Ben had not responded very well to that, his temperature was 103.6, took him to the hospital to give him penicillin. Although he had two more convulsions, and was a terribly sick little boy for 24 hours, he responded splendidly to the penicillin and Full House Full House 2060 got to a fast. Neither he nor any of the other children had even had a cold. While he was the sickest, and just arrived at the hospital, the doctor ordered an enema. Ben was lying apparently unconscious, with Nita and Charlie hovering over him. As the nurse brought in the enema bag he lifted his head and said, Good God what is that thing? He was just two years old. He was very good and never fussed at the medicines or treatment, and is now a hero. The big girls, Nita, and Kina, casually bring into their conversation such illusions as, when Ben was in the hospital, we did this and so, and bask in the reflected glory. All the children give him their pet toys. From now on I suppose he will be spoiled, but not for long. A big family does rub the corners off. Children learn early the give, and take of life. Our children have, and I think my children did when they were small. 32 7 Full House Full House 262 60 Chapter 3 Tilda Arch Death. After we have played wounds a kit till we are all hoarse and exhausted, we sometimes play charades. The children, and even the babies, love to show off and dress up. One day we had two slightly older cousins vis. Eating and D. The CH raids were much more ELABORA asterisk T than usual. I was audience and succeeded in guessing the first word, mahogany left parenthesis mahogany, but couldn't guess the second one. They acted it through three times and I still hadn't an inkling what the word was. My, granny you are dumb. Can't you guess it? No, I have no idea. T.T. Shall we act it again? I don't think it would do any good. I think she's slipping, said Keena. Very grown up. I certainly am, said humbly. Well first we sang, listen to the mockingbird, 
I'm dreaming now of Halley, sweet Halley. Dot. Didn't we? Full house, full house, 263, yes. Then we made some toast, didn't we, Lias? TT, then I said to Nita, come. Let's play out, doors, sis.1 now do you know? I'm afraid not.11 really, Granny and Chorus you never were so dumb before. It's halitosis. Dot. Halitosis. Feet 32. Dot semicolon FL full house full house 2 and 460 chapter 8 older to the proper name one day Jack came running in with Ben trailing B come behind. Oh mummy, he shouted. Come see this lovely thing I found. Is it a bug or a sneetle? I t know, said Ben. It's a turkle.11 Ben was right. The turkle stayed around all summer, turning up every few days. 330 full house full house 26 tilde chapter hope, and fear, and peace, and strife in this thread of human life. Sir Walter Scott the differences in the children, are an ever failing source of wonder and entertainment to me. Nita, who performed the miracle of opening the bathroom door, is very religious. Tina is artistic and dreamy, and is musical, with a sweet true voice. Ben. Not yet three, Z. Live wire, never still, Dev is clever, ingratiating, and affectionate, Jack is manly and solemn and wise. The babies, Candy and Frank, are fat and placid and their mothers are unmodern enough to play with them, and to let me play with them also. All through the war I felt guilty, that in spite of anxiety about the boys away I have had such a truly wonderful time. I am so grateful, that all the boys have safely returned but it has been fun having my daughters, and their children in my home again. No one can be absolutely unhappy with a baby to hug, unless, of course, it is a hungry or a sick baby. May the dear God have pity on the mothers who have no food for THI tilde or children. Full house full house 266 every afternoon we would all gather for tea in our back room, and have all the children and grandchildren, and Riley, the enormous red Irish setter, and we would read the letters from overseas. Nearly everyone would be holding a baby, while the older children would lie, and roll on the floor in front of the fire. There were many anxious days, when the news was bad, or no letters would come. We tried to be especially gentle to the one who was suffering most, or had not heard deaf for the longest time. We loved the back room, for we could not hear the doorbell or telephone. They are such fearsome things, and can bring such sudden bad news. The children were always doing something outrageous, and if anyone came to call it seemed to wake demons in them. Instead of playing quietly, or snaking bits from the tray, they would immediately become chatty. Granny, how is your poor corn today? Granny, why is your hair such a funny yellow color? Papa, can I see you take out your tooth tonight? Mummy. Keena has eaten all the jelly roll. Dot auntie, Ben's putting a pencil in Riley's ear. Dot FD the visitor would soon leave, and at once things would become tranquil and normal. J3 full house full house QFFF I read aloud a great many sweet children's stories and we sang continually. The children loved all the old songs mother used to sing, such as Up in a Balloon, Comma John Sands, The Flying Trapeze, two little girls in blue. And all the children sang all the Christmas carols, especially adoring, I love a little child with sparkling eyes, and cheeks like a blushing rose, I love her merry laugh and her sunny smile, when the joy of her heart all flows. Happy little children, with cares light and few, in my loving, arms you 111 f in day warm place for you. But the most frequently sung song of all was the ribald, oh, the badger and the bear, the fox and the hare, and the birds in the green wood tree, and the pretty little rabbits one, so engaging in their habits, and they all have a mate but me. And they all have a mate but me. I have no idea where it came from, but my father said he used to sing it as a boy, and his father sang it before him. I would sit in the back room, while the children had their supper, and baths and all came back sweet, and fragrant for good night hugs and kisses and the full house full house 2468 wishful pleas for postponement of bed.
Just one more story please, Granny. We must sit up till Papa comes home. Mummy, Papa told me to stay up and see him. Dotty. Then after a while I hear, Mother, you simply must let Jack and Priscilla go to bed. They're half asleep already. You can keep Nita and Keena and Ev for a few more minutes. Candy and Frank are sound asleep. Point one to West Nita. I ask. Here I am, Granny, putting my baby doll to bed. Eleven off they all go, finally. Then Frankie comes and sits down beside me, and after a little talk and saying she hopes I will be glad, tells me she's having another baby this summer. Of course, I am pleased, and so life goes on. Full House Full House 249 Chapter 3 For the dream time does not bring relief. You all have lied who told me time would ease me of my pain. Comrade St. Vincent Millay, Sonnet to that night I dreamt of my mother the first time since her death. She looked so young and well. Tell you happy, darling? I asked. Yes, quote she said, rather doubtfully. Do you like it where you are? Quote not much, mother confessed. It's too quiet. Just then George Cranston, the Wickford undertaker who died forty years before mother, came tearing up the street. He yelled at mother. Hi point one you can't do this. I woke up. 11.33 comma 5 full house full house underscore 27 9 tilde cute ter 3 9 we are no other than a moving row of magic shadow shapes that come and go round with the sun illumined lantern held in midnight by the master of the shot the rubeyut of omakayam one afternoon, while we were having tea in the back room I was called to the telephone. It was Western Union. When I returned to the room, Frankie said, what is it? It isn't from Bob. Is it question Mark Altino, dear? Your in-laws are coming tomorrow for the night from New York. They got to the Ritz yesterday morning and tried all day to call us up. I wonder why they couldn't reach us. No one ever can, Titi said Frankie. I hear that complaint from all sides. Twell said, I should think you'd be glad to escape from a few calls. We have troubles enough. Dot. Dot we will have to plan how to sleep tomorrow night. May and Monty are coming from Hyannis for the night. They can take Buddy's room, so they can use the bathroom with Frankie and Nita. Thank you, said Frankie. T Priscilla and her nurse are in the left front room, I went on. The kings will be in the parlor. Full house full house underscore 24 3. I hope Uncle Bob hasn't gotten too fat to go through the little door into the John.11. He's out of luck if he has. Give him a chamber pot. T how glad I'm I didn't let the junk man have those china pots. Do you know, Tina paid an antique dealer in Wilmington 7 FIF tilde tilde F41 F4 Jack. Didn't it you, dear question mark T, what's so precious about him, Tina? Why cold didn't he use a milk bottle, TTI was draining him and well, I don't really know, but it seemed the right thing at the time. He was terribly pleased with it, and insisted on bringing TT it to Narragansett. Didn't he, mother? Yes, dear, said. No about tomorrow you girls will one have to see to things. Your father and I have Uncle Jonathan Chase's funeral, which will take nearly all day point one to why all day. He's been unconscious for eleven years, practically dead. I should think you could bury him in short order. Too well. It's a Quaker funeral and we sit till the spirit moves someone. Point one one it's you trite parenthesis so it never does. Do you just sit and rot? 337 full house full house 27 plus no comma comma but I don't know how you can tell when it's time to get up. Point one one I suppose the spirit moves that too. At Aunt Mattiot's funeral we sat until Mr. Planet from Wesley, spoke dot I, how long did he talk? About two hours, I think. He intoned, like a chant. It was very impressive. Must have been especially after the first hour. Dot FD at the grave you just stand and look. What do you look 89.11 at the coffin and the grave? So long do you do that question mark LT we stood about 15 minutes, I guess looking at Aunt Matty. Then Cousin Julia got hiccoughs quite loud hiccoughs, and it seemed to be over, 
and we all went home. Cow and Julia is always unfortunate, isn't she? TT she certainly is. Point one one. Here's your father. Fr. Enk. Do you remember the time Cuz and Julia got Eddie Doherty to varnish the floor the day I got home from the hospital after Nita was born? Question mark eleven three hundred and thirty nine. Full house. Full house. I do. T. Tell us, mother. Well, quote I began. Eddie had put mini wax on all the floors at my orders, and varnish doesn't set twirl on top of mini wax. It doesn't dry and makes a terribly slippery surface. K.S. We got into the door. I heard a scream, and fat Katie Carlyle came sliding toward us on her sit down, her white stockings showing above her knees, and then her bare legs. She evidently didn't believe in bloomers. She came pushing a wave about two inches high of slippery underscore dot v a r n i s h tilde and yell dot i n g bigora. Faith, Mary, mother. Will I ever get out of this hellhole of a place? Exclamation point. Quote. He. We had the most awful time standing her up. The floor was so slippery. Everyone who tried to help her fell down. To your father, Eddie Doherty, Miss Falvey, the nurse, all in a pig pile, and I stood holding Nita, weak anyway and weaker still from laughing. It took Eddie two days with a putty knife to get the stuff off. We nearly starved. No one would go near the kitchen, and Katie left. Tilda Riley, don't blame her. The girls all laughed and agreed that it was a good story. Dot, dot. We fixed the house for the king's visit, put fresh flowers around, and picked up most of the children's toys. I found my carried warden things in the full house, full house front room bureau, and put them away in a box. Never again, I prayed. May I need to wear these? But they brought back memories. My costume and duties were intriguing. I had to have trousers made, or could not graduate from the course in civilian defense. Don't ask me why. I was given a big iron helmet and a policeman's stick and a whistle, and was taught that the way dot to subdue anyone is with a mild tap under the chin with the stick. I never tried it. I have a windproof khaki coat with a brass and on the sleeve, and a flashlight. I learned by heart a perfect rigmarole of telephone numbers and things to do during a raid. My beat was up and down the hill to the west of Full House. How I hated to go out in the middle of the night, alone and in complete darkness, and walk up and down. Our street has many fraternity houses owned by the university, and the boys would leave lights burning. It was one of my duties to put these lights out. I would climb to the third floor of the either empty or sleeping house, turn off the light, then find my way down to the street with my flashlight. It was eerie. Dot. Dot. I think now I will have to grow ferns in my helmet. I don't know what else to do with it. It is so permanent. The end.